Hey everyone, and welcome to the best of February 2022. Tonight we have just over 10 hours worth of horror stories. I hope you enjoy them. If you do, please be sure to drop a like rating. It helps out the channel immensely and ensures that more people will see it. Uh, let's aim for... Let's try to go for 1,500 likes. Subscribing if you're new is also very much appreciated. I put countless hours into this channel, always ensuring to tell the best stories possible. So if you do enjoy the content, subscribing is much appreciated. Enjoy the video. And as always, I hope you all have a great night. Have you ever wondered if your death will make it onto the news? Great. An existentialist. I knew this was going to be another dead end for my article. I scanned my eyes over the kid I was interviewing. He was clearly a junkie. The blotches of blood along his white sleeves didn't serve him any favors in disguising that. His pungent odor of weed and urine weren't helping him either. I prayed the smell of coffee and eggs would overpower his stench. It was bad enough to get us kicked out of the cafe, and I wanted my food before that happened. How embarrassing. It's not something I frequently stress about. I chimed. He seemed on edge. I wondered if he was high at the time. Probably. I began to question if this was really worth it. After all, I was only writing for the local newspaper, and none of our older readers wanted to hear the thoughts of a disadvantaged youth. I pushed past my judgment and remembered there is a ladder to climb in journalism. Sometimes you just have to do the crap ones. It would be a good challenge to spin this into something decent. You said you had a story for me. Something that could save lives? I asked. I said I had something to tell you that will save lives. He snapped. But I don't want you to publish anything about me. You can't go to the news with this shit. Surely he had to be joking. His serious tone indicated otherwise. He fumbled his hands and threw a nervous glance over his shoulder. He'd been doing that since we sat down. It was like he was expecting someone to stroll through the cafe door. This wasn't going to work for me. Sweetie, you know I can't do that. I pointed to the notebook laid in front of me. It's my job. I'm here to find a story for the paper, and your email said you had one. I expected you understood how this would work, given you arranged this meeting. I tried to sound as nice as possible without letting my frustration sneak in. Clearly, it had failed. The kid began to shake his head. And he slammed a fist down on the table, clattering the cutlery. I jumped. Sorry. So sorry. He stammered. Please, I just need you to listen to me for five minutes. He raised his brow, begging with bloodshot eyes. I hope nobody else in the cafe had turned into the desperate tune of the conversation had taken. It was time for a quick exit. I'm sorry. I'm on a tight schedule. I said, snapping the notebook shut. I really can't afford to be exchanging campfire stories for fun. I made an attempt to leave, but he grabbed my wrist. Please, don't go. His untrimmed nails had dug into my skin as he spoke. They would definitely leave a mark. I can give you something of value. Trust me. Listen, I know what really happened to David Flemington. The name stopped me in my tracks. This will all make sense. I swear. He added. I recognized it. Why did I recognize it? The teenager released my wrist and capitalized on the first sign of interest I'd shown all morning. David Flemington? You know, the kid that fell into the cardboard box crusher. It came back to me. Earlier this week, some poor boy had managed to get stuck in one of those awful hydraulic compressors at our local supermarket. The ones they use to flatten the boxes that their products arrive in. The story had made international headlines and had raised concerns about the safety of those machines. I'd followed it from a distance. To be honest, the whole thing made me feel quite ill. 
It was a ghastly way to go and not worth visualizing. What about him? I asked, hesitantly intrigued. The day before his death, he was told exactly how he would die. I felt my chest constrict with rage. How could he possibly know such a thing? Was he having a laugh? What's your name, young man? I spat. Robert. Well, Robert, if I were you... I didn't finish. As if sensing my doubts, he had produced a phone with a picture of himself and another boy on the cracked screen. I stared at the two for a moment. I connected the other boy to be David Flemington. He was just how he had appeared in the news stories. From the image alone, they looked quite close. You knew him? I asked. Robert slowly nodded as he pocketed the device. If you couldn't tell, I'm a bit of an addict. No kidding. I chuckled. Robert wasn't amused. David and I would shoot up together. He was one of my suppliers. Well, more of a friend. We used to find places we could go and get high without being disturbed. Abandoned warehouses, industrial estates, places where the trouble couldn't find us. He paused, nervous with what came next. I failed to see where any of this was going. The readers were not going to like this, and it was never getting past an editor. Do you know the Forever House? He asked. I gave a slight nod. The Forever House was an old, double-story weatherboard that sat on the fringes of town. Probably the first structure you'd see upon arriving here. It had remained there since the 1960s, and nobody lived in it, to know my knowledge. Every time you drove past the rotting structure you half expected, no, hoped, that it had been demolished. Yet it still remained standing after all these years. Locals have coined it the Forever House due to its much overstayed welcome. David wanted to go and explore it. He continued. He saw it was a quiet place to go and shoot up. A perfect location for our needs. A smirk flickered over the kid's face. I'm never one to say no to a good time, so we arranged a date to meet up at the house. Naturally, I was late. I expected David to be inside upon my arrival, but he was waiting for me out the front. That's not how we usually did things. He looked all sweaty and was extremely jittery. That's odd for someone on drugs. Robert clicked his jaw, unhappy with the interruption. He clearly was not one for my sarcastic humor. His loss. He chose to let it slide and dived back in. It was different. I asked him what was going on and he told me not to go inside. He became insistent on leaving. I was pissed off. It had been a shit show of a bus journey and now he was telling me we weren't going ahead. Robert looked at me to relate. I reconsidered my career choice in that moment. I really thought my life was about to become listening to stoner arguments that one could easily watch for free in the wonderful... Metropolis. He leaned in. The subject matter wasn't for the entire cafe to know. He said he'd been inside. Thought the place was bugged. He had heard someone in the house that knew things about him. Knew his name. The drug dealer hearing voices. I must have rolled my eyes because Robert became even more desperate to maintain my attention. David wasn't buzzed. He hadn't taken any of the shit yet. We started getting looks from the other customers, but the kid doubled down. Look, I thought the exact same thing, but he claimed to have been cold turkey. I asked for more, like, you know, specific details and stuff. David really wouldn't get into it, but he told me there was definitely something in the living room. It was a... a voice, like a recording. It mentioned his name, then it started to explain how he would die. What did it say? 
I suspected the kid was bullshitting and I wanted to see how deep he could dig this hole. It predicted the cardboard crusher. He heard someone or something saying he had fallen into the cardboard crusher at the supermarket an entire day before it happened. And what did David make of that? I asked, making an over-exaggerated look of shock on my face. Well, he was certain it was some kind of setup. It knew his name in the supermarket he worked at. He thought the cops somehow knew about this. Robert stopped and took in my goofy expression. I had stopped trying. I can see you think this is all bogus, but you need to listen to me. I sighed. The interview was clearly not what he had desired. That made two of us. He scanned me up and down, examining every aspect of my body language before resuming. I didn't know if I believed him at first, too. But we decided that evening wasn't going to be a good trip. Emotions were running too high. We bust back home and all David could think about was the fact that the cops might be on his trail. He was agitated for the entire trip. I told him to take it easy for the next 24 hours. Lay low and it'll be fine. Well, he did just that. Went to his supermarket job the following afternoon and... And... Robert started to choke up. I'm sure the cardboard crusher was the next step in his tail. Tears formed and started to fall onto the table. He was really putting on a show. I realized that maybe, just maybe, he actually believed his own story. I had no clue what this kid was taking or what he'd hallucinated, but I couldn't help feel a little bit sorry for the trauma he'd been through. This narrative was probably just his way to make sense of losing a friend. That is, if Robert actually did know Davin. I still couldn't be certain of that. I decided to give him the benefit of the doubt. I tapped his hand and offered him my napkin. He managed to blubber out a snotty, Thank you. This kid clearly didn't need a story published, but rather some serious therapy. I tried to comfort him. You know Robert. He straightened up and cut me off. I'm not done yet. This next bit's important. He dried his eyes with a napkin and scrunched it up into a tight ball. After David died, I knew something was very wrong at the Forever House. Everything he heard in that living room became true. I had to go back and find whatever did this to him. I had to destroy it. I grabbed my notebook and stood up. I really couldn't let him keep talking. I wasn't going to wait for the food. It was time for this to end. I was done with the spooky stories. I'm sorry, Robert, but I really have to go. It's been lovely chatting with you, and I really do wish you all the best. He held up his palm, gesturing me to halt. No, he said firmly. This part concerns you. I went to take a step, but Robert slowly placed his hand over a knife ever so kindly provided by the cafe. He made sure I saw it. I froze. He inhaled deeply before calmly speaking. You have to sit and listen. This will all be over soon. I did as I was told. After everything he had said this morning, there was no telling how unhinged this kid could be. I looked... Hoping someone else in the cafe would step in, but they were all too busy in their conversations. I placed my hands on the table, revealing they were empty and in no way hostile. Very good. He smiled. You were saying? Well, after a bit of thought, I went back into Forever House yesterday morning. I climbed its broken staircase and went into the living room. You were searching for the thing that killed David. I added. Correct. He seemed pleased I had been engaged with his story. I had to make him feel heard. Anything to keep the teen with the knife happy. There was nobody. Nothing. He began to carefully twirl the knife. 
Just a couple of musty sofas, damaged floorboards, and an old television set. No source of the mysterious voice. I began to exit the room when the television flickered on. A news report started to play. Some guy on the screen. The newsreader opened the show by announcing today's date. I shot him a look of confusion. Yes, as in today's date. Robert clarified. He explained further. The television was showing a news program 24 hours before it existed. The newsreader then said my name and I realized this must have been what David heard when he entered the house. I wasn't going to watch the show after knowing what happened to him. I had to end it before I saw anything. Robert started pushing the point of the blade into the table's surface. I ran across the room from it to pull it off. Pull it out of the wall. But the cord wasn't even plugged in. It had no power and yet it was still working. Making it stop was beyond my capabilities. I placed my hand over my ears. I had to leave before I heard any circumstances surrounding my death. Did you? I asked. Robert swallowed nervously. That's when I caught a glimpse of you. My knee was wobbling under the table now. I crossed both of my legs to keep it stable. I was seriously uncomfortable. Usually I'm listening to stories that have nothing to do with me. I attempted to cover my eyes, but I saw your name on the screen. He said, licking his lips. With all his talking, his mouth must have been getting dry. That's how I was able to find your email address last night. You were being interviewed on the news because you'd witnessed my death. The reporter was asking you questions. Wanted to know what you had seen. I tried not to listen, but I still caught a slither of what you were saying. He took a quick sip from the table water and kept going. Your exact phrasing was, being choked. A man came up behind from nowhere. I shook my head and stared at him. This meant nothing to me. He threw his hands back in a surrendering pose. That's it. That was all I heard. I was perplexed. You believe a man is going to choke you to death because you thought you heard me say it on a television? I know you say it. He snarled. David's fate was the cardboard crusher and mine, for whatever reason, is being choked out by some guy. I don't think you get much of a choice in the matter. I shouldn't have entertained this nonsense, but I still didn't understand his headspace. Whilst his story was somewhat consistent, it baffled me as to why he'd want to meet with me. If I was supposed to be present during his death, wouldn't he want to get as far away from me as possible? I certainly know I would. I tried to voice this concern in a way that wouldn't panic him. Then why did you want me here? That's a reasonable question. I figured once you've heard the television, your fate is pretty much sealed. I could risk trying to get away from you, but I reckon no matter how hard I try, somewhere, somehow, you will still end up witnessing my death. Robert finally took his hand off the knife and brought his hands into a pleading gesture. Which is why I'm begging you. When I die today, not if, when... I need you to stay away from the reporters. Don't speak to them. He pointed towards the door he had been constantly checking. Any minute now a man is going to walk into this cafe and kill me. I can't do anything about that. He swallowed the fear he clearly felt. What I can do is try anything that will stop that news report from happening. The only reason I know I'm going to bite the bullet is because I heard you say it on that damn television. If you don't speak to the media, I never learned that information. If I never learned that information, I might just escape this. He grabbed my arms and leaned in. He had gone full crazy. Promise me. He uttered and looked back at the knife. 
or I will have to kill you. Suddenly the waiter arrived with our breakfast. Robert released his grip and sat back in his chair as the plates were placed on the table. He held eye contact with me as he snatched his fork and scrounged at his eggs for a bite. His mouth slowly chewed as he awaited my answer. So what do you say? His face turned red and his expression dropped. Robert's windpipe had become clogged with a piece of egg. He clawed at his neck and thumped his chest in a bid to dislodge the food. His eyes bulged and leaked tears. The guttural noises drew in the attention of the entire cafe. I was too shocked to say anything. I wished I had called out. Our waiter attempted to perform the Heimlich maneuver, but to no avail. He dropped him to the floor, flesh smacking the ground. The ambulance arrived impressively fast, but it was too late. Robert lay dead on the cafe's tiles. He was just a kid. The authorities arrived soon after. They didn't ask too many questions given the amount of people who had witnessed the horrible event. I knew it was a morbid thought, but at least it hadn't played out like Robert had described. Had he been murdered in front of my eyes by some mysterious man, I might have actually believed his drug-fueled conspiracy. Whilst there were parallels with the choking, I excused it as some freak coincidence. Still, a shame to lose such a creative mind like that. As I exited the cafe, I left behind a morning from hell, and as predicted, a very dead end for my article. I noticed a news van and its crew had popped up in the car park, interviewing customers about what had happened. A reporter approached and asked me if I would feel comfortable giving my eyewitness account. I thought back at what Robert had asked me and politely declined. I wanted to leave. I was done with stories for the day. However, the news reporter persisted. He asked me about my line of work. I briefly explained my journalistic endeavors, to which he responded with a grin. Well, this could be a great opportunity for some networking. I thought about it. There's no harm getting your foot in the door, and it's not like I was going to mention anything about the evil man Robert thought would choke him. I'd still be keeping a dead stranger's wish if I left that bit out. I agreed and gave the interview. Afterwards, the reporter thanked me and told me to call up the news station. He said if I mentioned his name, he could possibly pull a few strings to get me into one of the crews. At least something positive had come from all this. That evening, I settled into my sofa as I waited my appearance on television. Robert's name was mentioned on the local news program, followed by my interview. It really had shaken me up. I wondered how his family was doing if he even had one. I listened to my voice as it played through the speakers. It all happened so fast. I was interviewing the boy for the paper when he suddenly stopped speaking. It took me a moment to realize it was from the food. He was being choked. A man came up behind from nowhere. I think it was our waiter. He started performing the Heimlich maneuver, but it didn't work. It was awful. Just awful. My insides flipped as I repeated the sentence I had said in the interview. What was my phrasing? Being choked. A man came up behind from nowhere. I should never have spoken to that news crew. The world outside is gone. Only the village lives on. For most of my childhood, this was my truth. Me and my mom lived in a tiny community comprised of a few dozen people. Our village laid in the middle of the desert, an agglomeration of flimsy houses, worn down by a lack of care and the frequent sandstorms. There were no roads here, nor technology that would have linked us to the remains of the dead world. Life was difficult and it took a toll on all of us. I saw our fellow villagers daily, but can't recall what their smiles looked like. Still, at least they were alive. The last people alive on Earth, as our leader constantly reminded us. 
and we were lucky enough to have a working well in the center of the village, the water of which we used to grow the few crops we had to feed us. I spent most of my days reading. There was no electricity here, but my mother was an avid reader and had brought us a lot of books from the world before. I learned about how the old world worked, about self-moving machines made of metal called cars, about televisions and computers. I remember her also fervently insisting on us using them to teach me. She wanted me to know how to read, how to write, some history, some maths. She used to be passionate about me getting an education. She did not want me to turn feral, she said. But little by little, the passion within her died, and my lessons became ever rarer. I was 13 now, and the thought that I had still been too young to comprehend that world while I still lived in it saddened me. I had often harassed my mom with questions. Why can't we leave the village? When did we move here? What happened to the outside world? Every time, I could see how disturbed they made her. She only ever gave me very brief answers. The world outside was uninhabitable now. Everything that was good in it had died, and the only people left alive were bloodthirsty monsters. She had taken me here where it was safe when I was still young. My dad had died in the old world, and I must promise not to ever, ever try to leave the village. This was the same story told by our leader, a grim-looking man with a black, bushy beard. He had never been a brute to me, but part of me deeply feared him. He did not like me reading. Every time he saw me with a book, he would peer at me with those crazy, bulging eyes. He had told my mom to take those books away from me many times, that it would make me too curious. She had tried. She had hidden those books in every nook and cranny of the village, but I had always managed to find them. As such, our leader had suggested she just burn them. Thankfully, she never could bring herself to do it. I had always admired her for that because, generally, the role of our leader was law, and crossing him was not a common occurrence. One day, I heard roaring thunder on the horizon. A point in the distance grew bigger and bigger, the sound becoming ever louder as it did. I was terrified at first, but... As it approached, I noticed it matched the description of what I had read in many of my books. It was a car. The villagers had come out of their houses looking at it in fear. Eventually, it stopped and the doors opened. Two people came out, a man and a woman. They did not look like monsters, and they did not look dangerous. They just seemed very puzzled. I had my fears, of course, but the desire to see a car and to talk to the only new, friendly faces that came from the outside world overtook me as I ran towards them. Benjamin, stop! My mom screamed, but it was too late. I was determined to learn more about these people. As I came in closer, I saw that they were just humans like us, but their clothes looked colorful and clean, nothing like the rags we all wore here. They were all groomed and had a pleasant smell. What are you doing here, little guy? The woman asked. This is my village. I live here with my mom. The two briefly looked at each other before the man turned his attention back to me, a puzzled look on his face. You live here? Why? Their question confused me. Well, because it's safe here. And the rest of the world is dead. Dead? No, it's... I heard a huge explosion and looked back to see our leader holding a small, metallic rod I would later recognize as a gun. I turned my attention back to the two strangers. One of them was screaming on the ground, bleeding profusely from his leg. The other one had put her hands up in fear. Get them. The leader shouted. Most of the villagers were in too much of a shock to obey, but the four strongest of them ran towards us and took the couple away. My mom looked terrified, so much so that she seemed to have forgotten about me for a few minutes. 
Eventually, she grabbed me by the arm and dragged me back home. She did not sleep much that night. I don't think anyone could. Not with the screams that were frequently erupting from our leader's house. As the screams periodically quieted down, I could hear her pacing back and forth but couldn't tell what she was doing. Not until I saw a bright light out of my window and observed, powerless, as all of our books were consumed by the flames. Life had become even duller. I had no more books to read, and there were no kids around my age to play with. The only novelty was the presence of the two strangers that had come here in their car. They had disappeared for a while, locked in the basement of our leader's house, but had finally been allowed to join us. Unfortunately, they had become dull too. Every time I tried to ask them the many questions regarding the outside world I had, they would just parrot what I had already learned a thousand times. The old world was dead. This village was the only place that remained. The two of them had lived alone in their car for years. They used to sell clothes for a living, so they had a reserve of clean ones to wear. They had traveled around the country, but every place they stopped by was full of monsters. They were only locked in our leader's basement because he wanted to make sure they weren't monsters too, and they did not know what I meant when I mentioned screaming that night. They hadn't heard anything. Their story seemed off to me, but I eventually ended up resigning myself to accepting it. My mom did not like me talking to our neighbors. She always looked at them with a mixture of fear and distrust. To me, they both seemed like decent people. In fact, I found them quite subservient, and that was despite the fact that our leader had ordered their car burned down. Even I was upset about that as this would have been my only chance to see one of those cars in other form than simply in text. I imagine they must have been furious, but they seemed resigned. My theory was that they were just happy to have found a safe community like ours in such a hostile world. I would quickly realize how wrong I was. A few months had passed without anything out of the ordinary happening. I would gotten used to our new neighbors, and a few people had started opening up to them. My mom was not one of those people. She still deeply distrusted them, as did our leader. One night, I was woken up by shouting. I couldn't make out what was happening, so I quickly got dressed and stormed outside. My mom had tried to stop me as I ran past her, but it was in vain. I told you this would happen. We cannot trust anyone from outside the village. Our leader was walking back and forth between our two new neighbors that were kneeled down in front of him, periodically pointing his gun at them. Please, we're sorry. We won't tell anyone. The man said, Samuel, is this necessary? Nervously asked one of the villagers. Our leader shot a furious gaze at him. You all told me I should give them a chance. Do you people not understand what is at stake here? Come on, let's just lock them back up and... And what? We just leave them there and patiently wait for them to attempt to escape again? While well, we have to feed them the little food we have? Food that they won't help produce? Maybe they'll come around. Even if they manage to escape, they would be stranded in the middle of the desert. Our leader shook his head. I won't take any chances. Do you realize what they would do if they found us? I made a promise I would keep you all safe, and I meant it, even if this is what it takes. What happened next is a blur. I remember a red mist of blood coming out of the man's mouth. The woman screamed, but soon, a second shot came out of the leader's gun, and she too hit the floor. My mom, who had spent all of this time half-heartedly attempting to pull me back, suddenly used all of her strength to drag me back home. I was in a state of shock. As I looked up to my mother for comfort, I saw something I would never forgive. She did not look angry. She did not look scared. She simply looked relieved. I wouldn't be able to say exactly when I knew I had to leave the village. 
Part of me had always wanted to explore the unknown, but it used to be more of a pipe dream than any sort of concrete plan. Ever since our leader had murdered the two strangers though, I had gotten more and more convinced I needed to leave this place. Every night I would look out of my window and picture how I would escape, in which direction I would run, how much food and water I would take, if I would tell my mother anything. Until one night, leaving just felt right. I collected my blankets and snuck out of my room. After that, I got a hold of the bag my mom used when she helped collecting crops. I grabbed all of the food I could and then headed for the well. There, I filled our two jugs full of water and headed for the desert. The night was chilly, even with all of the blankets I had wrapped myself in. I felt guilty about leaving my mom before at least talking to her, but she would never have let me leave and had I given her a warning. I told myself that one day, I would find a good place with good people, and that I come back for her. I walked for days under a blazing sun and through freezing night, directing myself with the help of the distant mountains. At multiple points, I felt like I would never make it. Part of me wanted to head back to the village, but every time the thought crossed my mind, I reminded myself of the demise of the two strangers that had attempted to escape. Would the leader kill me too? If I was to die, at least I wanted to see what was really out there before I did. Beyond exhausted, I finally reached a road. I would read about how they were used in the old world and feared that following it may have led me to the monsters, but doing so was my only alternative to simply dying in the desert. Cars passed by. I tried to hide from them at first, fearful of who might be driving them, but hiding in such a flat terrain was next to impossible, and the ones that did see me did not seem to care. Eventually, I stopped minding them. Four of five cars had passed me by before one of them stopped. An old man came out looking distraught. Young man? I froze. Why are you alone? Where are your parents? I did not know how to respond to that. The village had always sought to conceal its presence. Revealing its existence may put my mother in danger. Still unable to form any kind of sentence, I simply shrugged. Honey? An old woman had come out of the car and started talking to the old man. Honey, he's clearly distressed. Let's bring him back to the city. The old man nodded. Well, come on, young man. You can't stay alone in the middle of the desert. I hesitated. I remembered all of the horror stories regarding the outside world I was told back in the village, but those people did not seem like monsters, and the last strangers I had met had never attempted to harm me in any way. The old woman extended her hand, and I took it. Being inside of a car would have been an extremely exciting novelty for me, had I not been so nervous. The old couple kept asking me questions I did not know how to answer. Which city do you come from? Well, what music do you like? What's your favorite radio station? Or if you want, we can use the Spotify's. I could tell that my lack of answers deeply concerned them. Honey, we should really bring him to a hospital. After a while, we reached a huge city. Or at least, that's what it seemed like to me, whose only experience of community was a tiny village. At first, I curled up below the car window trying to hide from what might see me from the outside, but little by little I rose up and dared to look at the streets. It was a marvelous sight, plenty of people wearing clean clothes, holding bags full of food, huge buildings as far as the eye could see, and more cars in a few seconds than I had known people in my entire life. We reached the hospital. The old couple did not leave my side as the doctors inspected me. He's malnourished and dehydrated. Other than that, he seems to be in good health. But he won't tell us anything. We don't know where he comes from, nor where his parents are. Are you sure his head is alright? 
The old woman asked with a shaky voice. He does not seem to have suffered any trauma. Still, we need to establish the identity of his parents. I think the police would be best suited for that. The old couple gave their thanks, then brought me to a police station nearby. A couple of men in blue questioned the old couple, leaving me in the waiting room. A bunch of magazines were laid on the table, and I grabbed one as quickly as I could. This had been my first time reading after my mom had burned all of our books a couple of months ago. After a few dozen minutes, the old couple and the police officers came back out of the office. A slightly overweight mustached man, who seemed to be the leader of the group, reassured the both of them. You did the right thing bringing him to us. Don't worry. We will take care of him now. What will happen to him? The old man asked timidly. First, we'll try to locate his parents. If we do, we'll launch an investigation to check why he ran away from home. In the worst case, we may have to place him in a foster home or an orphanage. Please keep us updated. And if the little man needs a new home, I think our son won't mind us hosting him in his old room. He's grown now, you know. The old woman smiled, a twinkle in her eyes. The mustached officer nodded. After giving me a tap on the head and telling me that everything would be alright, the couple headed for the door. The mustached man brought me in his office, along with one of his red-haired colleagues. First, he asked me if I wanted anything to drink or to eat. I told him that the old couple had already given me a few snacks on the way here, but that I would gladly drink something. He obliged, and then the questions began. What's your name? Benjamin. Nice to meet you, Benjamin. I'm Paul. Could you tell me why you were on your own when that couple found you? I hesitated. My mother had always told me to fear the outside world, and not to trust anyone who wasn't from the village. But so far, everyone I had met outside of the village had just been good to me or better than anyone I had known while living there. Maybe it was alright for me to open up a bit. I ran away from my village. Your village? What is it called? I shrugged. It doesn't really have a name. We simply referred to it as home. The two officers quickly glanced at each other. The red-haired man, who did not seem very interested by my case up to this point, started staring at me intensely from that point on. The mustached man cleared his throat and proceeded. And you live there with your parents? With my mom. My dad passed away when I was still very young. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. It's alright. I never really knew him. Could you tell us more about your village? Where is it located, for instance? It's... it's somewhere in the desert. I can't really say where. The couple that found you said you were walking alongside a road. Does that road pass through your village? There are no roads where I come from. The red-haired man seemed more and more puzzled by what I was saying. The mustached man turned towards him. He seemed to hesitate for a bit, then asked me to excuse them, as they had a word outside the room. Cautious, I put my ear against the door to hear what they were saying. Do you hear what I'm hearing, Joe? I do, but I'm not sure what to make of it. Can't say I'm an expert with interrogating children, but this sounds even more serious than I thought. Maybe we should call on a child psychologist before we proceed further. At this hour, I don't think we'll have much luck. Perhaps we should keep the kid here tonight and wait until next morning then. He doesn't have anywhere to go anyway. The discussion continued for a little while. There were terms thrown around which I did not fully understand. From what I could tell, the mustache man was wondering whether keeping a child in the police station for an entire night was alright, while the red-haired man reassured him that it was. Eventually, they both came back in the office and told me I would spend the night here, offering me books and blankets to make my stay more comfortable. 
I suppose most people would have called my sleeping quarters frugal, but to me, they were the cleanest sheets I could remember ever sleeping in. Wake up. I opened my eyes and saw the red-haired officer in front of me. What time is it? It's early, but this is important. We found someone that can help you. Come with me. I got up and quickly got dressed in the new clothes the mustache man had brought me before I had fallen asleep the night before. I then proceeded to follow the officer. Can I say goodbye to your friend before leaving? Paul? No, he isn't here right now. I'm sorry. That's a shame. He was nice. Yes, don't worry. He told me he would understand if you had no time to say your goodbyes. When we got out of the police station, I followed the officer for a few more minutes. Our path ended in front of a car where a dark-haired man, who must have been in his 30s, was waiting for me. Here, this is the kid I told you about. Do you think it could be him? The man looked at me. I could feel his eyes cutting right through me like razor blades. He stared at my face for some time, then took out a photograph. His gaze wandered back and forth between the photograph and my face for at least a full minute. Very well could be. Hard to say. Well, are you going to take him or not? We can't stay here too long. The black-haired man turned his attention back to me. Hi. Benjamin, right? I nodded. My name's Gio. I'll be taking care of you from now on if that's alright. I wondered how much of a choice I really had. Then again, everyone I had met so far had been nice to me, and this man did not seem much different from the rest. Yes, I think it should be fine. I answered, as he opened the door of his car and gave me a sign to climb in. After driving for a few hours, we arrived. Gio's house was even bigger and prettier than the rest of them. When I first arrived, he took a few pictures of me, asked me a few questions about my mom, and then disappeared for a few hours. When he came back, he told me I would live here from now on. A huge smile on his face. For the next few months, he did not ask much of me. Many people came in and out of the house to have long discussions with him. He told me that they came for advice and that giving it was his job. He told me that maybe one day, he would tell me how to do it. Gio brought me to a hairdresser. He also brought me a pair of sunglasses, which he said I should wear often, as it would protect my eyes which had been damaged for by my time in the desert. He would often take me out to restaurants where I discovered flavors that were completely alien to me, he showed me around the city, bought me ice cream, Taught me how to use a computer and gave me plenty of books, movies, and video games. I would say I was living the dream, but I deeply missed my mom and really wanted to see her again. Shortly after my 14th birthday, Gio started asking me questions. In a very relaxed, nonchalant way. Could you tell me more about the village you come from? Who lived there besides you and your mom? told him about the rest of them. The woman with the crooked nose, the man with no hair, the couple that would never leave each other's side, and of course our leader. That one in particular really caught his attention, as he kept asking questions about him. Finally, he let out a laugh. Fucking Samuel. You know him? I asked, surprised he knew his name. I know all of them. And especially him. But how? Let me ask you this instead. What did they tell you about your father? My dad? Well, he passed away when I was young. Geo grinned. No, Ben. Your dad is very much alive. I stayed silent for a little while trying to take all of this in. Gio was patiently sitting in the chair across my own, waiting for me to say something. But my mother has always said. She lied, Ben. She did not want you to know about him. Why? Where is he? 
He's in prison. Prison? Isn't that where they lock up criminals? Yes, but don't worry, Ben. Your dad is not a criminal. They simply lied about him. Can I go visit him? No, I'm afraid the lies they told about him were so severe that they won't allow anyone to visit him for now. My heart was racing. I then proceeded to ask a question I did not want to hear the answer to. Who is they? Who betrayed him? The people in your village. All of them. Except for you, of course. You were too young. Images of the village were racing through my mind. Life had been hard there, sure. The people seemed miserable, but none of them were evil. That being said, our leader did kill that innocent couple. If he was capable of doing that, there was no telling what else he might have done before settling in the village. Why? Your father was a very beloved man. He had many friends in many places, even some of the most important ones. Samuel, too. Your leader, as you called him, was once a friend of your dad's. In fact, he was one of his best ones. They used to work together quite a bit. What was their job? Geo seemed to hesitate for a bit, then answered. Protection. Your dad made sure the shop owners all across the country were all protected from thieves and hooligans. A sense of pride rushed through my head. Not only was I the child of someone important, I was also the child of a good person who cared for the security of others. But then, why did they betray him? That, Ben, I do not know. Samuel was the brains behind it all. We think that maybe he got caught doing something bad and was offered freedom in exchange for betraying your dad. I could feel a hint of anger in Geo's voice, which had remained unwaveringly calm up to this point. Or maybe he just decided he no longer wanted to work with him. Who knows? He found other people that were just as jealous as your dad as he was. Some of his clients, mostly. In exchange, he promised that he would keep them safe no matter the personal cost. They all told horrible lies about your father, about how he did not really protect people, about how he bullied them into paying for his protection. It was all nonsense, of course. My mom wouldn't do that. I almost wanted to apologize for raising my voice like that to someone who had been so kind to me, but Geo did not seem bothered by it. As I said... I do not know why each individual person in your village personally decided to betray your father. There were parts of your father's work your mother knew little about. Nothing bad, of course, but maybe she was lied to or tricked into believing that it was. Geo picked up his glass and drank some water from it, then continued. They did not go to the village straight away, you know. Samuel promised them that he would find a safe place for them to live after the fact. They tried to start new lives all over the country. They even thought about settling outside of it. But like I told you, your father had many friends. Not just in this country, but in the entire world. We would always close in on them. Samuel knew it. Eventually, though, all of them disappeared. Nobody knew where they had gone. That is... Until we met you, Ben, we're going to need your help. To know where the village is? Exactly. We want to bring justice to the people who wronged your father. Justice? What will you do to them? Geo laughed. Oh, nothing too bad, don't worry. We just want to find out why they lied about your father like so. Maybe even convince them to help us get him out of prison. Who knows? Then you could finally meet him. I... I don't know. I understand, Ben. Please, take all the time you need. After the initial shock of all those revelations had passed, I quickly made up my mind. I wanted to see my mom again, to be reunited with her in this world of light and abundance. Geo was a good man. He would see that my mother was no traitor. 
Maybe my father would even be released once all the horrible lies about the villagers hadn't told about him were proven false. Maybe we could all be reunited. I did not precisely know where my village was, of course, but Geo showed me where the old couple had reported picking me up, and the pieces of the puzzle started to fit. I remembered the mountains in the distance, the defunct buildings I had occasionally come across. After a few days, I finally managed to locate my village precisely. It was hard to tell from the satellite imagery that a village was there, as the frequent sandstorms had covered the roofs and walls in grainy dust. But it definitely was. I was sure of it. Great job, Ben. You did us a great favor today. Geo said before making multiple calls. That night, after coming back home from ice cream, many people were waiting in Geo's parking lot. Geo approached and greeted them, tapping some of them on the back. He then told me to go upstairs. Are you going to find my mom? I asked. Yes, Ben. The day has finally come. Before I turned heel to enter the house, I saw a man carrying multiple metallic objects and putting them in the trunk of Geo's car. I thought I had recognized their shape, but refused to believe it. I ran towards the trunk. My heart dropped as I realized that those were indeed guns, but that the trunk was also filled with so much more. Ropes, chains, gasoline, jugs covered in stickers warning of the hazardousness of their content. Gio, who made little effort to stop me from running off, casually approached and slammed the trunk shut. I thought you were going to talk. What the hell do you need all of this for? I told you, the village is unarmed, save for the one small gun Samuel wields. Gio smiled. Don't worry, Ben. It's just like your father's job. Unfazed, he finished. For protection. Today is January 31st, 2022. There are 5,950 days until May 17th, 2038. It seems like yesterday that it was December 12th, 2021, almost two months ago. The 17th of May was 6,000 days away. That was the third milestone in the thousands, and there are still five more to go. 50 days feels like yesterday, and 2,544 days feels like a lifetime. That date was February 13th, 2015. Nine days before that was the 4th, and unbeknownst to me, there were 8,494 days until that date, May 17th, 2038. The 137th day of the year. The 20th Monday of the year. 5,950 days, 850 weeks, May 17th, 2038. On the 4th of February, the 5th Wednesday of 2015, I was almost 18 and volunteering for a nursing home after school. I had been doing so for five months at that point. I wanted to be a sociologist and I figured that spending time with society's most vulnerable people would be a good experience to put on a college application. I wanted to go out of state, to one of the big boys, Harvard, Oxford, Stanford. I didn't want to be stuck in such a small town on such a big planet. I was leaving the building that day, walking along the short path back to the neighborhood, and it was there, by the base of a stump that was just ten or so feet off the edge of the path. That is where I found them. I was walking fast, and if I was just looking over the hill, or up at the sky, or anywhere but where I was, I probably would have missed them. What I found was a pair of glasses, with a green rim and blue temples. I picked them up because I was hoping they would be a close prescription to my own. I never liked the glasses my parents made me wear. They were gray and lifeless. I wanted color. I wanted vibrancy. I put them on and they were close. Not perfect, but close enough. 
Couldn't believe my luck. There was no one around and the glasses were in such great condition. Who would toss them away? I guess someone could have misplaced them, but even if I decide to return them, I still had to keep them safe. I pocketed them and figured I'd wear them tomorrow. My parents wouldn't understand, but I knew someone who would. The next day, February 5th on the 6th Thursday of 2015, I went to the nursing home after school. Once there, I paid a visit to my favorite resident, a 95-year-old woman named Virginia. That's not her real name for the sake of anonymity, but her name was just as fitting. She was born on the very first day of the 20s, back when there was only one 20s that people could remember. She was senile, she was cranky, and she could tell the best damn story you ever heard. Her husband, a man so old that he could have been delivered by Susan B. Anthony herself, was drafted into the Second World War at the age of 38 and never came home. She never remarried and in fact divorced every fuck she could ever give about anything. She was the most honest person I knew, even if she couldn't always be aware of it. She hated people, but she liked me. I wanted to show her my glasses because I knew she'd understand. And so I put them on before walking in her room. That's when it first happened. As I walked in, I saw her son Sammy was by her side. The last family member she had, and the only other person besides myself who she had any sort of caring relationship with. He came every Tuesday and Thursday, so I wasn't surprised. What did mystify me, though, were the red numbers floating above their heads. They were bright neon, almost like the display of a digital alarm clock, just without the segmentation of the numbers. They each had one series of numbers above them, and as they would move their heads, the numbers would move too. I must have been petrified for a solid half minute. It wasn't until Sammy spoke up that I snapped out of it. I was beyond confused, but I had the sense to let it roll over for now. I took the glasses off and apologized. I don't remember the excuse I gave, but I do remember the look he gave me after. It looked so puzzled that I could see the pronouns wrinkles through the blur. I said hello to Virginia, and she told me she wanted to see the new glasses I had just stashed away for seemingly no reason. I took an internal deep breath and put them on without hesitation. If something bad is happening to me, I don't want others to get involved. I slid them on, and the numbers appeared once more. I stayed for a few minutes and went on with my daily tasks. I kept the glasses off except for when I was with Virginia. Near the end of the day, I had memorized the numbers for both of them. Virginia's was 020515, and Sammy's was 021015. I had a love for numbers back then, and I recognized each set of six digits as a day. Virginia's number was today. And Sammy's was five days from now. I finished my work, said goodbye, went home, and put those glasses in my top dresser drawer. I had no idea what was going on with those glasses, and I tried to forget the incident even happened. Being smart is knowing when to observe and when to ignore. And back then, I knew damn well to ignore things that were making my life a mockery. Friday came. School went, and I made my way back to the home. To my sorrow, Virginia had passed the night before in her sleep. I had only been volunteering since September, but I saw my fair share of deaths up to that point. Virginia wasn't even the first resident I grew attached to. I guess because of this, I was able to get through the day fairly normally. I didn't come in on Saturdays and Sundays, and I decided I'd do the same for Monday and Tuesday, and Wednesday. I could believe she was gone, but I couldn't handle it just yet. I came back on Thursday, 
and there was a more somber atmosphere than usual. I didn't mention anything until I was about to leave, when I bit the bullet and asked what was going on. It's a sick choice of words to use though, because I was informed that Sammy had died from a self-inflicted gunshot wound. He was a favorite of the staff, along with other residents. So, everything clicked into place. I was told he had done it two days prior on the 10th. The dots hadn't connected in my head, and I was no longer thinking about any stupid glasses. That's until I got home. I came in, went up the stairs to my room, and had turned the TV on. I had hooked up my childhood VCR and I grabbed the one thing that could make me laugh no matter what. George Carlin. I was a big fan of his, and even now, he's still one of the only things that can consistently bring me joy. My dad had given me some of his old tapes from the 90s. Sentimental value always overtook the convenience of YouTube for me. I had decided Carlin was just what I needed at this night. A night which would, later, feel like an eternity. I grabbed a random tape, which happened to be, You Are All Diseased. I had it running for a couple minutes when I paused to take a piss. While doing such, I started thinking about the glasses again, and upon returning to my room, I took them out. I couldn't stop myself, as I was just so curious about them. I said before that I knew when to observe and when to ignore. Sadly, I was just feeling a bit stupid. I put them on, and not a single number appeared anywhere. I waited for five minutes, looking at every picture around my room, just waiting for them to show up, but nothing. They didn't even show up in my reflection. I gave up, not knowing whether or not to feel relief. I kept them on and resumed the show, but as I did so, the footage started playing. The numbers returned, not over the head of any human present, but over George Carlin. They were in the TV and they followed him, yet they didn't look like they belonged. Compared to the grainy quality of the tape, the numbers were clear and vibrant as ever, but they were in the TV and even went partially out of frame on some shots. It was then that I paid attention to the numbers. 062208 I said before that I used to enjoy numbers, and when you love numbers, you tend to know a lot of dates. June 22nd, 2008, a time where we were a whole 10,921 days away from May 17th, is the day George Carlin died. It was at that very moment that I remembered the numbers above Virginia and Sammy. I made the same realization that you've made already. These red numbers were death dates. I didn't, and still don't, know much about the numbers. I don't know if they can ever change. I don't know how they were in the TV. I don't know how my reflection didn't have them. And I don't know why they only appeared when I unpaused the TV. I assume for the same reason they don't appear over photos. It was at this moment where I felt sick. If my room wasn't connected to the bathroom, I would have puked right there. Even still, I barely made it. The next couple hours are a blur. I feel like I went through every single possible thought one could have about such glasses. But I realized something. I wasn't scared of these glasses, nor was I concerned with them. All I was, was curious. That night took an eternity, and it wasn't because I was dreading tomorrow, but because I couldn't wait. I had to test these out in the wild. And when I went to school Friday morning, the seventh Friday of the year, I had no other intentions than to use them on my peers. But as I thought about the prospect of doing so, I got cold feet. My brain wanted to know what the fuck I was about to do, but every other cell in my body needed to know. I decided to do a little trial round. I started by only looking at people who already passed. I tried Kennedy, I tried Lenin, I tried Hitler. I tried Cobain. I tried Monroe. I did so many people, and every single one was correct. A few of the dates were actually off from what Google told me, however. I quickly realized it was because it did each date as if it wasn't central time. 
my personal time zone. My intrigue finally got the best of me, and I finally looked at when some people were going to die. Granted, I only did old celebrities, people who were on their way out anyway. I figured it would soften any impact this information would have on me. Not all of them have died. Chomsky stays around longer than you'd think, but a good portion of them have. I knew Fidel Castro was going to die on... 112516. I knew Doris Day was going to die on 051319, and I was the first one to know that both Prince Philip and Betty White died painfully close to their 100th birthday. The one that really affected me was Christopher Lee. Not because I'm a particularly big Lord of the Rings fan, but because it was less than four months away. I had pumped myself up, and I was more determined than anyone else in the world. I needed to finally put it to practical use. I had to pick a target, someone who I didn't care about. I picked Aaron, the biggest cum stain in the school. He never touched me or even laid eyes my way, as most people don't, but he did make a life a living hell for so many students. Most of them were some of the only people who had treated me right. I followed him to a mostly empty hallway. Got into a position where he was the only guy I could see and put the glasses on. 030918. This time, I truly did feel sick. And it didn't go away. I haven't done much the past seven years, but one thing I did, the one thing I'm proud of, was try. I tried to do everything I could to keep that kid alive. I tried talking to him. I tried listening to him. I tried standing up for him. I tried everything I could possibly do to keep his heart pumping. I eventually did befriend him. He never got on drugs and he never hit the bottle. Never got into a fight again. Never drove drunk. Never tried to beat a train. He went from almost getting expelled his senior year for assaulting a teacher to getting into a halfway decent college. And on March 9th, 2018, he died of a brain aneurysm. But that was later, and now is then. After seeing those numbers, I screamed so loudly that people outside the building reportedly heard it. I ran to the nearby water fountain and puked all the air out my gut. Due to last night, I had nothing to expel but regret, but it never went away. I had caused a scene and it was at that moment where I made the worst mistake of my life. It wasn't cheating on a test in the fourth grade. It wasn't wasting my first two years of high school in an abusive relationship. It was turning around. What I saw were dozens of teenagers and just as many numbers. And it was then that I saw a horror comprehensible in concept but unimaginable in reality. 051738 051738 You get the point. It was fucking everywhere. I saw one or two dates below, but almost all of them were nothing but 051738. It was a glowing red sea over the heads of the masses, and it couldn't be parted. I ran out the school. I don't remember how I didn't, or even where I exited. But sometime later, I tripped in the woods. I was only a few miles from the school and the foliage not too far behind the building, but I felt like I was in a different realm of existence from anyone else. I sat there for a few hours and then pulled my phone out. I had no signal, but I had videos on my phone, particularly ones taken during a recent family reunion in Dallas, where my family and I went to Six Flags. I looked through those videos, not the ones that had me and my family, god no. I looked at all the strangers, the park attendants, the families, everyone I could find. Every single one had a number. I couldn't see every number since most of them were small, being over the heads of those in the background, but almost every number I saw was the exact same. 051738. Most of the ones with a different number were the elderly. 
It was then when it hit me, the fact that everyone, including me seemingly, was going to die in just a little over 23 years. I scrolled through my camera roll, checking for any other possible videos. Every video was the same, but one. In preparation for the upcoming 2016 election, I had been editing a music video about the various candidates that could run. I was going to post it to YouTube and everything, but it never happened. The video had a lot of past and current politicians in it. Most of the numbers were lower due to the old ages of these politicians, but there were still a good bit of 051731 throughout the various stock footage I had utilized, but it was different. Certain people in the video did not have that number, or even one lower. No, some had one higher. Obama's number wasn't 051738. It was 082249. Rand Paul's was 040940. Ted Cruz's was 120162. I've memorized the dates for almost every notable figure I saw with those glasses because they changed everything for me. I don't know what the fuck is going to happen on May 17th, 2038. Whatever it is. Some assholes and lucky sons of bitches must have gotten away. When I finished that video, I took those glasses off, threw them to the ground, took a rock, and I did to those glasses what they did to me. Shatter their perception of reality. On the outside... I lived a normal life for the next five years. February 13th was treated as a random mental snap. Despite everything I ever said in my life about my town, how it was a shithole, how it was in the middle of nowhere, how it had nothing to offer, it gave me help. My community gave me help. Did it fix me? No, largely because it wasn't something even explainable. I can only do the back and forth so much when I'm keeping the biggest secret in the world. But I was still better. Until 2020. When the virus happened, all the thoughts came back. Not even so much that we were all gonna die, but what the hell could be the cause of it? I always thought it was gonna be an asteroid, or nuclear warfare. But could this be it? A virus that sweeps everywhere, killing everyone. I wonder about a lot of things. I wonder who had the glasses, why they left them there, how they work, and if I should have kept them. Maybe those glasses were the key to helping people not die so soon, and I was too scared to let them. For almost the past two years, I've been an even more hollow shell. I told everyone that could listen about what I saw and how I was with Aaron when he died because I knew something was going to happen and how every day I live in fear and I count down the days. I've done plenty of damage, enough to where I don't think I can go back. As for now though, I'm existing, which is more than I can say to the me 5,950 days from now. I don't know how much longer I can manage to be around. A little over 16 years is a long time to go on like this, but at the same time, I feel I would be doing myself a disservice by not waiting. I've let six numbers change my entire outlook on reality. I need to know what the hell happens. Maybe it's the fucking rapture, and taking myself out would just leave me as one of the ones locked out. All I know is that I used to be stuck in a small town on a big planet. Now, though, I have all the space I could need within my own mind, and the scale of Earth appears to shrink almost as much as its future, one day at a time. Tommy was what the beautiful people at our high school called an easy target. He was short, Kind of chubby, very timid, with thick black coke bottle glasses. Need I say more? Now I've never considered myself to be a tough guy, but I could hold my own in a fight. One on one, or even two on one, if it came down to it. 
You see, my father, who at the time had just retired from the Air Force after 20 years, had taught me a few defensive moves when I was younger, in case I ever needed to defend myself. He also taught me to respect others and to stand up for what is right. And that is how I met Tommy. Tommy Wickerman. It was 1986. I was 17 years old and a senior in high school. Tommy was a junior, as he was a year younger. Now, like I said, my father had just retired. Which meant we, my mother, my father, and I, could no longer live in base housing. The Mayflower Moving Company had a contract with the air base, according to my father, so they were called in to pack all of our belongings and move them from our old house in Andrews Air Force Base to our new house in this small country town. I'd tell you the name of it, but a lot of weird and creepy stuff happens here. It's not for the faint of heart. I wouldn't want any of you coming here and getting maimed or killed or anything like that, so it's best I keep it to myself. I love it here. You never know what's going to happen. Anyway, that's not important. Now, after moving into our new house and getting the utilities turned on, the only thing left for my parents to do was enroll me in school, which they did. School started the following Monday. Monday came, I got up at 6, got dressed, had breakfast, then went outside to wait for the bus. I know what you're thinking. If you were 17, why didn't you just drive to school? Well, I didn't have a car. Now, I don't know how it was or is at your high school, but at this one, all the students either walked to school or took the bus. Driving to school was not allowed. Anyway, my dad was getting ready for his first day, too. He got a job as a security guard at Cartwright Cinema, a movie theater in the next town over. Apparently, they show movies all day long. He's now the theater manager. My mom didn't and still doesn't work. She was and still is a stay-at-home mom. Anyway, the bus picked me up around 7, making several other stops to pick up more kids, and finally arriving at the school about 20 minutes later. I found my homeroom, found my locker, made sure I knew how to open it, and then went to my first four classes. I talked to a couple kids, got my books, learned a few things, and then it was lunchtime. So there I was, my first day at my new school, in the cafeteria with no idea where to go. I had just left the kitchen area with my tray, which had about five undercooked french fries, a pint-sized carton of chocolate milk, and a rectangular slice of that cardboard pizza that they used to serve in school. You remember that pizza, right? Well, it was the 80s, so some of you weren't even born yet. Anyway, this was the best pizza ever, am I right? For those of you who remember it, that is. Pizza Hut, Domino's, Papa John's. They got nothing on that 80s high school cardboard pizza. Elio's comes close, but it's not the same. Sorry about that. Back to the story. Now, like I said, I just left the kitchen area holding my tray and looking out into the sea of tables, all packed with kids that I didn't know. I was an outsider. An unknown, and man, did I feel like it. The sounds of multiple conversations filled the air. Anyway, I just stood there, slowly looking left and right. After a few seconds, I decided to start on the right side of the cafeteria. I walked up the aisle, looking for an empty seat. I passed the second table on my right, and there it was. On the far side of the next table, an open seat on the aisle. I walked to the table sat my tray on it, introduced myself, and sat down. The kids all greeted me with haze and highs, and went back to their conversations. I opened my milk and was just about to take a bite of that amazing pizza when I heard a cocky, arrogant voice from behind me say, Tommy, Tommy, still sleeps with Mommy. I remember it like it was yesterday. The entire cafeteria then grew silent. I turned around, and that is when I first saw Butch. Butch Matheson. He was about my age, about my height, with blonde hair, wearing a letterman's jacket, tossing a football in the air and catching it, 
repeating the same preschoolish rhyme over and over again. Obviously, he was the quarterback of the high school football team. Anyway, he walked up the aisle and stopped at the kid that was sitting right to back with me. Tommy. Now, one would think that by the age of 17, that Butch's mental capabilities would have come up with something better than Tommy Tommy still sleeps with Mommy, but let's just say Butch was not the brightest light on the tree, if you get what I'm saying. Anyway, he stopped in front of where Tommy was sitting. All the kids at my table grabbed their trays and left. It was at that point I knew that Butch was the school bully. I just sat there looking at him. Butch then rustled Tommy's hair, smirking as he did. Oops, Butch said loudly as he slammed the football down on Tommy's slice of pizza. Look what you did to my football. Butch yelled, picking it up and shoving it in Tommy's face. Sauce and cheese dripping from it. Tommy turned his head quickly in my direction to try and stop the ball from hitting him in the face. His glass is sliding off and falling to the floor. Our eyes met and I saw nothing but fear in his eyes. As the ball hit his right cheek, Tommy closed his eyes and I saw a tear form in the corner of his left one. Enough was enough at that point. I stood up, catching Butch off guard. Grabbed the football with my right hand out of Butch's hand, and with every ounce of my strength I had, threw it directly in his face, knocking him back and breaking his nose. The ball bouncing under the table. A wave of shocked profanity then filled the air. I looked to see all eyes turned in my direction. Several girls covered their mouths with their hands, while several guys were throwing fists in the air and wolfing like... Arsenio Hall did on his talk show years later. I turned back around to see blood gushing out of Butch's nose like a water faucet. Leave him alone. I screamed as Butch grabbed his face. Two other kids came to Butch's aid. One took a step towards me. You want some? I said aggressively and took a step toward him. He stopped, turned around, and went back to helping Butch. Teachers and other faculty members then came rushing to break up the fight, and to quiet down the kids. Now you have to remember that this was in the 80s, long before you got arrested for fighting in school. Back then, you took your hits and moved on. Which was escorted to the nurse's office, while I was escorted to the principal's office. Before I left, I bent over, picked up Tommy's glasses and handed them back to him. Thank you. He said, wiping off his face with a look of shock in his eyes. I just smiled at him and nodded my head. I got four days of ISS, which stands for in-school suspension, in case you didn't know. Basically, you still had to come to school, go to homeroom, get marked as present, then report to this little room, about the size of a walk-in closet, and sit there all day until the school day was over, staring at the walls with other kids that got in trouble. Not talking to anyone, not doing anything, but just sitting there. We did have lunch, but it was this stew-like concoction that looked like baby vomit. It smelled and tasted even worse. There wasn't even a clock in the room, so you couldn't tell what time it was. Now I know what you're thinking. I would just look at my cell phone to know what time it was. It was the 80s, remember? Cell phones weren't invented yet. The person in charge of overseeing the troublemakers was always Mr. Dinelli. I'm not sure if he was a teacher or not, or they just hired him for that purpose, but he definitely was a throwback from the 70s. He had long, stringy brown hair, pulled back in a ponytail, wore bell-bottom jeans, sandals on his feet, a tan button-up shirt with what looked to be a dark blue crocheted vest with a huge peace sign on the back with little round buttons on the front. He wore round wireframe glasses like John Lennon wore and always smelled like potting soil. Anyway, it was horrible. All because they said that I was the aggressor in the situation, which didn't get in trouble at all. All he got was a broken nose. High school quarterback, remember? Anyway, 
I told my father what happened. He had a few choice words for the principal, but in the end, I served my time and moved on. Friday after my last ISS, I was walking to the bus when Tommy came running up from behind me. We started talking and became really good friends. Now I'm not going to say that Tommy was weird or strange or anything like that. I'll just say that his hobbies were different than most people's. Where my hobbies included listening to music, 80s hair metal to be exact, going roller skating and watching movies, Tommy's were, as I said, different. You see, Tommy's father was the local taxidermist. You know, the people that stuff animals, real ones, after hunters kill them for no apparent reason other than just to kill them, and mount their heads to the wall or put the whole thing on display. Anyway, he taught Tommy how to stuff them. His entire room was full of mounted dead animals. Birds, mice, a raccoon, a couple squirrels, and even a cat. It was so disgusting, but he wasn't my friend, and who am I to judge anyone? We hung out at my house a lot. Anyway, no one really cares about that. Moving on. Butch did not learn from our altercation, and continued to bully Tommy every chance he got when I wasn't around, that is. We got in multiple fights with each other because of it. I spent more days in ISS than I did in the classroom. He just wouldn't stop. Now, on that faithful Friday afternoon, Tommy had asked me if I would be his friend forever, no matter what. Without thinking, I replied, yes, of course I will. Now, answering that question the way I did many years ago has begun to make me question myself whether I can keep that promise or not. I am torn by the decision that only I can make right now, but more on that later. Now, like I said, Butch was a never-ending torment for Tommy, well, until his senior year. You see... Butch and I were in the same graduating class, and Tommy was a year behind us. So Tommy's senior year was relatively torment-free. At least in school, that is. I kept in touch with him after I graduated. Now, during the homecoming game, our senior year, only a month or so after the lunchroom incident, Butch had suffered a career-ending injury to his knee, and was forced to give up football. I never want to see anyone get hurt, but I wasn't too torn up about it either. Now, being forced to quit football only made Butch's torment of Tommy even worse. Shoving him into lockers, pulling his pants down in the hallway, hip checking him into walls, things like that. Now, since Butch was no longer an asset to the school, he actually began to get in trouble. He got a couple ISSs, but that didn't stop him. After graduation, Butch took over management of one of his father's video rental stores and continued to mess with Tommy. At the mall, at the roller rink, at the movies, every chance he got. Tommy told me what happened each time, but wouldn't let me address it with Butch. He said he had a plan, but wouldn't tell me what it was. I'd see Butch from time to time when I came to rent a movie. He was always nice to me. I got a job in the shoe department at Wally World, a department store in the next town over, just down the street from where my father works. Saved my money and bought a car. I've been there ever since. Shortly after Tommy graduated, he said that being in this town only reminded him all of the torment he suffered at the hands of Butch, and that he needed to get away and start a new life somewhere else. I understood completely. He packed his bags and took the next bus to anywhere that wasn't here. I gave him money for a ticket, a couple hundred dollars to get him started, and drove him to the bus station. He promised to pay me back. Tommy never learned how to drive. He was completely scared shitless to get behind the wheel of a car. Anyway, as he got out of the car, he turned to me, smiled, and said, Tell Butch... I will never forget him. Thanks for being my friend, Mike. I'll call you. Bye. It was at that time I noticed something different about his eyes. They weren't as innocent looking as they were when I first met him. 
They were darker. Okay, I'll tell him. You're welcome, man. Be safe. Bye, Tommy. I replied, waving. He waved back and walked into the terminal. I then drove home. As the days turned to weeks, and the weeks turned to months, Tommy's call never came. During that time, I had saved enough money from my job to move out of my parents' house and rent a room at the local flop house. I asked my parents to let me know if Tommy called. They said they would. Now, it was 1988 at that point, and life carried on without Tommy. I missed my friend, but without knowing where he was, I couldn't contact him. So after a while, I figured he went somewhere, started a new life, and was happy where he was at. He did start a new life, and I'm sure it made him happy, but how it turned out was not how I thought it would be. Anyway, like I said, life went on without Tommy. I worked my way up to assistant manager of shoes after about 15 years. I'm a very patient man. I got a good size raise and moved out of the flop house into my own apartment. I met an incredibly beautiful woman at work a few years later. She's a cashier there. We started dating and were married about two years after that. She moved in with me. It was about that time that I started to notice missing person flyers everywhere I went. The creepy grocery store in town, the gas station, the zoo, even stapled to trees lining the streets. Everywhere. There was a new flyer every six months or so, and they were all people I went to school with. Stacy Bennett, the head cheerleader. Scott White, a member of the wrestling team. Devin Williams, the class clown. Richard Garrison, Amanda Moffat, and even Mr. Fleming, the physical education teacher. After the third disappearance, Town officials elected to place a 10 o'clock curfew on the town and all businesses were ordered to close at 9. If you worked out of town and worked later than the curfew, you had to register with the police department, provide your work schedule each week, also the make, model, and license plate number of your car, then you would get an exemption card from the sheriff. I still have my card, as sometimes I had to work until 11. Now, even with the curfew in place, people just kept disappearing for the next 10 years, give or take. I just figured they all got tired of the craziness that happens in this town, moved away, and didn't tell anyone. But when I saw the flyer of the latest person to disappear, I knew I was wrong. The missing person was Butch. And just like that, the disappearances stopped. After a year went by, and with no further disappearances, the sheriff lifted the curfew and life went back to normal. Which brings us to present day. Well, almost. I arrived home from work about a month ago, and my wife handed me a plain white envelope with my name on it. She said she found it sitting in the mailbox when she checked the mail earlier. It had no return address, no postage stamp, no stamp from the post office, Nothing. Nothing but my name, and only my first name. I was reluctant to open it. I mean, wouldn't you? Anyway, I sat down on the couch and stared at the envelope for a good ten minutes. Finally, I decided to open it. Inside was a letter, neatly typed. I still have it in my wallet. Hold on, I'll read it for you. Here it is. Dear Mike, I hope this letter finds you well. A lot of things have happened since the last time we talked. Such wonderful things. I have found purpose in my life. I'm not afraid anymore. I am sorry for not contacting you sooner, but I have been busy perfecting my calling in life. I hope you understand. I would like to share my accomplishments with you, my one and only real friend. I invite you to my home at... Address retracted for privacy. At your earliest convenience, please contact me at 1555-728-3825. It would be great to hear from you. Your friend forever, Tommy. I sat there on the couch completely shocked yet intrigued. 
how did he know where I lived? Was my first thought. My second thought was, since he obviously didn't mail it, who put it in my mailbox? My wife then walked into the room and sat a cup of coffee on the table for me. She then sat next to me and asked, Is everything alright, hun? I'm not sure. I replied, slightly puzzled. It's from an old high school friend that I haven't seen in about 30 years. I almost forgot about him. He invited me to his house. That's nice. Probably just wants to catch up. You should go. She said, smiling. I'll think about it. I responded, then threw the letter and the envelope on the coffee table. Took a drink of coffee and spent quality time with my wife for the rest of the night. Sat there for three weeks, at which time curiosity got the better of me. My wife was at work and there wasn't anything good on TV. I sat the remote on the coffee table next to the envelope and the letter. I stared at it for a few seconds then picked it up. I unfolded it, found the spot where the phone number, got up off the couch, walked to the kitchen to the phone on the wall, picked up the receiver and dialed the number. It only rang once. Tommy then picked up the phone. Hello, he said. His voice was more intense than I remembered, but it was his voice. Hey Tommy, it's Mike, I replied. We then had about an hour-long conversation about almost everything under the sun. He said he found my address by googling my name. It wasn't hard to find me because I have a very unique last name. He also said he had taken the bus back to town and walked to my house. And that he had every intention on stopping by, but there was no car in the driveway so he figured I wasn't home. He wrote the letter in case no one was home when he got there. So he left it in the mailbox walked back to the bus station, and took the next bus home. He didn't know I was married. Anyway, once we got our schedule to coincide, we made plans to meet up at his house the following Sunday, my next day off. I googled his address and found out he lived three and a half hours away. After making our plans, we said our goodbyes and hung up the phone. Then my wife, her name's Casey by the way, Got home from work, I told her about talking to Tommy, and the plans we made for Sunday. She was happy for me. This morning came, it's Sunday by the way, got up around 7, got dressed like usual, had breakfast with Casey, made a travel mug of coffee, kissed Casey goodbye, got in the car at about 8, and made the 3.5 hour drive to Tommy's house. Well, the little over 4 hour drive with traffic and bathroom breaks. Coffee runs right through me. Anyway, I arrived at Tommy's house just after 12 o'clock. It was a huge two-story house, bigger than mine. It was forest green and trimmed in white, with a porch that stretched across the entire front of the house. There was a white picket fence that surrounded the whole property, which was about two acres in size, with a large gray sign that read, Wickerman Taxidermy Services on it. I knew I was at the right place. There was a decent sized garden to the left of the house as you look at it, with tomatoes, cucumbers, and various other vegetables. There was a large building behind the garden, painted the same colors, about the size of a three-car garage, with stepping stones leading from its entrance to the back of the house, assuming to the back door. The driveway was to the right of the house, leading to the side of it. I pulled in the driveway, shut off the car, and got out. I walked up the sidewalk onto the porch, rang the doorbell, stepped back, and waited. After a few seconds, the front door opened up and the man I saw standing before me was short, and was wearing black glasses. But he was not chubby at all. He was a lot thinner, and very muscular. He reminded me of Taz when he was in ECW. Anyway, Tommy, I said, shocked at what I saw. Yeah, man, it's me. He replied, stepping back, spreading his arms out, and spinning around. He stopped to face me again. Come on in, my friend. 
he said and motioned for me to enter. So I did. The first thing he did was hand me a white envelope from his back pocket with $1,000 cash in it, paying me back that loan I gave him all those years ago. I put the envelope in my back pocket. We then sat at his dining room table for the next four hours, drinking coffee and reminiscing about old times. Come to find out, shortly after he arrived here and stepped off the bus, he rented a room off an elderly lady with some of the money that I gave him and became good friends with her, given the fact that she had no living relatives when she passed away about a year later. She left him the house and the property in her will. Once the money ran out, he got a job as a hoser, working at the local sanitation company. You know, the guys that suck the crap, literally, out of septic tanks and porta potties He said it was a real shitty job, pun intended, but it paid good. Anyway, he worked there for a couple of years until the tragic death of his parents in a freak accident that happened on Christmas Eve at that creepy grocery store back in the town I live in. He sold his parents' house but kept all his father's taxidermy equipment and opened up his own business. And that business is going good, especially around hunting season. Anyway, he said that when he first met the old lady, she noticed his size and offered to help him lose weight as she was a dietitian at the local health and wellness center for many years and helped many people lose weight and keep it off. He took her up on her offer, completely changed his eating habits. He eats a lot of salads, soups, and fish now, lost about 100 pounds and started working out. He had a Bowflex machine set up in the upstairs bedrooms. He let me try it out. That thing was nice. I'm going to look into getting one myself. After my workout, I was quite hungry. Tommy mentioned to me that he was having salad for dinner and offered me one. I love salads. Anyway, I grow my own vegetables in the garden. He stayed in. Cool, I replied. The salad was amazing. Now, after dinner, we talked for a while. It was starting to get dark, so I mentioned that I had to get going. I didn't want to get home too late. He agreed and started to walk me to the door. Oh shit, he exclaimed. My accomplishments, I forgot to show you. I figured, how long could it take? Ten minutes or so? I got time, I said. Tommy then smiled. Come on, he said, turning around and walking towards the back door. He opened the door and we walked to the large building in the backyard. Now, I was in no way, shape, or form prepared for what I saw. Tommy put his hand on the knob. Now, close your eyes. I want it to be a surprise. I'll guide you in, he said excitedly. So I did. Now in complete darkness, I heard the doorknob turn. I heard the door open and felt Tommy grab my arm. Step, step, step. Okay, stop, he instructed. Are you ready? He asked excitedly once again. Sure am, I replied. I then felt, with my eyes still closed, an overhead light turn on. Okay, my friend, open your eyes, Tommy's son. So I did, but I wish I didn't. You see, what I saw when I opened my eyes completely terrified me and sickened me at the same time. In the room was nothing but plaques and three old rusty dog cages lined with soiled newspaper and handcuffs hanging from the tops of them. Now I know what you're thinking. Plaques? What's so terrifying about plaques? The cages are a little creepy, but the plaques? Well, it wasn't the plaques that were terrifying. No. It was what was on the plaques that terrified me. It was human heads. A lot of them. Neatly preserved with their eyes open and looking at me. I recognized some of them. They were the missing people that I went to school with. Stacy, Scott, Devin, Richard, Amanda, Mr. Fleming, and Butch. Others I did not recognize. 
Ain't it awesome, Mike? Tommy asked, nearly shitting himself with excitement. I just stood there, afraid to say anything. Mike, you okay? He asked. Now, knowing what happened to the missing people, and knowing that Tommy kidnapped them, tortured them, and eventually killed them, led me to only one conclusion. If I didn't play along, Tommy could easily do the same to me. Yeah, man, this is amazing. I love it. I replied as if nothing was wrong. I got them, Mike. I got all of them. He said with a wicked smile, walking over to the heads, pointing to each one and explaining why. Stacy, who laughed in my face when I asked her to a school dance. Scott, who almost broke my arm in gym class one day, showing off for the girls. Devin, who always pulled pranks on me. Richard, who used to spit spitballs at me in class. Amanda, who called me names. Mr. Fleming, who insulted me, causing the whole gym class to laugh at me because I couldn't even do one pull-up. And my prize accomplishment. Little Butch Butch, who cried like a baby right before I ripped his head off. You know what that little fucker used to do to me, Mike. He then turned to look at me. No one is going to fuck with me ever again. He screamed aggressively. I just looked at him. Um, who are the other people? I asked. Oh, they're just some asshats that fucked with me when I first got here. Don't worry about them. He said calmly. In case you're wondering how I keep the heads looking so good, I use my skills as a taxidermist. All my equipment is set up in the basement of the house. I bury the bodies in the garden at night so no one sees me. It's a good way to fertilize the vegetable plants. I suddenly felt that salad come creeping up in my throat. I fought like hell to hold back the vomit and composed myself. Hey man, this is great. I'm glad for you. You finally got revenge. I said. I'll have to stop by again and see if there's any more additions. But I really gotta go, man. Okay, cool. He said, opening the door, shutting off the light and shutting the door. After we walked down, he walked me to the front door, opened it, and shook my hand. I practically ran to my car and got the hell out of there as fast as I could. I got about a half mile from the house, pulled over on the side of the road, puked my brains out, wiped my mouth off, cleaned my hands with some sandy wipes that I keep in the glove box, and drove on. Now, remember that decision I mentioned earlier? The one that only I can make? Well, it's time to make it. You see, I'm sitting in my car, in the parking lot of the local police station, staring at the front entrance right now, contemplating what to do. I've been here for about two hours. Tommy's words keep echoing in my head over and over again. Will you be my friend forever? Ever. No matter what. Followed by my reply. Yes, of course I will. I don't know what to do. I mean, I do not agree with the way Tommy handled things, and I do not agree that the people who tormented him laughed at him, or made fun of him deserve to be tortured and killed either. But every action does have a reaction. Sometimes it's good. Sometimes it's bad. And in this case, it's really bad. What you say or do to someone will have an effect on that person's psyche. They should have known that. People need to realize that. Screw it. What are friends for? I'm going home. Okay, so I just want to preface this story with a disclaimer. An ASOS gift card is obviously not life or death, but an ASOS gift card that you won in a Twitter giveaway with 200 quid on it is pretty high stakes. That being said, what we had to go through to retrieve said ASOS gift card, which we did, was pretty fucked up. So let's start properly. 
Just to give you a bit of context, this story involves me, Erica, who is the one getting married. She's an accountant. Our friend from school, Prem, and Beth, her cousin, who has just finished a classical archaeology degree at UCL. A bit of a mixed bag, really. Cutting to the chase here, we're at a hen do it in Paris. Hanging outside a warehouse rave on the trendy side of town, and I've just fallen arse over a tit and dropped my ASOS gift card from down a grate. The guy outside the warehouse who's in charge of the guest list nodded us towards a slimy set of steps. The steps led towards a yawning opening in the stone wall. The man told us, in English better than our French, that if we headed through the opening, it would take us under the ground and into a disused sewer. If we wandered about half a mile or so, for 15 minutes, it would take us directly under the grate where I dropped my card. It was completely dry under there, he said. It hadn't been used as part of the sewage system in over 70 years. He proved this to us. He took out a 50 cent coin and dropped it down the train. We heard it cling against the dry concrete beneath without a hint of a splash. I'll be real with you. If any of us were even close to being sober, we wouldn't have considered it. But we were drunk and God knows what else. It was exciting. Erica was more buzzed than me. What a story to tell at the wedding, she said. It was like that horror film, As Above, So Below, she said. Only that we weren't going to the catacombs. Only an old sewer. And what self-reflecting demon would haunt a sewer over a catacomb? Exactly, so let's go. We made our way down the steps, still giggling from the adrenaline and clutching onto the cold, slippery handrail that ran along the length of the river wall. It was a freezing cold night, but the minute we stepped into the opening, we felt a gust of warmth. Like getting off a plane into a hot country. We headed down into the opening. It was roasting hot at this point, but completely pitch black. All we had were phone torches which weren't a huge amount of use. That's why I almost missed my gift card lying on the floor. It was as the guy said. I looked up and there was a grid shining down the street below. I snatched up my card from the ground and put it into my pocket. When I heard Prem shriek, it echoed around the tunnel and our eyes were drawn to the opening in the side of the wall. It wasn't there before. We were drunk, and I can be pretty dozy sometimes, but there was no way that we could have missed it, unless it had just appeared. I don't know. It was glowing with the light of about 20 candles. A 50s-style dressing table with a girl sitting at it, doing her makeup. She was in a long white dress and a veil, and she was beaming, just making eye contact with herself in the mirror, and absolutely buzzing by the looks of it. It wasn't a doorway into an apartment or anything, just an entrance to another dank, pitch-black tunnel with a bloody dressing table in the middle of it. We were absolutely silent for a minute, until Erica spoke up. She was never one for an awkward silence, even if that was clearly the only option. Are you okay? She asked, and the girl snapped around and looked at her directly making us all jump. I started to back away slightly, but the girl opened her mouth. I thought she was about to speak, but she just froze. Mouth open in a smile, eyes wide, waiting. She looked at each of us in turn, mouth still open until Beth finally cracked and asked her if we could help. The girl said, something. No idea. It was in a complete foreign language. And I couldn't even hazard a guess at which one. And it was loud. Being in a dark tunnel, it feels like you have to whisper, but she basically screamed and her high voice bounced off the stone walls. I looked at everyone else and they were all looking as bewildered as me. But Beth was as white as a sheet. There was a deafening scraping as the girl got to her feet. She smiled at us. She laughed at us. 
a horrible, breathy giggle, and she started to head into the depths of the side tunnel, dragging the stool she was sitting on with her. No one followed her. We waited until the scraping noises had faded into the dark before we turned to leave. Prem went to have a look at the dressing table, but Beth's hand on his shoulder stopped him. It was mega weird. Ordinary on a night out, if you are somewhere dark or weird or isolated, and you see a girl on your own, you try and stick with her, get her to come with you, or at least call someone to keep an eye on her. But none of us seemed to bother. I barely remember getting out of the tunnel, actually. Only that we managed to flag down a taxi to take us back to the Airbnb. We chatted about it once we got back, of course. Maybe deciding that she was high or drunk or part of a weird underground cult or something. Whatever. Beth mentioned something before we went to Ben. She hadn't said a word up to this point until we asked her if she was okay. She said the girl spoke Assyrian Aramaic, the ancient language she was studying in university. She said that it was the original language of the Bible, the original language that Jesus and his followers would have spoken. Beth said that there were discrepancies over pronunciation and the majority of the syntax, that this language hadn't been spoken properly for over thousands of years. Beth herself didn't understand it fully, but she managed to pick up on three words, Deeper, darker, and one that could either mean rebirth or rise. As I've said, we were pretty drunk. I don't really remember going to Ben, just that we went straight to the airport the next day. And no one has mentioned it since. We were probably right. She was just some drunk girl. Or not, but it's really... Not worth dwelling on. I've been doing it as long as I can remember. I guess I've always been sort of... High strung. I internalize stress and anxiety. It's not good, I know that. But it's how my mother taught me. We didn't dare talk about our stresses or things that bothered us in life. Plus, if it ever got too bad, there were always pills for that. That's where my mom was by then. She just took pills to make her stress go away. Who needed to talk about things when there were pills, right? Anyway, though, it began for me back in middle school, I think. That's when I started to develop really bad social anxiety. It was a sort of coping mechanism. That habit. Standing there awkwardly in the corner at the school dance, or at summer camp, pulling my eyebrow and arm hairs out one by one. Because no one wanted to dance with me, or I wasn't one of the popular kids. And talking to new people, or trying to make friends was daunting. You know how kids can be. Those little things that matter so much at the time. So instead, I would just stand there by myself, pulling the hairs out. I was always careful not to pull out too many, though, lest I end up looking like a cancer kid or something. I was also pretty judicious about rotating the areas I plucked from. Right eyebrow one day, left arm the next day, right leg the day after. There was something soothing about it. It wasn't a self-harm thing. I didn't want to cause myself pain. I'm not really sure what the appeal was. Control? I don't know. I'm not a therapist. I never got to talk to one, remember? But don't they say that doing habitual, repetitive things can help soothe your nerves? It was probably that. I mean, I was always pretty high strung. Well, fast forward a few years and that gangly... Awkward middle schooler ended up becoming pretty sought after in high school and really grew into his own. Varsity football. Found a cool friend group. The hormone-fueled acne subsided. He got dates and went to parties. The social anxiety started to fade away. But there were always other stresses. College applications. The pressure of performing on the football field. Through all of it, one thing continued to bring me comfort. 
tugging those little hairs out. Now, high school me had more options on that front. Eyebrows, arms, armpits, chest, thigh. I even went after a pubic hair every now and then, but those fuckers really hurt to pull out. And again, I wasn't really into the pain, just the repetitive act of actually pulling the hair out. So I tried to avoid those areas. I focused on the arms, the thighs, the chest, areas where you couldn't really see much of an impact. One thing I forgot to add about my mom though, for as bad as she was at caring about my mental health issues, and cooking too for that matter, she kept a clean house. All of those little hairs I plucked out and dropped on the floor, they were always gone the next day. I mean, I swear if that woman didn't swiff her and vacuum every damn day, the house would have looked like a bird's nest from all my discarded hairs. Yeah, I know it's gross. But preteens, teenagers are gross, okay? I mean, my mom basically had to drag me out of bed on the weekends to get me to change my crusty sheets. She was damn quiet, though. Vacuuming and cleaning up all those hairs. She must have done it when I was asleep in the mornings because I never heard her actively cleaning up. The house was always spotless. College was a whole new world for me. It opened so many doors on the social side. I really grew into myself in so many ways. I hit the gym every day and the bars every night. I branched out from my hometown crew and made a whole new group of friends. And the women? My god, the women. Going to an SEC school certainly has its perks. Crop tops and jean shorts 300 days a year. I thrived in college. That social anxiety was a distant memory. Yet, there were always still stresses in my life. Coming from a single mother, single income home, I had to work through college just to pay rent and have some pocket spending money. Balancing classes and my job wasn't easy. It was kind of a nightmare. I had picked a major that had always interested me dating back to childhood. While fulfilling, it was also known as one of the more difficult majors at the school. There were always project deadlines and tests. I would spend my Sundays staring wistfully out from my dorm room window, while the girls sunbathed on the field outside, and my friends watched football on the back porches of their frat houses. Between the gym in the mornings, classes, work, homework, and those Friday and Saturday nights out, there was really no time for anything idle in my schedule. It got overwhelming at times, balancing it all. But I still had my dirty little secret when things got bad, tugging on those little body hairs. Anytime I felt like I was getting overwhelmed or had to stay up late studying for a test or had to sprint from class to the bus to make it to work on time, all I had to do was grab a little hair or two or three and give it a tug. That feeling of the follicle popping out from the skin holding it up to see the translucent hair against fluorescent tube lights or the sun from the bus window. There was nothing like it. Don't get me wrong. I know it wasn't the most healthy way of dealing with my stress, but it worked. And there were certainly times I would find myself pulling more and more hairs out. Finals week, the night before a big project was due. But I was always careful to stay on my rotation. And now, my fully matured college body had another source of hair to add to the mix. My beard. Yes, my big bushy beard. And the one that all the girls love to touch and pet on game days. The beard that helped me pull phone numbers and score girls at the bar was also one of my fondest hair pulling sources. I had to be careful because obviously that and the eyebrows were the most visible places to the public. But if I focus mainly on the bottom of my neckline, it really just looked like I kept close shave on my neck. The downside of my beard being my favorite place to pull hairs from, however, was that those hairs were hard to miss once discarded. They were thick boys, long and scraggly and jet black. 
They honestly kind of look like unshaved pubes lying there. Popping a few out while studying quickly amounted to a hairy mess on my dorm room desk, scattered between my laptop and further into a small pile on the floor. But just like my mom, my roommate David was a neat freak. We had met at orientation before freshman year. He was in ROTC and very studious as well. We balanced each other nicely. He had to wake up and get ready at 4.45 every morning for drills and training, and I slept with a sleep mask and earplugs, so was on phase by his alarm clock, which was the sound of a 50 caliber machine gun, I might add. My mom sent me pretty much weekly care packages with food and snacks, which I readily shared with David. He had grown up in a vegetarian house, so... Slim Jims and pre-cooked room temperature bacon were essentially a delicacy to him. I guess the food tax is what I would consider I paid for him to keep the place so clean. All those hairs I would pop out and drop on the desk and the floor were always gone the next morning. The same as my mom, that dude was a silent cleaner. He must have swiffered and cleaned in the morning after ROTC training because I never heard it. Crazy what a hormonal 20-year-old with earplugs can sleep through, huh? Either way, I appreciated that he never mentioned the hair situation. I'm sure he didn't love cleaning them up all the time, and I'm sure he probably caught me out of the side of his eye plucking a hair or two out now and then. But he never brought it up, which I appreciated. By now, this was my worst vice, and to be honest, it was pretty embarrassing. I'd even had a girl I was hooking up with stop texting me because she said I was weird or OCD or something. When she caught me pulling out some chest hairs on a date one night. I was nervous. It helped me calm my nerves. I tried to explain it to her, but she said her psychology classes made that a red flag to her. Whatever. Lots of other fish in the sea. David and I roomed together for all four years of undergrad. Junior and senior year, we moved to an apartment off campus, which had carpeted floors instead of tile. I knew he probably hated having to vacuum all my hairs out of the rug, but still he never mentioned it. What a guy, David. I knew I liked him for a reason. But my senior year, I knew I wanted to go to grad school. I had focused on a very narrow specialty within my major, or maybe even becoming a professor myself, and knew I would have to get at least a master's to do it. David and I said our goodbyes, and he went off to whatever base he was getting sent to with the Air Force. I prepared to live alone for the first time in my life, which meant I had to do the one thing I was truly dreading more than school, or work, or anything else. Clean. The first year of grad school was dicey. Balancing school and work and the gym became basically impossible, but I needed money to live on, so the gym is what I dropped. I had taken out some substantial loans to pay for my grad classes, much to my mom's chagrin, and was already living on the rice and beans diet. There wasn't an option to stop working. Like, I had stopped going to the gym, so I had to do my best to balance school and work. But the coursework was rigorous. It was like the same professors I had worked with in undergrad went all Jekyll and Hyde and decided that psychological torture was better than actually learning. I mean, there was no way to keep up with some of the assignments and research. I think I would have had to sleep five hours a night to finish it all, and that wasn't even factoring in my part-time job. When I appealed to the professor I was closest with personally for some sympathy, I received a somewhat nasty retort. Well, if you're committed to this program and this field, you can see it and we can see it. If you're not, well then, we can see that too. The word stung my ears. I felt hopeless. I was clearly committed, but I was also human. I needed sleep. I wasn't going to drive myself insane doing this. That's where the light of my life comes in. Isabel. She was a tall, comely young woman. 
We had met at a grad school mixer the previous summer. We were in different departments, so we just briefly chatted and went our separate ways. But later that year, during the spring semester, I had seen her out at a bar. By now, this was a rare outing for me, so I considered it fate. Her and her friend looked like they had just gotten in an argument, and her friend stormed off, so I took the chance to slide in and make my reintroduction. What was that all about, if you don't mind me asking? I said, Believe it or not, you. The rest, as they say, is history. It turns out her friend had seen me at the bar, remembered me from the previous summer orientation, and encouraged Isabel to come talk to me. Isabel didn't want to for a myriad of hollow reasons. He probably had a girlfriend already, who knows if he's still interested, etc. But when her friend threatened to walk over and introduce me herself, Isabel told her to get lost. Needless to say, the sparks flew. Isabel was in school for international business. She had dreams of becoming a traveling real estate developer. Within a month, she was spending pretty much every night at my apartment. And the amazing thing is, wouldn't you guess it? Not only did she cook for us most nights, but Isabel was a habitual cleaner too. The beard and chest and arm hairs that I pulled out day after day after day while I was stressed with work and classes were magically gone the next morning. Isabel was incredible though, truly. Not only was she beautiful, but she really helped steer me back onto the rails that spring and summer. My grad program lasted two years. Two years of fall and spring classes and the summer between. She would even just hang out at my apartment when I wasn't there. Her cooking and hanging around and always pouring a glass of cheap Trader Joe's wine when I got home. It made focusing on school and work that much easier. There was no time for social life, but that was fine. I had found my unicorn, and she was supportive of my schooling. She truly believed that I was smart and was going to be successful, and she had me convinced that I could change the world with the research I wanted to do after school. But I think the best part of our relationship was, one day she saw me pluck a beard hair from my neck. I had a major term paper due the next day, and was already resigned to staying up all night after work to proofread and make final edits. She paused and inquisitively said, What was that? Um, it's just... I trailed off. We made a promise early on not to lie to each other. Plus, I wanted this to work long term, so I decided to take a leap and lay it out on the table. It's a thing I do to deal with stress. I pluck out hairs now and then. I do it when I usually am feeling the pressure of work or of school. It's probably why you've cleaned so many hairs off the floor. I'm sorry. She looked at me and let out a stifled laugh. Whatever helps you through the day, I guess, babe. I mean, you are a hairy man. Whatever works. I don't think you'll miss a few hairs now and then. And that was it. She went back to reading her book on the couch next to me. I couldn't believe it. This woman truly was my unicorn. Not only did she embrace me burning the candle at both ends and loved my personality, but she embraced my weird nervous habit too. It truly was a match made in heaven, and her support gave me the strength to dig deep and make school and work work together. We had a great year. That was, until the spring of my final year of grad school. I had made it so far, but that semester was absolute hell on earth. The final deliverable for my program was an intense thesis project, with a full-on bound booklet outlining the research and data each student had collected. I sat in my research lab until 11, midnight, 1am most nights, poring over case studies and triple-checking my notes. Isabel's grad coursework was lighter, so she would often stop by my lab to kiss me on the forehead and give me a prepackaged dinner, then go out with her friends. I would return the favor by picking her up from the bar at closing time. On my way home from the lab, some nights, 
Usually when she didn't go out and thus drag me home, I stayed at the lab all night. It's a strange feeling, staying up all night, over and over, walking home as the first bits of pre-dawn light peek over the buildings on campus, quietly opening the apartment door and sliding into bed next to Isabel, while she was just easing out of sleep, going while others are coming, caught in a strange wasteland of in-between time. There's something serene but eerie about it. Isabel, the darling that she was, was truly worried about me. She said I was neglecting my health. We can sleep when we're done. I would always ha only half-jokingly quit back. But there was one Friday afternoon I came home from the lab that struck me as particularly odd. Even running on 5 hours sleep and 26 hours awake. I collapsed onto the couch where she came over and brought me a cup of warm tea. I wasn't a coffee drinker, so she always tried her best to caffeinate me in other ways. Babe, I'm worried about you. You're stretching your already thin-stretched self even thinner. She had a way with words. I know, I know. But I just have to get through this spring. My thesis is due in just two weeks. My research is sound. I just need to collect all my thoughts now. Yes, but you can't do that on no sleep. Her emphasis, not mine. You're driving yourself crazy. As she spoke, my mind wandered and I absently felt my right hand twisting and pulling at my left forearm, almost like it had a mind of its own. I looked down and saw a small tuft of arm hair between my fingers. I snapped back too and flickered the hairs away. It was at this point I noticed my left arm was not in great shape, by my standards. There was literal bald patches where hair had been. I was so focused on my research and my dwindling shifts at work that I truly had been neglecting myself. I stood up and quickly moved past Isabel to the bathroom. Is everything alright? Yes, babe. Sorry. Just realized I needed to pee badly. I went into the bathroom and closed the door. I pulled up my shirt and looked at my chest. My now bare chest. There were a few stragglers here and there, but I had essentially plucked my chest and upper stomach clean. I couldn't even recall when I had done it. I'm a pretty hirsute guy, so this was a bit alarming. I leaned back and looked at my eyebrows and face. My eyebrows actually did seem a bit thin, and my beard was ragged at the bottom. It was probably easily misread as a man who had been running on little to no sleep for weeks, but I could pretty easily see. I combed my beard out and realized I had essentially plucked every hair from my neck up to around the bottom of my jawline. The bushy front of my beard hid it somewhat, but I knew deep down. I had been going to town on those hairs. It had made sense, I suppose. I was incredibly stressed, after all. Weeks of all-nighters in the lab and a non-existent social life had taken their toll. I sheepishly pulled my shirt back on and came out of the bathroom. I turned to Isabel and attempted an apology, assuming she must have known what I had been up to. I'm sure she had spent the last several weeks cleaning the steadily multiplying hairs from my studio apartment floor. Babe... I'm sorry for this, I said as I gestured to my beard and body. You've done a great job cleaning up. But she looked at me somewhat perplexed. I mean, you've barely been here. You eat off paper plates. It hasn't really been that much work, my love. I know, I guess mainly the hairs, I guess. I bet I'm shedding more than a dog the last few weeks. You know, no more than usual, I think. Actually, it's funny, for as hairy as you are, you never really seem to make too much of a mess, especially in the bathroom. I think my old roommates used to shed more than you. Isabel was sweet. I truly loved her. Even in my saddest, most defeated state, she still tried to lift me up. But 
She was about to go to class for the afternoon, so she left me with some chicken salad in the fridge while I nodded off to sleep on the couch. When I woke up, it must have been around 7 or 7.30 in the evening. The sun had just gone down and I could see the glow from the street lights outside beginning to shine through the cheap plastic mini blinds. I blinked a few times and let my eyes come into focus. I was so exhausted I had fallen asleep without my sleep mask even on. Then I noticed something weird. Isabel had classes all afternoon and said she was going straight to happy hour with friends after, but the door was propped open. Isabel was from a small town in the country in the Midwest. On nicer spring and summer days, she would prop the door open. I always softly chastised her for doing that. For safety reasons mainly, but our college town was small and pretty safe. She only did it during the day, not at night. Plus, my place was on the third floor that had been converted to student housing years ago. But I thought it odd that she would leave the door open while I was asleep and alone. Maybe she had come home and decided to skip happy hour. From the corner of my vision, I saw her begin to move and realized she must have. Except, the thing that I saw begin to move was not Isabel. In fact, it was much broader. It must have been the width of a refrigerator. Instinctively, I opened my mouth to shout, but in that moment, I could not even move my lips or spur any type of sound. I watched as this thing slowly shifted its weight back and forth from side to side and moved methodically toward me. At first, I thought it was the light playing tricks on my eyes, but I realized very quickly that the edges of this thing were, I would describe it as, vibrating. Almost like the entire thing was made of black static. I could not speak. I could not move. My eyes were locked onto this mass of vibrating darkness moving toward me. It slowly sauntered ever closer. The weight of it didn't seem to align with its size, or it was unaffected by gravity. This massive thing was slowly teetering back and forth in a way that should have thrown it off balance. As it drew nearer the couch, it just got close enough to caress my right arm. That touch sent shivers down my spine. My eyes strained in the dark as it leaned over my body like a coroner about to open a cadaver. I laid there helplessly trying to summon any bit of energy I had to swing my arm or shout for help. But instead, all I felt was cold. I was nauseous and dizzy at the same time and my heart was pounding and I felt a tear roll down my cheek while this strange black thing inched closer. Was it a bear that had come in through the door? It looked almost like fur, but it had no eyes or ears or mouth. It was humanoid in shape roughly, but no hands or fingers. I felt it make contact with my skin again. When it did, sheer terror passed through me like a jolt of electricity. In that moment, I felt the thing's sinister intentions. It was no longer part of an observation, but an operation. It caressed my chest several times before slowly climbing atop me and mounting me across the stomach. Tears welled in my eyes as I desperately tried to scream for Isabel, scream for my mother, scream for anyone. My mouth finally creaked open, but this time all that came out was a soft croak, almost frog-like. The thing bowed its mantle closer and closer to my face. It seemed to vibrate with excitement as my heart raced faster and faster. I felt its arm-like appendage brush against my lower lip and thought the feeling was familiar. It felt almost hair-like. In that moment, with the glow of from the street lights now flooding through my windows and the wall illuminated behind it, I could see that this previously mysterious silhouette was. It was not a vibrating mass of static, but a vibrating mass of hair. I sensed a certain disdain come over the thing, almost as if it had been found out. I thought about all the times I thought my mother or my roommate or my girlfriend had cleaned up my discarded hairs, but... 
That was absurd. But it felt somehow inevitable. How it all led to this moment. I could feel anger and sorrow and resentment bubbling inside this thing on top of me. Its profile oscillating more and more wildly with every passing second. It felt only somewhat self-contained now. It was shaking and teetering back and forth on me. I felt my chest compressing. All my breath was impossible to catch. I could see thick mats of hair rolling and folding over themselves and tangling and knitting themselves tighter and tighter. Wild strands on all sides of the thing frayed and flicked against the light. I felt what must have been its appendages reach from my face and crank open my jaw. I watched in abject horror as the top of the mass pushed toward my open mouth and jammed itself into my throat. I felt the million tiny stones wrapped in sandpaper race down my throat and press against my insides. I felt the million tiny hairs begin to press against the inside of my skin and puncture it like needles. I felt my body becoming a human pin cushion from the inside out as the mass of hairs grew exponentially inside of me and pressed against every surface it could. My chest finally collapsed in on itself from the pressure of it all, while simultaneously exploding in a flash of white hot pain. Every one of my ribs bowed out and I felt my insides turn ice from the cool night air. I gave in to the one thing that consumed me and let it mangle me from the inside out. Isabel said she found me convulsing on the floor, rocking back and forth with bloody spit flying in all directions. She immediately called 911 and the paramedics loaded me into an ambulance, then rushed me straight to the ER. I broke two teeth with how hard my jaws were clenched on the way to the hospital. The paramedics said they actually heard an audible crack. They said my muscles were cramped so tightly they felt like rocks. I also bit clear through the top of my tongue when I was seizing on the floor of our room, but we only realized it when Isabel found a shriveled up piece of skin on the floor later. The next few weeks were a blur. I spent some days heavily sedated and I couldn't shake the image from my head, that dark thing looming over me in the room. The nurses said I woke up in the middle of the night a few times early on, fists clenched, soaked through the sheets, gasping for air like a dying fish, stretching my jaw open, gagging almost. Isabel barely left the hospital room that night. She's a goddamn trooper, though. I insisted we couldn't shut even a single light off in the room. I didn't want any chance of it coming back for me, manifesting from a dark corner or out from under the hospital bed. I didn't know what that thing was, but the pain I felt the moment it dove into my chest was the most intense thing I will ever feel in my life. Isabel did her best to calm me down and try to ground me. But I vacillated between frantic and catatonic. I could barely even focus on the doctors when they asked if I had a family history of epilepsy or seizures and said they wanted to prescribe anti-anxiety medications and muscle relaxers. Weeks of testing, x-rays, scans, and blood work revealed nothing abnormal or suspect physiologically. By the time I was evaluated by a psychiatrist, I had at least worked back to a point where I could have complex conversations. She insisted the anti-anxiety medications would help, and that I should see improvements in my mood within a few weeks to months. She said extreme stress do strange things to the human brain. She said they can make people see things that aren't there. But it was there. In that room. In the darkness. I felt every single razor-sharp hair as it writhed down my gullet and pierced my insides. It was painful. It was seared into my mind. The look of that thing. The vibrating energy. That sinister, static being. The medication wasn't quite like turning a light switch on, but I could feel something working. The meds were a good start, 
but the thing I found to be the most helpful was talking. I became more open with Isabel. I reached out to some old friends and reconnected. The psychiatrist also recommended a therapist to me. I talked with her about everything. I talked about my mom. I talked about growing up. I talked about stress. It made it all easier to cope with. I even talked to the therapist about my nervous habit. She gave me some exercises to do as a stand-in for the hair pulling. And you know what? I'm somewhat embarrassed to say this, but they worked. Every time I wanted to grab and yank on a little beard hair or an arm hair, I would do one of her exercises. The whole philosophy was that replacing one repetitive task with another, more focused task, would bring me back into the moment and allow me to recognize when something was stressing me out, rather than just ignoring it and letting it bubble over. I went back and finished my grad program the following year with a reduced course load. The school was extremely accommodating. Turns out they really change their tune when someone suffers from a medical, psychological emergency. Probably just didn't want to get sued. Isabel, God bless her, she stayed with me through and after it all. Maybe she felt bad for me. Trauma is binding, right? I won't complain, she's still the best thing that has ever happened to me. We've been married over 15 years. We have a beautiful house and a beautiful young son. He's actually just about middle school aged himself now. I don't quite find time to talk to my therapist every week, but I still do my exercises. Pretty much every day. I don't think I've pulled out a hair in years. My head would appreciate the irony of that. I started going bald around 32 and decided to shave the whole damn thing off at 35. Still have the beard though. And Isabel still loves running her fingers through it when we're sitting there on the couch. It was at breakfast the other morning, and I noticed our son Jack fiddling with his arm. I saw him twist and pull a few hairs out, and absentmindedly drop them to the side. My eyes followed that small tuft of hair as it wafted back and forth and settled on the kitchen floor. I looked back up and locked eyes with him. He immediately knew I saw what he had done, and my demeanor stiffened. Jack? I watched as his mother left the kitchen to go grab her work bag. Jack, what you just did, I want you to know I saw it. I used to do that too. He blushed and looked awkwardly down at the table. For me, it was a nervous habit. I didn't talk about things that made me nervous or scared, and I just did that instead. I kept it all inside. You know you can always talk to your mom and dad, right? Yeah, I know. Sometimes it's just hard, though. I know, I responded. I know it's hard, but it's not good to keep those feelings inside. That gets people into trouble. It can lead to bad things happening. Something bad happened to me a long time ago because I kept all the feelings inside, okay? He nodded dutifully. I'm not sure if he will ever actually talk honestly to us. You know how kids that age are. He pushed away from the table and went upstairs to grab his backpack. I looked back down beside his chair as he left, though. At the spot where that tuft of discarded hair had settled on the floor... But the strangest thing was that it was no longer there. My grandfather was a caretaker at Belmont Park Cemetery in Liberty, Ohio, right outside the city of Youngstown. It was a job my father had secured for him so he could be closer to all his boys, all five of them. My father came from a family of eight, three girls and five boys, my mother an only child. Now my grandfather was a retired coal miner from Welch, West Virginia. He eventually succumbed to black lung in his later years and was laid next to my grandmother to rest at Belmont Park. But that's a few years down the road yet. 
And not the story I want to tell here. My story takes place in the year of my country's bicentennial. I can still remember all the red, white, and blue. Stickers, buttons, banners, and flags. Plastered, painted, and taped all across my hometown of Liberty. I was 10 that summer, and more than just a little excited about it all. Let's not forget the parade. Like I said earlier, my grandfather was a caretaker cutting the grass and performing maintenance at the cemetery when needed. We lived on West Montrose. The road was a 90 degree angle and came to a dead end. There was a small trail that ran through the woods at the end of this road and came out at the north end of the cemetery. Now, Belmont Park is an average sized cemetery as far as cemeteries go. It sat on a slight grade with four pretty good sized drainage ponds and two huge walk-in mausoleums which sat at the base of these grades. In the summer, they would open up the huge brass and wood doors and let the air out. My sister and I, and some of our friends from the neighborhood, and sometimes even our cousins when they were visiting, would walk down these old musty halls, taking turns reading, aloud to each other, the names, birth, and death dates etched into the marble faces. And sometimes, on dark, spooky summer nights, we would sneak into the cemetery with flashlights and take etchings off the older gravestones with crayons and paper. Not to make it sound creepy, but the cemetery was at the end of our road. My grandfather worked there, so it was kind of a place for us kids to hang out at when there was nothing else to do. Not to mention there were sunfish in these ponds. Now, I would go up and fish these ponds or explore the surrounding woods that the cemetery ran up against. Or just sit with my grandfather while he took his lunch breaks and told me stories about my father and my uncles when they were young boys and full of mischief. It was the summer of 76 and I was happy to be out of school. This is a true story, by the way. Now, there had been a bad storm which had gone on most of the night and into the early hours of the morning. By 4 or 5 that morning, the storm had moved in. The day was still gray and overcast, and there was some debris and a few branches that the weather had brought down and blown around, but other than that, it was over. I decided I was going fishing. I grabbed my pole and a few pieces of bread for bait. The sunfish loved it. I made my way to the end of our road, followed the path that led through the woods, and came out at the cemetery. As you came out of the woods, you come to the first of the drainage ponds, which is the largest of the four, and the best one for fishing. It also had three or four weeping willow trees around the water's edge that provided nice shade in the summer heat. I walked down the embankment to the edge of the pond, got my pole ready, and began to fish. Now I had cast my line in several times and was getting no bites. As I had said earlier, there was a storm that had raged most of the evening and into the early morning and there were some sticks and branches lying around the edge of the pond. Since the fishing was no good that morning, I started to play around the water's edge, snapping off small sections of the sticks and pushing them out into the water, pretending I was launching ships. I had just launched about a two-foot section of a branch out into the pond when this hand, yes, a hand, dark and mottled, no more than half of it breaking the surface had gently stopped the stick and pushed it back towards me. Now you might think you can prepare yourself for the sight of something that in no way should be there, or to brush up against the unreal. Your ego might get big and say to your conscience that this is how I would react to a paranormal experience. I'm here to tell you right now when true terror grips you, you are like a deer frozen in the headlights of madness, reeling until your mind finds purchase. Your mind is screaming no way, but your eyes are saying right there it is. I came to from my shock as the hand slowly slid under the surface of the water, and the stick was on its way back towards me. At that instant, I realized how close I was to the water's edge, and an entirely new wave of terror swept over me. What if it was making its way to the shore right now, quietly cutting through the muddy storm waters to grab me by my ankles and pull me in? 
I fell backwards and backpedaled. Crab walked up the embankment at a hundred miles an hour. I scrambled to my feet and stood there watching the surface where the hand had retreated in, but it did not make a second appearance. One sighting was quite enough. I watched as the stick came back and made contact with the shore. That was enough for me. I grabbed my fishing pole and started back towards the trail, which led home. While quickly stealing glances over my shoulder to make sure I wasn't being followed. When I got home, I told my parents what I had seen at the cemetery, but they didn't believe me. Just like most of you reading this right now, it's like anything. I seen a ghost, I seen a UFO, I seen Bigfoot. People look at you and they don't know what to make of your story, but 9 out of 10 times they just don't believe you. I know what I saw. So many times I tried to rationalize it over the years and have tried repeatedly to convince myself that it was just a tangle of sticks, barely submerged under the surface of the water, and that when my branch passed over it, it triggered the whole mass into motion. Like some nightmarish Rube Goldberg contraption that assembled itself and caused it to come to the surface for four or five seconds and then as gravity took over, it descended and pushed the stick back towards me and gave me this false impression of something being playful with me under the surface of the water that day. I'm in my mid-fifties and I want to put this down before I get too old. Not a month goes by that I don't think about what I saw on that overcast morning in the summer of 76. My children have made me tell them this story a thousand times on dark nights around our many campfires. So many years have passed since that summer morning, and the man in the mirror is no longer that little boy. And yet the man is still very sure of what his younger self witnessed that gray summer morning. But there's also this little itch in the back of my brain that I can't ignore that just won't go away no matter how ridiculous it sounds. That likes to remind me that the children's section of the cemetery sits just above my favorite fishing spot. And maybe, just maybe, I had a playmate that day who slid down through the ground to play with me. Who knows? I like to think on bright moonlit nights when all the conditions are right and the stars are hung just so. They slip out at the sides or base of their rotted caskets. Moving like wet eels down those mud tubes. Slipping silently into the pond to play with each other. Quietly laughing and raising light ripples. Scattering the moonlight across its surface. I was alone when I got here. It was 6 p.m., 7 p.m. perhaps. The sun was just setting. For context, I run an abandoned building exploration YouTube channel. I just use my phone to record. No fancy equipment or anything. Well, tonight I come across an empty mall. These have gotten more popular lately with all the talk about liminal spaces, creepy vibes, back rooms. You know. So I have a look around, and it seems pretty recently decommissioned. Nothing is particularly old or worn down yet. Quite a few of the lights in the mall are still on, just dimly lit, as if they're on some backup battery, draining away until they die. I find an elevator, and see that the up and down arrows are still lit, albeit dimly. I wonder if it still works. Yep, really insatiably curious. I press the button and I'm shocked to be responded to by a ding. A ding and... nothing. I press it again and again. I... kinda spammed it, but whatever. I eventually hear some sort of inner workings and the doors slide open extremely slow. I'm talking comically slow. Only, it was a bit less comical and a bit more creepy, given the context. That doesn't matter. I need content for my channel. I get in the elevator and hit the lowest button on the panel. Basement. It's dark. 
I'll just peek around the corner with my phone flashlight and go back up. Honestly, I just want the thumbnail. That alone will work. The elevator creaks and whirs down about two floors, I'm assuming, and stops. I notice that my heart is beating pretty quickly. My nerves, probably, but I also had an energy drink. I snap out of thinking about my heart rate and realize the door hasn't opened. Right. I hit the button that looks like the open button, and the door is open, again in a painfully slow manner. It's just not dark. Just a normal basement, dimly lit like the rest of the mall. I step out of the elevator and point my phone around the concrete halls. Blue painted concrete walls, janitorial stuff lying around, gently humming lights on the ceilings. I actually considered exploring a bit, but forgot it. I decided to play it safe and go back up. I get in the elevator. The doors had never closed. Hit the button. Nothing. I spam it. Nothing. My heart sinks a bit. Spam it some more. Wait a bit. Still no response. I'm so stupid. I'm so stupid. I'm so screwed. I curse for about a minute as my heart rate elevates once again, and I walk in circles holding my head like a moron, until I realize there has to be a staircase. Fire regulations exist. They can't just make a basement with no exit other than an elevator. Okay. I hurry around the concrete halls and realize it's less of a basement and more of a bunch of basements connected by hallways. B4, B6, B5. I see these little numbered signs and I'm both amused and angered that they help none. No arrows. Nothing. Aren't they supposed to have exit signs? I narrate to my video that I really, really want to find a way up now. I'm getting scared. You know those dim lights I mentioned? They almost seem to be getting dimmer. They are. They are getting dimmer. You've got to be kidding. I had just noticed how low my battery was when I heard the worst sound I've ever heard. The sound of all of the power dying. The sound of every light turning off at once. Clicks and silence. Pitch black. Pitch black silence. And the light from my soon-to-be useless phone screen lighting up my stupid sweaty face. My phone is going to die soon. This is my last post. I realize I'm going to have to feel my way around until I hopefully find some sort of accent. My mind is playing with me too. I keep thinking I heard a noise from down the hallway. No. Wait. I... definitely heard a noise. Let's get it straight. I'm not afraid of what comes after. Would it be trials, imprisonment, or something much worse? I'm afraid that if it is not me, nobody would leak the truth, so I'm blowing the whistle. Just for the sake of my own frail sense of safety, I won't share any personal info. All the names are random, and all the matches are coincidental. We live in a crazy world, right? A couple of decades ago, people couldn't even imagine the technologies that are present in your smartphone, laptop, or gaming console. We are standing on a brink of a day that will introduce us to a new coil of a tech breakthrough spiral. With all these crypto, blockchain, NFT, deep learning things internet brags about lately, it is more than obvious. Yes, those don't look like much reliable to this point. And I, personally, think that not all of the above will see another year, but the point is, back in the days, nobody thought that you can watch HD videos on the screen of your phone while chatting with a person living on another continent over a gaming app with photorealistic avatars that use motion capture. You get the point. Deny it or not, we're at this stage of human history. I work for a company that is responsible for one of those apps. A really popular one, you might imagine. 
holding the key role in my department, make magic happen, but enough with the bragging. About a month ago, we received the official proposal from the big guys. They were asking if we would like to get a sneak peek into the metaverse, so we'd understand the technology, our capabilities and limitations, and be the ones among the first to port our product into their VR environment. We agreed instantly, as you know. You either stay in trends or go down with history. So a week ago, we've received some dev kit stuff. A dozen of devices, access permissions, and nearly a box of paperwork. Metaphorically speaking, as all the forms and manuals came in digital, they sent in some stuff too. A couple of guys named Jack and Beth came along to monitor the testing, answer questions, and ask their own. This wasn't a big surprise as we had similar experience in the past when some new features were introduced. But would you believe me if I say that it took me no less than three hours to read through all the agreement forms and sign all the NDA documentation? There was a lot. I'll spare you the details about handshaking and chit chats. The devices that happened to be modified versions of Oculus Quest 2 were distributed between folks in the office. We made sure that each department had at least one so we could get a better picture and wide range of opinions, and pick the day of the week to give it a go. And so, the testing started. It feels like I need to make a remark here. I'm not a stranger to a VR technology in general. I myself have a HTC Vive at home and like to drop by VR chat or slice some fun out of Beat Saber. So if you're expecting this, wow, it was like real world thing here. It was not, but to be completely honest, the visuals were better, yes. I think the Quest supports higher resolutions and they achieve some great things with 3D sound and built-in speakers. But I'm not sure if the regular market ones have the same... I don't own it. But yeah, there we were. Just like in the presentation video, there was a beach location, and the house, and all 12 of us. First session, not much of a fun, as everybody explored avatar creation options, choosing from hundreds and hundreds of hairstyles, costumes, accessories. Actually, it was quite impressive how the whole thing handled that amount of data seamlessly, because I would expect a massive client download for that type of thing, but no. Just with your browser window, you could browse and apply thousands of things on the fly. After an hour, as we finished, Jack and Beth gathered us and asked about our thoughts so far. If anyone felt motion sickness or headaches, nothing you wouldn't expect. Next day after the lunch, we were gathered again to give it a second try. Nothing alerting here, too. We checked the possibilities, got used to controls, and explored the features such as reaction emoticons, default items, paintbrush, firecrackers, musical instruments, etc., and such. Some of the folks wandered around our virtual beach and tried to interact with the world objects. One of our artists was able to stick a rock he picked up behind the sky texture, and that crashed the whole scene for a moment. So, as you might have guessed, it's still pretty raw and bugs are of plenty. Next day, next session. This time we started with questions from meta people again. They asked if anyone experienced disturbed sleep, fatigue, headaches. Again, nothing extraordinary. All these symptoms happened to those trying on VR headsets. That day, we tried some built-in games like Beach Volleyball, which pretty much explains the Gathering Point theme now as I think of it. Probably they were prototyping and picked the beach just because it was done already for the presentation, but that is just my guess. Table Tennis and some game about catching falling stars. Yet again at this point, you might ask, What's the point of your story, man? What's the threat? I hear you, but please bear with me as I am trying to make the point obvious to you. Sometimes the most horrible things lurk in plain sight, hidden behind a thin tapestry 
showing you the sweetest and innocent things. Next day, we shared the experience with another team. Yes, we were not the only ones participating, so that kind of makes me feel better for reasons I've described above. It was actually pretty impressive, as there were at least 36 fully detailed animated avatars in a single location in real time. We spoke to each other via built-in microphones. As somebody changed the location settings to snow, we were able to play snowballs and so on. The physics of the materials is something unbelievable. You could almost feel making snowballs as you gave them shape with controllers and those vibrated lightly as you pushed the hands together. While the soft crunching sound played in the headset resembling real thing. And did I mention the water and the clouds? Anyways, after this session I had the questions to ask. But thanks to my colleague, it was he to go ahead and shoot in. How did you guys manage to pull this off? I think that server's load could possibly melt the rack they are standing on. Or something like that. Jack just smiled and Beth replied, Just wait for tomorrow as we are going to give it a real test. And then, it was their turn to question us. It was all regular again up to a point where one of them asked, Did any of you at any point of the session witness him? We sat there blinking in confusion. Silent, but Beth, I think, just said, Okay, please, never mind. Just next question. Maybe that was some sort of sanity check. Just to make sure that we follow and our minds don't just wander somewhere else. I don't know, but yes, it was weird. Next day, as I was grabbing a coffee in the kitchen after the meeting, one of my colleagues who participated in test stopped by and asked if I had any weird dreams lately. I know the guy, girl, very well. We were hired in the same month back in the day, so I'm quite sure that he or she is not of that sensitive type. No, I replied. Why? It's just, I keep seeing things for past couple of nights in my dreams, and I mean really disturbing things. It's like I'm completely another person, and I know stuff in my sleep that I never knew before. It's hard to explain. Um, never mind. Probably just some stress kicking in. But no, nothing like that. I've slept like a baby and was full of energy as we began next round of testing. This time there were even more people present. I think the number was close to 70. Maybe 80. I'm not sure. And while all of us stood there, chatting or simply spectating, a thing called Max Load Graphical Test went on. Think of it as a light show. It was a bunch of different complex pictures appearing in the sky, visualizing geometrical shapes, symbols, graphs, and such. Very intense, very vivid, and very bright. I must admit, it was beautiful. If anyone would experience that there, I'm pretty sure the whole concept would get much more anticipation. Then different objects started to appear right in front of us. Cute puppies waving their tails. Strawberry cakes on plates. Misted mugs of beer with rich foam and tiny transparent drops running by side. This was next gen type of thing. It was just like the real thing. I felt a strange urge to reach with my hand and give it a touch. And when I say this... I don't mean with my controller, no, real touch. Suddenly I realize that the voice inside of my head keeps repeating, it's so good, I want that now, I must have it now. I felt my mouth watering, but suddenly the bowl with hot chicken wings that floated in front of me got glitched. At first the steam became static, then some colored lines appeared crisscrossing it and finally the whole thing froze. I looked around as if breaking out of my mesmerized state. Others stood there frozen, as if only I could move. And next thing that happened was a sound of someone sobbing. Like, real sobbing. Not in the speakers. I took off the gear and looked around. 
one of my colleagues looked absolutely devastated. Tears were running down her cheeks, making it to the hand that she used to cover her mouth with a controller still in it as her shoulders were shaking while she was clearly weeping, attempting to make it silent. I came up to her and touched her by the shoulder. No reaction. I called her by her name. Same. I shook her lightly. She went on with the crying and suddenly began to hyperventilate. This is no Matrix movie. I said to myself and put my hands onto her headpiece, planning to take it off. As I did, I saw her eyes. God, the look in it shot me through as if I was hit by a snowstorm. She was looking straight at me with a gaze into vast nothingness, with eyes so full of terror I could barely see the pupils of her eyes as they shrunk to the size of a pin needle. As soon as she realized that she was not in Metaverse anymore, her hand went down helplessly. Her face, distorted with the weeping, stood motionless for a moment, and then she started to scream. I've never heard anybody screaming like that. There was something primal in it. Primal, as in fear. I panicked, freezing in place as her spit landed onto my face, paralyzed by this unexpected act. Thoughts were running places, but before I got a good one, I was broken out of my stupor by another scream left out of me. And another, and yet another one. The whole room was full of people screaming their lungs out. Finally, I got a hold of myself and ran out of the room to call for help. As I did, I saw some people rushing in, wearing what I think was paramedic uniforms. It took me half an hour to get a grip and calm down. As I was sitting in the kitchen surrounded by my colleagues trying to make me feel better and asking what happened there. We saw the guys in the uniforms rolling the stretchers here and there. Some of the people in them had blankets over their faces. God. Of course, we never saw Jack and Beth after the incident. Our CEO called Meta's head office directly to discuss the horrible events, but they stated that those people were never employed or associated with their company. What a bunch of bastards. I took some extra days off from work, and that didn't raise any questions, obviously. Two days after, I decided that I can't remain silent anymore. Fuck it, they probably will figure me out sooner or later. As I mentioned some key details to the incident, I can't say I came out of it traumatized or questioning my sanity, but there is one thing that is actually bothering me lately. I started to have this weirdest dream where I stand in some sort of the basement, surrounded by huge shelves with machines buzzing and blinking rhythmically. I make a couple of steps forward to see what's at the center of the room, and it's more like a who than what. It lies on the floor with a feeding tube attached to its multiple holes. There are lots of wires and screens and the other devices, the purpose of which I cannot understand. As I step closer and it splits its head in half to reveal the myriad of eyes, I can hear the thoughts forming in my head. The thoughts that aren't mine. The thoughts that don't belong to this world. I wake up instantly at this point, covered in cold sweat and tears, shaking to the bone. Each time I see that dream, and that happens every time I put my head to rest, I keep staying there longer and longer. I am afraid that at some point, there will be no return. So I beg of you, please, stay away from Metaverse when it hits the public. We were on a little traveled road when we drove past it. My parents doubted a hotel would be good miles away from towns. I ensured they knew I was tired. So soon my complaining made them tired too. The hotel we were at seemed like a Hilton or Motel 6 you'd find. Everything was freshly vacuumed. The lobby looked like it came straight out of the Four Seasons. Although the only person there was the receptionist. 
it slipped by me at the time, but in retrospect, it sticks out to me. Why would such a nice hotel have no other customers? When we walked into our third floor room, I realized I had never seen a room so clean. I was 10 that night. The foster care system never found my birth certificate, so they think my real age is unknown. My mom, dad, and I were tired from the leg of our road trip we had embarked upon that day. I was swimming in the pool while my parents watched. I was doing some results underwater and splashing around. While my mom and dad discussed their plans for the next day. Wanting their attention, I turned to my parents and shouted, Thanks for taking me down here. My dad, glad to hear me say anything besides a complaint, responded, You're welcome, Jack. My dad left after mentioning a work project or something urgent he needed to get done. I decided to see how long I could hold my breath. After my lungs started to scream for air, I gave up. My mom started to chastise me for this, saying, You shouldn't do that, Jack. You could. She was distracted by the sounds of my father shouting and running towards us, followed by an ear-splitting shriek. After he entered the pool room, he told my mom to take me and run. He would distract them while we ran to our room. The exits were already blocked by them. My mother was shocked. Finally, she stammered, What? What are you talking about? As far as I can remember, this is the only time I ever heard my dad yell. He shouted, Go, take Jack and run to the room. Now. My mom ran to grab me. She pulled me out of the pool, soaking wet, and my dad began to run down the hallway, screaming as loud as he could. I reached out for my towel, thinking about drying myself for some reason. I didn't move as she carried me into the hallway, because I was still trying to wrap my mind around the situation. It was then that I saw them. There were three in the hallway chasing my dad. They looked human-like, but they were hairless, and their arms stretched down to the floor, dragging as they walked. Their legs were short, yet they moved as fast as my dad. They wore no clothes, yet shadows prevented them from flashing us. And their hands... Their hands were the strangest part. They were long, at least a foot in length, and curled like fish hooks. I knew they were sharp, intuitively despite the fact they were made of skin. They chased my father down the hallway as my mother ran with me in the opposite direction. I reached out for my father, grasping for any hope that he might come back to us. My hope was futile. One of the creatures shrieked, shattering light bulbs and glass windows all around us. My mother dropped me, instinctually covering her ears. As she picked me back up, I saw dozens more of the creatures rush towards my father. A few ran by me and my mom, and I did nothing but stare in horror as my view of my dad was blocked by them. My mom picked me up, and we sprinted to a stairwell. It was dimly lit, as many of their lights were shattered by the shrieking. She sprinted up the first and second flights of stairs. Suddenly, she stopped. She saw it, but it didn't see us. I noticed that this monster's eyes were cloudy, and I wondered if that was the case for all of them. It was short, maybe three feet, and its fingers looked sharp and hungry for our blood. My mom gingerly set me down, placed our room's keycard in my palm, and closed my hand around it. She leaned towards me and cupped her hands around my ear. She said as quietly as she could, You're going to have to run to our room and get in there by yourself. It's room 304, the second one on the right. Don't wait for me. Just as she finished that sentence, she turned and charged at the creature. I dashed towards the room without looking back. As I ran by, I felt something sharp catch my shoulder, and it began to feel like it was on fire. I made it to the door unlocked it, and made it inside. As I turned around to close the door, I took one last glance at my mother. She was determined to stop the creature from shrieking. Her arms wrapped around it, and she pulled its face into her stomach. 
I saw crimson blood on the back of her shirt. I knew she would have a hard time getting the stain out. Hope bubbled up inside me, and I waited to see her kill it and run into our room. She would make everything right. I knew she would. Then I heard its shrieks. I ducked and covered my ears. Once I looked up, I saw more creatures running down the hallway. I closed the door to our room and collapsed. I tried to sob as quietly as possible and moved as little as possible. One small noise could end my life. Then I fell asleep. Time blurred together for the next couple of days. Fear and the pain in my shoulder kept me from getting much sleep. Sometimes, hunger or thirst drove me to risk opening a bag of Chex Mix or raiding the mini bar for a water bottle. I made it at least a few days without attracting their attention, suppressing the pain of my parents' death. All my grief overwhelmed me eventually, like lava exploding out of a volcano. I cried out, Mama! At once, I realized my mistake. A large number of footsteps came thundering my way. I heard a clawing at my door that grew louder and louder. Desperate for any escape, I frantically looked around the room. The window. Yes, the window was the only way. I made a mad dash to the window and began trying to open the lock. A monster's hand broke through the doorway. I couldn't reach high enough to open the window, so I moved the bed close enough. I opened the window just as the creatures broke through the door. The monsters that rushed towards me looked like water in a wave. There must have been 10 to 20 of them trying to get through the doorway simultaneously. I took one look at the ground below me and the screen in front of me and I jumped. As I was falling, I flailed my limbs wildly. I hit the ground. I tried to run towards the road, but I couldn't move. Then I looked at my legs. I passed out the moment I saw how twisted they were. I woke up in a hospital. When the nurse realized I was awake, they called a policeman in to talk to me. He explained that a passerby had picked me up and brought me here, and asked me what had happened to me. I told him the whole story, including the monsters, my parents' fate, and how I jumped out a third-story window. He had sympathetic eyes when I told the story, but he turned and asked the nurse what drugs I was on. He then asked me what my name was and where my parents were. I said my name is Jack Dawson. The monsters got my parents in the hotel. Do you think you could go look for them? He responded calmly. Jack, there isn't a hotel on that road, but we'll see if we can find your parents. I was too tired to tell him he was wrong. I felt a warm, calming feeling come over me and I went back to sleep. As I healed over the next few weeks, I was told that no records existed of me or my parents. They checked for missing child reports and asked me if I was sure I was told them the right name. But eventually it became clear that no record of me or my parents existed. I argued with them constantly. After a few years, I had to give up. My parents were already dead, so there was no use in fighting with the system. My life turned out pretty okay. I bounced around foster care for a while and did my fair share of vandalism during my teen years. I graduated high school somehow and decided to become serious about my life. I became an electrician, got married, and had two beautiful daughters. That night hangs in the back of my mind like a cobweb you can't quite reach. I want to go back to that road and show everyone the hotel is real. I can't do anything about it because I can't put my daughters through the same horrors I went through. I had parents despite what everyone says. Everyone knew I had them until that night. To be honest, I'm not as freaked out about this as I should be. After all, I'm used to staying indoors at this point. I'm pretty sure I'm safe, but 
Boy, I wasn't expecting to walk into a mess like this. Lately, I've been feeling really down on life. I'm not sure I'm not alone in this regard. Between the pandemic, climate change, and the next world war right on the horizon, many people's perspective on reality is at an all-time low. One of my favorite means of escape lately has been binge-watching paranormal stuff on YouTube. If you don't know, researching the paranormal on the internet is beyond rabbit hole territory. Think gigantic underground prairie dog city. As much as I kept telling myself to approach things with skepticism and rational, scientific thought, the idea of other forces out there engaged in a battle for humanity really seems to take the edge of the mundane, existential crisis we're all living in. For some reason, however, I've been feeling the urge to fight back. A part of me really wants to help save the world, which, again, I'm sure is a feeling many of us have. I've been starting small. Donating to a few charities here and there, taking the bus more, eating less meat, the usual. But my fantasy is to do something big that motivates people to try to make the world a better place. Yeah, sure. Just on a whim, however, I decided to do something funny on Ask Reddit. I'd been getting into contactees, people who claim to be in direct contact with extraterrestrial beings. I normally consider these guys scam artists who use their imaginations to rake in money from gullible people. However, I'm willing to admit some of the narratives actually get to me, especially when they start talking about relatable themes like world peace, loving each other, and not trusting authority. I decided, well, heck, if they can talk to aliens, why can't I? I pose a question. Something along the lines of ETs of Red End. What can we do to turn this shit around? Most of the comments were about what I expected. I think the funniest comment was something like, You are shitting out the correct end. Do not turn it around. Bless you, kind comedian. Yes, most of the comments were joke comments and some Star Trek references. The thread itself was nothing special, although it did garner over 40 responses and something like 9,000 views. It didn't make it to the top of the voting charts, however, and it eventually got taken down, which is related to where the weirdness begins. You see, there were some comments that were popping up and then quickly being deleted. And I got notifications of them appearing, but they wouldn't disappear. That isn't all that unusual. Sometimes people change their minds about things. Other times, the moderators delete an especially unpopular comment. But I noticed a pattern with the comments that were disappearing. They were all serious, canny responses. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to take screenshots. More on that in a bit. But I have a pretty good memory and I was able to copy and paste a few of them too. The usernames were random numbers and letters. Here was one on the list. Your obsession with apocalypses is kind of unusual. The downfall of our species is just as likely to be painfully slow as it is to be sudden and violent. You need to work hard on improving yourself and your relationship with the planet regardless of whether or not the end comes quickly or slowly. Either way, you'll never get to experience traveling the stars. And believe me, traveling the stars is worth it. I was actually pretty flattered to get a nice response like this. I thought, hey... Someone is really getting into the alien roleplay. They even made a weird username just to throw me off, and the comment actually made me go, Hmm, you have a point there. Here's another one that I liked. Have a stronger baseline for what normal is. Peaceful, happy relationships between men, women, children, and the elderly are normal. Lands full of insects, birds, and other animals are normal. Oceans full of fish and not plastic are normal. Really try to see your current human condition as abnormal. As in, there does exist a normal, and this is not it. Good old liberal redditor. But again, this was something I agreed with. It also had a weird username with no other post attached to it. So I was thinking maybe it was the same guy or girl. At least, at first, I didn't. 
then I saw one like this. Stop asking us for help. My species is not interested in helping you. We have our own problems to deal with. There are some benevolent extraterrestrialists that are interested in helping you, but for various complicated reasons, they are not really allowed to. One bit of advice. Not all alien civilizations you encounter will be friendly. Be self-reliant or some civilizations will prey on you and take advantage of your cowardice. You do not want to be slaves to any kind of so-called saviors. That came out of left field. And it was the first one that I decided to try to screenshot and send to a friend of mine to check out. For some reason, the file wouldn't send. I tried uploading it on Imgur, and that didn't work either. I sent the actual thread to her, which, bless her heart, she thought it was funny. And while she was able to see all the regular joke comments, the serious ones didn't show up for her. She didn't say it, but I think she probably thinks I'm a little crazy now. She's probably not wrong, to be honest. There were strange usernames responding to each other, too. What was really funny was that some of them were very human-like and followed a human sense of humor. To be honest, a lot of what your species is going through is normal, in the sense that it is part of your growth phase. I think it would help to have a goal for what you want your world to be like in the future and slowly build up long-term solutions towards achieving that vision. Do you want to see all your people fed? Do you want to transition away from money-based economies? Do you want free energy for all? It's really up to you to decide what you want the world to be like. Followed by, found the communist. And then the first odd username. Living in a post-scarcity world doesn't make me a communist. And finally. No, but it does make you a hippie. Okay. I definitely thought someone was fucking with me, but again... My attempts to screenshot the conversation failed. At best, I was able to copy and paste some of them before they got deleted. In. There was one conversation which really hurt me, especially as a former gifted kid with a gaming addiction. Most of your advanced nations are vastly overstimulated. Your minds are overworked and undernourished. Take more time to relax and get away from digital screens. Read more books. Spend more time talking with family, bosses, and CEOs. Take better care of your employees. Meditate and exercise more. Eat healthier. The default emotional state should be calm and readiness, not anxiety or depression. Then, every addicted video gamer is a hero who has given up on saving the real world and would rather save a fake one. Oof. Then... Sims players and people who kill children in Skyrim using mods, because the game normally doesn't let you do that, might disagree. The one from before replied, It's also a valid response to burn a fake world because you feel helpless in the real one. And the biggest gut punch of all was, Humans are addicted to video games because they follow an ideal, educational model. They challenge you with exactly what you can handle, and do not allow you to progress until you can meet their challenge. They are fully customized and efficient. Humans spend more time perfecting colorful dopamine generators for profit than their high schools and universities. And that's pretty sad. I've scheduled an appointment with a therapist for next week. At one point, the responses were coming in so quickly I couldn't save them all. All of them were from unique usernames, which looked randomized. There was no way a single person was doing this. I started to think I was losing my mind. Some of them were kind of short. Love yourself and each other. It really shouldn't be that complicated. Religions should be based on compassion and evidence. Also, yes, there is an afterlife. Not going to tell you how that works. You have other things to worry about. LOL. And there are more elaborate conversations with stuff I hadn't even thought of or heard about. This might be asking for a lot, but try removing all the lead in your pipes. Really try removing all the plastics in your life system. Get rid of parasites like toxoplasmosis. And from now on, 
Design cities compassionately with human behavior in mind. Have realistic expectations of birth control and population growth and decline. All these things are taxing human psyches across the world, both physically and psychologically. Basically, you're all slowly becoming insane. You are poisoning your minds and it needs to stop. Their immune systems evolved to coexist with parasites. I'm not sure getting rid of toxoplasmosis is worth it. There are worse things than being slightly crazier and being nicer to cats. Oh shit, you're right. But an immune response is the brain cannot possibly be good for half the human population. I'd probably take increased sanity levels over not being able to eat strawberries. Maybe they should make gene sequencing tech more affordable so everyone can see what autoimmune responses they are susceptible to. And find slash engineer a relatively harmless parasite as a treatment for some allergies. Knowing humans, this would be how the uh, zombie apocalypse happens. Hey, at least that would solve their overpopulation problem. And like I said, some of them were surprisingly funny. Easy. Have the good half eat the evil half. Found the reptilian. Oh, go shave your pubic hairs. Go eat a live baby bird. I think this one was one of the saddest ones. My people were friends with some of the indigenous people on your North American continent. They are mostly extinct now. We're actually bitter about that. And we're not really sure we've forgiven the rest of your kind for what happened. I know it's not really your fault, but there is a karmic imbalance that is difficult for us to resolve. Honestly, if you want to improve yourselves, study your history and face the harsh realities you find with courage and understanding. Yes, I accept the downvotes. Not that there were any downvotes, because the message, like all the others, was quickly deleted. There were so many different ideas and perspectives, I was really becoming convinced they couldn't all be coming from the same person. Some of them had contradictory advice. A lot of responses were suggesting we make a beeline for FTL travel. But then there was this. What I am about to say might be downvoted by a lot of the posters here, but here it goes. You don't need to travel the stars. You don't need to be so tech-centered. You don't need so much technology. Master living in your home world. The universe will always be there waiting for you. There is no rush. If I had to pick something techy to focus on, maybe harden yourselves against natural disasters or find ways to dodge them. Once again, never got to be downvoted. I didn't sleep much that night. I posted this because I was trying to compile as many responses as possible before they got deleted. The there were expected responses like how ridiculous money and homelessness are. Yeah, sure, 90% of Redditors would agree with those. But I also got some weird ones about how we're doing childbirth wrong, how AI is a good thing, how some alien civilizations are actually very religious overpopulation is a myth, etc. Lots of answers I wouldn't have expected from the average Redditor. I think it was at this point that I started to become really nervous. Right before the thread was deleted by the moderators, I got this last one which made me feel a bit better. Advanced alien races are not perfect either. We have various problems of our own. Many of us were like you once. There are many different pieces of advice we can give, and I think most of them are valid. My personal one? Never give up. Believe in yourselves and the ability to shape the world in a positive way. That is what I offer. Words of encouragement from an outside source. You can do it. I thought, aww, that's sweet. I was even going to make a desperate attempt to contact them and thank them. Every other attempt at messaging the strange usernames was met with an error message when I was interrupted by a message in my inbox. I go to click on it, hoping to receive confirmation that this was some sort of prank. Unfortunately, that's not what I got. Instead, what I got was this. We can protect you as long as you don't let them in the front door. Don't worry. 
Your life will be back to normal in three days. If you do need to leave the house, avoid the white vans. You'll know them when you see them. Never do this again. It was about this time when the thread was taken down and when I started getting knocks on my front door. Okay, so maybe I'm a little more freaked out than I thought I was. Every once in a while, I work up the courage to check the people. They're really tall, have pale skin, and are dressed head to toe in black. Even though it's cloudy outside, they always have sunglasses. Have you ever wanted someone to die? Have you ever been so full of rage and hatred towards someone that it overrode your normal conscience and it drove you to plot a murder? I have. I'm normally a very kind person. At least I'd like to think so anyway. I've never been violent or hateful until it happened to me. Or rather, to my sister. My sister is someone who I love very deeply, just as I'm sure any of you love your sisters. She is 19, in college, very beautiful. I'm older than my sister by two years. As it turns out, we happen to go to the same college. She's a sophomore and I'm a senior about to graduate soon. She is my only sibling and I'd do anything for her. Anything. Is there anything we wouldn't do for our loved ones? But I digress. Long story short, my sister fell in love with a boy. She was going about her usual business as a college student when this guy, we will call him Mark, although that's not his real name, came into her life and swept her off her feet. It was a classic love story, as she put it. She was downright obsessed with the dude. It was annoying at first, but I grew to be very happy for her. Until I saw her have a black eye one day. She insisted it had been on accident, that she had ran into a door. I gave her the benefit of the doubt, but when she was running into the door every time I saw her for a week straight, I knew what was up. Mark was an abusive piece of shit. She defended him, of course, saying that he was getting his anger out, and that she had drove him to it. I didn't understand why she was defending him, we ended up arguing over this bitterly, and my sister refused to speak to me after I insisted she break up with Mark. I didn't hear or see my sister for nearly three weeks after that incident. I tried to go to her dorm room, text her, bother her friends, all to no avail. They had been worried about her too. She had been started living with this guy, and I had not been able to figure out where his address was. I suppose it wouldn't have mattered anyway, seeing as my sister fiercely demanded I not interfere with her love. How she had managed to go from fling to moving in with a guy in less than a month, I'll never know. She did eventually get back to me, but it was when she needed help the most. A terrible thing happened to her. Apparently one night while she was sleeping, Mark had come home from a fraternity party drunk and had forced himself on my sister against her will. The bastard ended up getting her pregnant. It was when she had gotten the positive pregnancy result that she had come crying to me to help her. Although part of me wanted to tell her, I told you so, and rebuke her for her poor choices, I stopped when I realized what pain and anguish she was in. Maybe it was her fault she had chosen to be with Mark, but it wasn't. Her fault how he treated her. She for some reason found a sort of psychological comfort in the guy despite his abuse. I still don't understand it, but I did what I could to help her. She had the pregnancy terminated. She was a crying, wailing mess after everything was over, and seeing her in so much pain made me hate Mark so much. She cried about how she'd never go back to him. I was sure the whole thing had ended, but of course, these things usually don't end so smoothly. Within two weeks, Mark had come to visit her while I was at class, slobbering and sniveling in tears. 
apologizing for what had happened to her and promising to change if only she came back to be with him. After everything she had gone through to my utter shock and horror, she went back to him. Mark even had the audacity to tell me to my face that I could do nothing about it. I punched him in the face when he said this, and he ran off screaming and swearing, telling me I'd regret it. He kept that promise. A couple of his frat buddies cornered me one night as I walked back to my apartment and beat me black and blue. When it rains, it pours. I had a broken nose and had to miss class for a few weeks to fully recover. I was never able to identify who did it, and the fraternity involved managed to shut the whole investigation down when it started. I was silenced. I sometimes would see my sister from afar on my way to class, her beautiful face married by purple bruises. I don't know why no one said or did anything about it. Eventually, she stopped going to class altogether. So as you can clearly see why, I fucking loathed Mark. It was right about the time I was nearly beaten into a coma that I decided I'd kill him. If he died, my sister would be upset for a while, but she'd be better for it. And hell, the world would be better for him being out of it. Thing is, I'm about to graduate. I have a future in front of me and I can't help my sister or have the future of my dreams from a prison cell. So I wasn't going to kill him outright. I started to look into other ways of having him done. At first, I thought I'd hire a hitman. Turns out they do exist, but they unfortunately have a paper trail unless you contact them on the deep web, and I don't even know where to begin doing that. They're also extremely expensive, a little above my finances as a college student. I certainly wasn't going to kill him myself. His fraternity buddies would probably take me out and get away with it. No, I needed a way to kill him without touching him. A way to kill him that looked like a natural death or accident. I tried conventional stuff at first. Plotted out ways to find him and poison his food. Or set something off in his house. Thing is, any of those attempts could also kill my sister. Not only that, but his address was still unknown to me. It seemed impossible, and I was truly desperate. Desperate people do crazy things. I studied Japanese as my major. I was in my Japanese literature class, and we happened to be reading a short story collection from early Japan. It was mentioned only briefly, but there was a story of a woman who set a curse on a person who was her rival. She apparently did some sort of Shinto ritual to do so, and apparently her rival had died. My interest was piqued. My Japanese isn't perfect, but I ended up doing some research online. I found a treasure trove. I found this story in Japanese and learned about a ritual that was common in Edo period. It's called Ushi no Toki Mari. In English that translates to a visit at the watching hour. Or more literally, a visit during the hour of the cow. According to Japanese legend, the hour between 2am and 3am is the right time of night when the veil between our world and the spirit world is at its thinnest and magic is easiest to perform, hauntings are more likely, and apparitions or visitations from the dead are more possible. The ritual is rather simple. First, take a metal ring about the size of your head. It can be anything really so long as it's metal and fits your head like a crown. In old Japan, people who perform this ritual typically use the metal tripods used for cooking from their fireplaces. You can probably find an old pipe or bar and bend it into a ring around your hen. That's what I did. Next, you'll need three candles of decent size. They need to be stick candles, not jar candles, and not birthday candles. They will burn out too quickly. You place them at even intervals on the metal ring, using string or rope, so that the metal ring looks like a crown. Any color will do, but red or white is recommended for the string and candles. And of course, something to light the candle with. Next, you'll need to wear all white. 
You must wear all white as according to the stories. It represents purity and protects you from the entity you will be summoning. Do not wear red. The string and candles may be red, but your clothes cannot be. Apparently it represents blood and will invite the entity to possess you. The red also represents a barrier the entity cannot cross. So if you wear red, you are declaring yourself a part of the territory. It is allowed to travel within. Do not wear red. It should be noted that white serves another purpose. In East Asia, white also represents death, and it is believed wearing the color strengthens the curse. Next, you'll need an effigy of the person you wish to curse. This isn't strictly necessary, but the sources I read say that doing so helps to focus the curse's energy. The entity summoned will focus on the effigy and not you. It can be made of anything. In old Japan, people often made them of straw and cloth. You could use a stuffed animal or doll if you really want to. What's important is that you write the name of the person you wish to curse on the effigy. You will need a comb of some sort. It can be wooden or plastic. The last thing you will need is five nails and a hammer. Unless stated otherwise, everything listed above is mandatory. Once you have all your tools, you will need to go to a sacred temple at night between the hours of 2 a.m. and 3 a.m. In Japan, this typically was a Buddhist or a Shinto temple, and a few of them were famous for being the site people would go to perform this ritual. Obviously, being in the United States and being from the Midwest, I was not going to easily find a Shinto temple nearby. Luckily, it doesn't need to be one. It simply needs to be a sacred place of worship, a place where people have a profound sense of faith and spirituality. Any church will work just fine. It did for me. What matters is that it is a sacred place. By performing this ritual on the sacred area, you are defiling it and giving the entity an offering. This church or place of worship needs to have a tree on its property not easily seen from a distance, preferably in the back or in the side of the building. Before two o'clock, you'll need to have your crown ready. Put it upon your head and have the three candles lit. Be sure you are wearing the white clothes. Take your effigy and the nails and hammer, and with the comb in your mouth, walk to the tree on the property. It is absolutely imperative that you are not seen whatsoever. Should anyone see you, at best, the curse will fail. At worst, the curse will cast upon yourself. Only light the candles and walk to the chosen tree when you are certain no one can see you or will see you. It is recommended by some sources to paint your face white and to wear red lipstick, but this isn't necessary. As you approach the tree, take out the effigy. Be certain that the effigy has a paper attached to it with the name of the person to be cursed. Find a suitable area on the tree to nail the effigy onto it. It needs to be a place where no one will easily find it. This can be very challenging, as if the effigy is discovered before the ritual is fully carried out, the curse will fail or be bounced back onto you. Choose wisely, then take your effigy and nail it to the tree aiming for the chest. Wherever you nail this to, the entity you are summoning will attack that area on the victim's body. It is recommended, therefore, to nail the chest. You need to only use one nail per night. You can use more if you want, though. You must have pure hatred in your heart when you nail it into the tree. After you're finished, you may walk away. Remove the comb from your mouth, take off your crown, and blow out the candles. You must repeat this ritual seven days in a row without being caught or the effigy being discovered in order for it to work. Apparently, on the seventh day, the entity summoned will appear. No one knows with any certainty what this entity is. It is known that it is a powerful oni, a Japanese demon. It will appear in the form of a cow or ox. The stories say that when it appears, it will bow down before you, waiting for you to get on its back. If it senses fear in you, 
it will either deem you unworthy to serve and disappear, or it will attack. You straddle its back to ride in, a symbolic gesture that demonstrates your power over it and the agreement of a contract between you and the demon. It will then disappear. Nothing more is required. It is said that within a few days of successfully completing the ritual, the demon will kill whomever you cursed. This will cause the victim to have a heart attack or die in an accident. It will appear entirely natural to finish the curse and end the ritual. After your victim has died, go back to the tree where you nailed the effigy and retrieve it and the nails. You then burn it along with everything you used in the ritual, including the clothes. After doing so, you get rid of the metal parts by throwing them away. The further from you, the better. Are you still there? Good. I promise this story is almost over. I performed this ritual exactly as listed. I finished the ritual as mentioned above, and a few days later, Mark died. I can promise you right now it works. And it works well. He died from apparent alcohol poisoning. I was overjoyed. I won't bore you with any further details. I will now get to why I even wrote this to begin with. The demon has not stopped following me. Wherever I go, whatever I do, it is there. I'm the only one who can see it. When I'm laying in bed at night, it is nearby my window. When I'm in class, it is sitting nearby. I keep reading the Japanese again and again, but it seems to not mention what to do or how to get rid of it. I really hated Mark, and I'm glad he's dead. My sister is back with me, but... I can't even be around her. The damn cow. It sounds absurd, I know, but it won't go away, no matter what I yell at it or pray. I even try to speak to it in Japanese. I've tried to ignore it, but it stresses at me with these bloody eyes. It stares right into the depths of my soul. Please help me. I need to know what to do. Is anyone here a Japanese speaker? Does anyone here specialize in Shinto witchcraft? I bargained for more than I asked for. I didn't realize what I was messing with. This demon is way more powerful than I thought it would be. I thought it would leave me alone after all of this, but it won't. I'm hoping someone out there will recognize the ritual I have listed above and save me from the terrible fate I've condemned myself to. I just wish it would go away. I'm beginning to wish I'd... Never done it. My buddies and I never graduated high school. None of us really took school as seriously as we should have. Throughout our years, we stayed in detention and the principal's office. We weren't bad kids or troublemakers or anything like that, but we often goofed around and got a kick out of being the class clowns. As a result of that, we rarely got any work done, scraping by doing just the bare minimum. By the time we made it to 10th grade, all three of us decided to drop out one by one. Now that I'm in my early 20s, not much has changed. I've been working various dead-end jobs ever since leaving high school. I worked at a local burger joint as a cashier, apart from my friends, Chris and Mike. Chris worked as a janitor at a supermarket, while Mark was an associate at a movie theater on the other side of town. Living in an area where the cost of housing was relatively high meant that we couldn't afford to pay the rent every month making just a little over minimum wage, so all three of us lived together in an apartment. Aside from our day jobs, we'd also engage in a few active miscellaneous side hustles to get some extra pocket change every now and then. Mostly Uber or DoorDash, but there was one side hustle we did occasionally, maybe twice a month. Often we'd sneak out to the cemetery and desecrate some graves, mostly mausoleums because they were quick and easy to break into. Then depending on what was inside them, We'd go pawn the items and split the cash. 
Most of the time we didn't find anything worth pawning, but every blue moon we'd come across some corpse that would be buried with a piece of gold or some other kind of valuable item. We found out that an older woman had passed away. It was actually someone we often saw around town regularly. Caitlin Sanders was her name. She died at 64 years old. It wasn't someone we personally knew or spoke to at all, but it was someone we were very familiar with. We've been seeing her around for years, yet none of us knew her name until we found out she died. While she was alive, she worked as a real estate agent, helping clients buy and sell homes on the more luxurious side of town. Her occupation gave us the impression that she was at least somewhat wealthy and would most likely be buried with something we could definitely use. Caitlin was financially well, but she didn't live in the high-class neighborhoods she often did business in. Her home wasn't located too far from us. It was about seven or eight blocks away from our apartment. According to the few sources we found on the internet, Caitlin wasn't going to have a funeral service or a cemetery burial. Her sister was going to take ownership of the property then bury Caitlin right in her own backyard. One night, all three of us went to Caitlin's house to find her grave. Her house was two stories tall, with many doors and windows. The yard was fairly large, containing lots of well-groomed shrubbery and small bushes. An iron gate, along with many trees, surrounded the yard. After climbing the gate, we searched the yard for a few minutes until we came across a small house-like structure sitting towards the backyard. I clicked on my flashlight and shined it on the building as we got close. The mini house-like structure had double doors and two Doric columns going down both sides. A short chain and lock bound the two doors together. The material on the small house looked like it was marble, as it was covered in swirly patterns. The entire thing resembled that of a classical Rome building. I shined my light towards the top. Then we saw Caitlin's full name carved across the roof. Chris pulled a pair of bolt cutters from his utility bag before breaking the lock. Then we pulled the two marble doors open as they scraped the concrete ground below. At first we stared at nothing but darkness inside. Dust floated amidst the beams of our flashlights as we shined them around. Then we saw that the walls had strange symbols carved into them. Now what the hell is all this shit? Mike said, waving his light around. Most of the symbols were unrecognizable. There were a few simple shapes of animals here and there. Birds, snakes, along with a few bull or cow-like creatures. I also saw some outlines of stylistic eyes, but the symbol that stood out the most was one of the two human arms. They were connected, forming a U-shape containing two intertwined snakes between them. The symbol was the largest, being emphasized over everything else. The eye symbols looked slightly familiar to me. I've seen it being referenced numerous times in pop culture, but at that moment I couldn't think of it. The eye of horror. Although it was at the tip of my tongue, I didn't stand a chance. Our flashlights all came together to spot a burial vault sitting in the middle of the pitch black room. The vault had a metal cage with space bars on the front, allowing us to see one side of a casket lying in there. Chris cut the bars using his bolt cutters, then pried them back with a crowbar. Afterwards, Mike and I helped Chris slide the very heavy casket out. Chris used the crowbar to pop the lids open. I squinted and mentally braced myself. Because although we've been doing this for a decent amount of time, I still wasn't quite used to personally seeing corpses just yet. We all pointed our flashlights inside the casket. Then we saw her. Hell yeah. Fucking jackpot. Mike's son. Caitlin's slightly rotting body was lying inside, her overlapped hands resting on her stomach. Her face was riddled with a few black spots here and there from the gangrene slowly eating away at her. Other than the small rotting areas on her body, she looked almost the same. She was dressed in her usual businesswoman's suit and skirt, a uniform we often saw her wearing when she was living. 
What had caused Mike's outbursts was the sight of all the jewelry Caitlin was wearing. The gold tattering her fingers and neck were nearly enough to distract us from her body. She had three gold rings on the rotting fingers of each of her hands, while her wrists held several gold bracelets. Around her neck was an oddly shaped necklace. It was just a golden wedge with a thin string attached that looped around her neck. Mike reached forward and removed one of her rings. A slight cracking sound came from Caitlin's dead and cold finger. I took about two rings off her fingers then placed them on mine, observing them up close. The frequent dents and nicks around the edges of the rings, along with the asymmetric round shapes gave me the impression that they were old. I took them off again and searched for small diamonds or gems. There weren't any. Chris stared into the casket for a minute before finally deciding to go for the bracelets around her wrists. He stopped before touching them, then turned to me. Uh, Kenny, you mind grabbing those? Chris asked. He still didn't like touching the bodies. I slid some of the bracelets off Caitlin's wrist, then handed them to Chris. He looked at them in the palm of his hands for a second before stuffing them into his bag. With most of the rings still on my fingers, I removed the peculiar necklace from around her neck and placed it in my pocket. Mike and I grabbed a few more of the rings, then I handed Chris the rest of the bracelets. After closing the casket and shoving it back into the vault, Chris drew a spare chain and replaced the one he broke on the door. We left excited, thinking that we found was just another luck haul. The next day we took the jewelry to a pawn shop that was owned by a guy we had known for many years. His name was Jerry, and we met him months after leaving school. Jerry was an older guy in his 50s and he's been running that pawn shop for about a decade. He often got decent business there too. Being struggling dropouts and all, we often went there to pawn everything we came across, trying to get a hold of every dime possible. Jerry was always willing to lend a helping hand to us. He made sure he gave us the best deals and bargains. Every now and then, just one good bargain with Jerry meant having our share of the rent paid off for the month, or getting a saving stash started. When we walked in the pawn shop, Jerry was posted behind the counter. He smirked when he saw us. What you rascals dug up now? Jerry's son. He's known about our side hustle for a while. Months after we started, we told him about it. Then, strangely enough, he shrugged it off and laughed. I don't care how the hell you bring me the money, as long as I get it. I remembered him spewing out while chuckling hysterically. All three of us approached the counter, right away pulling out our shares of the gold jewelry and sitting it on top. Jerry's eyes widened, filling with delight. God damn, where the hell did you boys find this? Jerry said, picking up one of the bracelets and observing it. Jerry grabbed his portable magnifying glass dangling from the silver pocket chain on his waist before getting an even closer look at the jewelry. Then he took the jewelry to the back to weigh the grams. Turns out Mike was right. We did hit the jackpot indeed. The jewelry was of 14 karat gold. Altogether it weighed in at 226 grams, which is 8 ounces. Jerry said that was a stash worth almost $10,000. It was the biggest piece of treasure we found yet, along with the biggest break in terms of living. After minutes of negotiation and compromise, we managed to walk out with $3,000 in total. We each got $1,000 after splitting the cash. It felt good to still have some extra money left over after paying my dues. It's been a while since I've been able to save a decent amount in my bank account without having to worry about giving it up on some kind of never-ending necessity. That might have been the biggest and only head start I was going to get for a while, so I tried to make it last. Mike has always spent the majority of his disposable income on women. That month was no different. Despite being a low-income worker with no ambition and barely a place to stay, Mike was a ladies' man by nature. He often hooked up with lots of different women and engaged in many short-term relationships. Chris bought a cheap video camera for under $100, 
as he wanted to start a YouTube channel. He had a thing for firearms and planned on creating gun review videos. He already had a small collection of pistols in his room and a few shotguns. Something that was only possible because of good old Jerry. Over time, we started to experience strange physical symptoms. I felt some pain in my chest area. Then eventually my entire body started aching. It started out small and minor during the first few days, but it got so bad I could barely get out of bed without cringing in agony. At first I thought it was just me, until Chris and Mike said they were also feeling a bit weird. Chris complained of a constant throbbing pain in his jaw, which eventually shot across his entire mandible. Mike, on the other hand, experienced some mean headaches. Those headaches turned into a severe fever, and it made Mike's face turn almost a beat run. He had to take off from work for almost two weeks because of it. The strange symptoms soon faded, but it wasn't over yet. Nightmares started to plague our sleep. The first one to get a taste of this was Chris. Mike and I were shot wide awake by screaming in the middle of the night. That was followed by Chris screaming and crying. I hopped out of bed and rushed to Chris's room. When I got there, Mike was already standing over him, shaking him hard while Chris wriggled around and wildly threw his limbs. I joined Mike in shaking Chris and trying to get him awake. Chris, I shouted. After a minute, he woke up, hyperventilating with sweat covering his face. He started gazing around the room in confusion. Chris said he dreamt of a man following him in the dark. He wasn't sure where he was, but there was nothing but darkness around him. The man looked lifeless, like a corpse. His face lacked any emotion, and his skin was so dead to the point of resembling a dark gray color. But what he noticed first was his eyes. They were as black as the darkness that surrounded them. Chris suddenly found himself sprawled across the floor while being repeatedly stomped in the face by the strange man, particularly in his jaw. This continued for a few nights. Chris would wake up from his screams and cries for help throughout the night. Then Mike and I would run into his room and shake him awake. Chris would dream about that same corpse-like man, attacking him in that same manner every time. It was only a matter of time until Mike and I got the same experience. Just like Chris, I would dream about a man chasing me every night. It was chilling to see that man in my dreams looked exactly the way Chris described him. Very dead looking with gray skin and jet black eyes. When I wasn't running from the man, my limbs were being broken by him. He was using his bare hands, just bending and popping my arms and legs in very unnatural angles as I screeched away in the darkness. While Chris was at work one day, Mike revealed that he was having dreams too. Of the same man, he told me he kept seeing a dead man visiting him. The way the man chose to torment Mike, however, was just slightly more weird than what Chris and I experienced. The man would crawl on top of Mike, pinning him down with one hand before bashing him in the face with a rock. Mike always woke up after being struck the first time. I didn't know what to think after that. Mike and I thought it was strange that we were dreaming of the same man every night. We didn't have a clue how that could even happen or why it was happening. Chris and I were in the apartment alone. Mike had run off on a date with another one of his women and planned on being gone for the rest of the night. He told us he was going to stay the night at the woman's house and should be back the next day around noon. I was on the first floor of our apartment building on the porch smoking a cigarette while scrolling away on my phone. Chris sat up in his room cleaning his guns and setting up the new camera he bought as he planned on recording his first video. While taking multiple drags of my cigarettes, I hear Chris scream, followed by a loud bang. I jumped, dropping my cigarette. Chris? I shouted. I rushed up to our apartment and swung the door wide open, starting for Chris's room, but before I stepped in, all the lights went out, leaving the entire apartment nearly pitch black. 
The only sources of light in the room were the lit numbers on the microwave and the oven in the kitchen, along with the slight amount of moonlight shining in through the windows in the dining room area. Chris, what happened? I shouted again. No answer. Chris? I said. Still, nothing. I accidentally rammed my leg against the table as I couldn't see where I was going, so I turned on the light on my phone to help me see my way around the blackness. I reached Chris's room and shined my phone's light around until I spotted him standing in front of his open closet, back facing me. His arms dangled down at his sides. He just stood there, standing stiff and not making any movements or sounds. Chris? I said. He wouldn't respond to anything I was saying, so I reached forward and gently spun him around using one hand. I screamed when I saw his face, then started backing away with my hand over my mouth. Chris's bottom jaw had been ripped away. His tongue dangled down and moved from side to side over his exposed throat. Most of his top teeth were missing, leaving nothing but destroyed gums behind. I shined the light to the floor and discovered his jaw lying in the middle of a mini blood pool. He reached out and tried to grab me, but I backed away, shocked as I shined my light on his grotesque face. Who, who did this to you? I stammered. He couldn't answer. Chris dropped to the floor. I was about to run out of the room, but I was stopped by something blocking me. My light was beaming on someone's body and it looked like they were clothed in a dark gray coverall. As I slowly moved my light up to the mystery person's chest, I saw that whoever was standing in front of me was holding one of Chris's shotguns in their hands. My jaws dropped when I shined my light in their face. It was a man, and he had gray skin, jet black eyes, and an emotionless expression. Who the fuck are you? I said. He didn't answer. He cocked the shotgun then aimed it right at my face. I tackled him to the ground and tried to take the shotgun away from him, but before he could shoot. But the man was incredibly strong. After failing to disarm him, I just got up and ran out of the apartment, leaving the man on the floor and not bothering to close the door behind me. When I got back on the first floor again, I dashed across the parking lot and approached my car. I tried to open the door, but it was locked, and I just realized I didn't have my keys with me. I gazed back and saw the man creeping towards me, shotgun still in hand. He raised the gun, then fired, missing me but shattering the window on the passenger side of my car. My alarm went off instantly, echoing out into the night. I realized I had dropped my cell phone. It was lying on the ground face down behind the man. There was no way I was getting that back without being blown away. I spun back around and just sprinted out of the parking lot as multiple gunshots went off behind me. I decided to go visit Mike and his current girlfriend a few blocks away. I had to tell Mike what happened. Plus I needed to use their phone to call the police. I searched for the address Mike had told Chris and I he'd been to earlier. Then I spotted a small house with a white car sitting in the driveway. I couldn't remember the exact number of the residence, but I did know the street, and I thought that was the house Mike was pointing to before. I really hoped that was the right one. Rushing to the door, I immediately started knocking multiple times while constantly glancing behind me. The black-eyed man followed me halfway there, and I barely lost him so I was still on the lookout. After seconds, there still wasn't anyone answering the door, so I knocked again. Mike, I said. Please, it's me, Kenny. Low sounds of someone crying is what I got instead. Then the crying grew louder. It sounded feminine, like a girl. Had to be Mike's girlfriend. Hey, anyone in there? I yelled just more crying. I stepped back and rammed into the door, busting it open. As soon as I stepped in, I heard a scream occupied by multiple wet thumping noises. 
The entire house was a bit dark, so I flipped a light switch nearby on the wall. The power was out there, too. Mike? I said. The sounds of crying led me to a bedroom with a door that was wide open. A fluorescent blue light illuminated the room. I slowly made my way in, careful not to dive into whatever may have been waiting. There was a young woman sitting in the corner of the room, balled up and hugging her knees. She was shaking uncontrollably, tears streaming down her face. The light had been coming from a small lantern sitting beside her. She let out a scream when she saw me walk in. I trotted over to her while shushing her repeatedly. Please stop, I said. Listen, I'm friends with Mike and something terrible just happened to someone else we know. Now where is Mike? She started crying again when I asked that. Then she glanced over at the bed on the other side of the room. The sheets were stained with blood and the walls had blood dripping down them. There was also a bulge between the sheets. I went over to the bed and yanked the sheets away only to find Mike's battered face staring back at me. That's only if it could be called a face anymore. All there was was a mushy mix of blood and crunched bone in place of the face that was once able to recognize. One of the eyeballs dangled down the side of the crushed skull. My eyes filled with tears. Then I threw the sheet back over him again before turning back around. He, he killed him. She cried. Who killed him? I asked, tears running down my cheeks. She hesitated before answering. It was some guy with black eyes. She said. My heart dropped to my stomach when she said this. He came out of nowhere and attacked him. She cried. Well, why didn't you call the police? I asked. The power went out, and when he first came in, I threw my cell phone at him in a panic. Then he smashed my phone. I didn't hear him leave, so I've been scared to leave the room ever since. She explained. Her last sentence made me come to a chilling realization. He was still in the house. I was about to pull her out of the corner, but before I even took one step, that's when I saw him standing in the doorway. A man. Another man. This wasn't the same guy I was currently running from, but he was similar. He also had black eyes and gray skin. This man wore glasses and he was bald. Instead of a shotgun, he was holding a sledgehammer. The young woman screamed. Then the guy came trotting towards us, hammer raised in the air. He lunged and took a swing. He missed and instead drove the hammer into the wall behind me, knocking a huge hole into it. The young woman stood up and grabbed a curtain bar nearby before repeatedly hitting the man across his body. He didn't seem to have any reaction to being hit. It didn't look like he could feel pain at all. He turned and instantly laid her out cold with a whack across the head with his hammer. She fell to the ground, blood leaking from her split hand. I ran past him and rushed out of the house. After leaving the young woman's house, I didn't know where to go. I've tried waking up to a few houses and knocking on doors. As expected, no one answered. Couldn't really blame them. I wouldn't answer the door past midnight either. I could see Caitlin's house from a distance. I didn't realize I had run that far. As I was about to make my way past the gates, I was surprised to see an older woman standing behind them. I glanced her way, then kept running. But I stopped when I saw that she was gesturing for me to come to her. A wide grin spread across her face. Who was she? Had to be Caitlin's sister. I glanced behind me only to see the sledgehammer guy creeping towards me beneath a street light. Please come. I have something important to share with you. The old woman said, unlocking the gates and opening one of the doors. Her grin grew wider when she saw the man following me. Reluctantly, I did what she asked and went in. She slammed the gate shut, then secured both doors with a latch. She led me into the house. 
The first thing I saw is a spiral staircase that leads up to the second floor. There was an office with a burning fireplace to the left of us, and the living room was on the right. Two candles flickered away in the living room. One on a coffee table in the center of the room was a tea kettle and mug with a book sitting beside it. The other candle sat on a china cabinet near one of the windows. The woman went into the living room and sat on one of the sofas next to the coffee table. I followed, sitting down across from her. She still had that smile on her face. It was starting to creep me out, and I was beginning to regret my decision to follow her there. You boys have no idea what you've gotten yourselves into, she said. I didn't know what she was speaking of, but by the sound of it already, it didn't seem good. What? I said. She giggled. The jewelry. She replied. Trust me, there's a lot more to it than what meets the eye. I swallowed hard, eyes wide while staring back at her. I, I don't know what. Come on, son. I saw you guys do it. She interrupted. There was an awkward silence. I was going to call the police when I looked out my window and saw you guys breaking into my sister's tomb. But I figured you already had something better coming your way. She continued. She leaned forward and poured herself some tea before taking a sip. But it was nice of you to clean up after yourselves. She said. I could only sit there and stare. So, why did you bring me in here exactly? I asked, fidgeting. Grave robbery, she started, ignoring my question. Although it's relatively rare today, it was a huge problem hundreds and thousands of years ago, particularly during the ancient times in Egypt. She continued. You see, my sister and I just so happened to be related to an important figure in history, that you may or may not have heard of. Are you familiar with any of the female pharaohs of ancient Egypt? I nodded my head no. I had some memories of Egyptian lectures in school, but I never paid attention long enough to absorb much information. Well, most pharaohs throughout history were men, but there were anywhere from 7 to 15 female pharaohs in Egypt. The most popular one being Hatshepsut, Cleopatra VII, and Nefertiti. It's widely believed that Sabek Neferu was the first amongst them all, but that's not true. The first woman to get any power of that kind was a long-lost descendant in our bloodline, Aziza, the woman explained. I really didn't know where she was going with this. Aziza was a very powerful pharaoh indeed. In fact, she was more powerful than Hatshepsut, who is believed to have been the most powerful Egyptian woman ruler ever. Although powerful, Ziza was a kind and merciful leader. She was well liked and respected by the people. Unlike most people throughout ancient Egyptian history, the poor under Ziza's rule were not limited to breed and bear when it came to staying fed. They got to enjoy the luxury of meat and wine, along with other foods that were typically reserved for the rich. Overall, Ziza had the poor living under much better conditions than what anyone would expect. But, despite Ziza's great treatment to the people, there were still many bad apples here and there. Like you guys. She said, pointing at me. I gave her a slight frown. I couldn't believe I was listening to this. Many become ungrateful and greedy. Then robbers started stealing jewelry and other valuable things from the resting pharaoh's tombs. After this went on for some time, Ziza became fed up with the dishonesty. So she put a spell on the items of the dead pharaohs and her own also. Oh, so voodoo then, I said sarcastically. No. Not voodoo. In Egypt, they practiced something called hika. She explained, opening the book on the table and revealing a familiar-looking symbol on one of the pages. 
Two connected human arms that formed a U with intertwined snakes in the middle. It was the large symbol we saw in Caitlin's tomb. Hiko was used for things like healing, getting rid of harmful poisons, and stripping people of harmful spirits, she replied. But it could also be used for more darker intentions, such as punishment. Those who stole anything else from the tombs after the spell would face greater than dire consequences. The punishment for busted tomb robbers was death, but those who weren't caught would be in just as much trouble. Worse, actually. And exactly how? I asked. We heard a loud bang beside us, then turned to see the sledgehammer guy banging on the window outside with his fist. Staring in at us through the glass, the woman grinned once again then continued talking. Raiders who thought they'd escape fate would be hunted down by forces, then killed severely, she said. This also goes for anyone else outside the Pharaoh bloodline who unethically takes ownership of any of the cursed items. What forces? I asked. They come in many forms, she replied. They show up as people, animals, and many more. But before they come after the person, or the thief, the victim may start out with feeling minor physical ailments that would turn into horrific dreams at night. Then finally, she pointed to the sledgehammer guy still grinning. It took a moment to realize what she was trying to tell me. My eyes widened when I got the message. Are you saying we have this curse? I said. She nodded. You've been marked. What? I said, puzzled. I stood up and began pacing the floor in a panic. Then I took a quick glance at the guy standing outside. His face followed me as I moved back and forth. Well, I'm sure there's some way I can get rid of this, right? I said, I'm afraid not. The curse is permanent. The forces will pursue you for the rest of your life. Or until it kills you, she explained. Are you fucking kidding me? I shouted. There has to be some way I can get this off. There has to be. There isn't. However, if you still have the jewelry or know where it is, I suggest you get at least a piece of it back. It's going to be the key to keeping your life. She's son. I turned and looked at her. How? How the hell is that going to help me now? I yelled. The jewelry is a suppressant to the forces. They'll follow you around, but they won't be able to harm you as long as you wear at least a piece of the jewelry. She explained. At that moment, I thought of someone else. Jerry. I wondered if he still had the jewelry in his pawn shop. The old woman chuckled. Then she started laughing maniacally. You're fucking crazy, lady. I shouted. Good luck. She said before continuing laughing. When she said that, the man outside shattered the window with his sledgehammer before climbing in and walking towards me. I turned to run away but tripped over the sofa. I got up quickly but not quick enough. The man was already on my tail and had struck me in the leg with the hammer. The old woman snickered upon hearing a slight pop in my leg. The sharp pain didn't stop me from dashing my way around the man. Before jumping the window, he just shattered, limping my way across the yard. Jerry's shop was closed, of course, but I planned on breaking in to get what I needed. There was no time to wait until the shop opened the next day. I was hoping Jerry hadn't sold all the jewelry yet. I went to the side of the building and busted out one of the windows with a brick I found lying nearby before climbing in. I made my way through the dim shop and peered inside of the showcases to see if I could spot some of the jewelry lying inside. There was no sign of any of it. Afterwards, I went to the back room. As soon as I stepped in, an alarm went off through the entire shop. Must have tripped a sensor somewhere. I forgot all about Jerry's security system. 
At that moment, I had even less time to find what I needed. I rambled through several drawers and small compartments, then found a small pile of gold necklaces and bracelets, but none of them was what I was looking for. I even checked Jerry's office. After all that searching, I still came up with nothing. When I stepped out of Jerry's office, I saw the man standing in the doorway. That was strange because I didn't hear anyone come in. But it was too late to hide, and the back room was pretty small and narrow. There was no way I was going to get around him that time. I turned and took off, busting through the emergency exit behind me. Then I turned and slammed the door in the man's face. He started banging on the door and did that for minutes. I was surprised these guys couldn't open a simple door but had the instinct to use weapons such as guns. But before taking off, I noticed something lying on top of one of the dumpsters. To me it looked like a pair of legs. I walked to the back of the dumpster and saw just that. A pair of human legs wearing worn out blue jeans and black boots. But the person's torso along with the rest of their body, was missing. Entrails spilled out from the top. My eyes grew watery when I noticed the wallet chain hanging out of one of the pockets. After seconds of staring at the legs in sheer shock, they toppled over and fell to the ground, some of the bloody intestines splattering across the pavement. I twitched in fear and stepped back. I saw something fall out of one of the pants pockets and hit the ground. A small piece of gold jewelry. After moving in closer, I discovered a ring. That's when I hear the sound of the door being forced open. The man turned and spotted me right away. That's when I picked up the ring and placed it on my finger. He came and stood right next to me, standing only inches away. I expected him to strike me with the hammer at any second, but he didn't. He just stared looking into my soul with those charcoal eyes. At that moment, I saw what the jewelry was really capable of. I saw a wisp of flashing light hit the wall behind the man. I spun around to see two police cruisers coming down the road leading to the pawn shop. I ran to the front of the store and stood in the parking lot with my hands in the air waiting for them to turn in. As soon as the officers stepped out of their cars, they drew their pistols and yelled at me to get down on the ground. I complied while desperately trying to tell them that it wasn't what it looked like. They wouldn't listen, so I had no choice but to let them handcuff and throw me into the back of one of the cruisers. One of the officers drove me away from the scene. As we pulled off, I could see the man on the side of the building, watching me ride further away from a distance. Now fast forward over 10 years later. I'm in my early 30s and I got my GED along with a bachelor's degree in cybersecurity. I'm now a security analyst at a consulting firm with a very stable source of income. Life has actually been fairly decent for me thus far, although my chances of a better life came close to being ruined earlier on. After the police had taken me into custody, they kept me there all night after interrogating the hell out of me. They knew I broke into the shop. Several of our neighbors at our apartment complex called the police after they heard the gunshot in our apartment. They visited our apartment and found Chris's body. Then the next day, they discovered Mike and his girlfriend. My fingerprints were found all over the woman's house and the pawn shop where they found half of Jerry's body. To this day, they still haven't found his torso. The amount of murder accusations that came after was endless. They were determined to get a confession out of me. I tried telling them that there was someone after me, but I didn't say a word about the curse and the black-eyed men. Fortunately, they were unable to press in many charges due to an insufficient amount of evidence. There were fingerprints, but nothing really pointing to murder. The only thing I was charged with was breaking and entering. The case of my dead friends and Mike's girlfriend has been cold ever since, and they've been on the hunt for a murderer that technically doesn't exist. As for the curse, well, Caitlin's sister was right. 
I still remain marked to this day. The black-eyed men still follow me everywhere I go. I'll see slight glimpses of them throughout every day, only to turn and find nothing there. My co-workers think I'm insane when I get jumpy and paranoid at the office. I've discovered that I'm the only one who can see the black-eyed men. At night, things get real. I mean, really real. Nightmares aren't a big thing anymore, though they still occur frequently. But the black-eyed men sure do make up for the torment that the nightmares have lacked. I have to keep my doors shut at night because if I don't shut my door, the men will enter my room and stare at me. They'll stand outside of my bedroom door and bang on it continuously. I'll occasionally end up pulling an all-nighter not only because of the constant noise, but the amount of terror that will build up inside of me while it's happening. Sometimes I swear I'm just one heartbeat away from my chest exploding. To make matters worse, they've started mimicking voices of people I once knew. Mostly Chris and Mike. On the other side of the door trying desperately to convince me to remove my ring. Come on, Ken. Just take off the ring and I promise life will get much better for you. One of the men said in Chris's voice. When I ignore them, they get agitated and belligerent. For fuck's sake, Kenny. I heard Mike's voice. Stop being a hard ass and just take that piece of shit off your hand. Speaking of Chris and Mike, something rang a bell in my mind a few years back. Chris had constant pain in his jaw for days, before having dreams of the black-eyed men stomping him in the face. In the jaw. Then finally one of the black-eyed men blew his jaw off in real life. Then Mike, on the other hand, had headaches so bad that he had to take off from work. Then he dreamt of being bashed in the head with a rock. The sledgehammer guy gave him a similar fate in reality. Now this has me wondering, is it really possible to keep running away from the curse forever? With some jewelry? Does the curse have someone's fate sealed the moment they take ownership of it? The ring that seems to be saving my ass right now. Is it all just temporary after all? Is there something Caitlin's sister left out and didn't tell me? The fact that I felt pain all over my body. My nightmare was having every limb and possibly every other bone in my body being broken to the extreme. What's that supposed to mean? I met Cyrus about a month back. Track season was just starting and when we practiced, he would sit in the stands and watch. Sometimes I saw him reading but he always had his headphones in. It wasn't uncommon for kids to sit and watch practice. Most of them were paying more attention to each other than to us. I only noticed Cyrus more than the others because I never saw him in class. He was clearly our age and it was a big school so I wasn't suspicious. It was just curious to me. One day when practice was over, I happened to be walking the same direction he was on my way home. We caught each other's glance and started a conversation. Or I did, rather. Hey man, I'm John. I see you at the track all the time, but I guess we've never had class together. Oh, I don't go here. I'm Cyrus. I'm homeschooled, but I get bored so my parents let me hang out at the track after school. So far, nobody has said anything, so I didn't think it was a problem. I don't think it's a problem. Just wanted to say what's up. See if maybe you wanted to join the team. I uh, thanks. I just like hanging out. Really. All good. You walk down Kirkland to get to home? Because then we can walk together for a while. Sure. Our first conversation mostly continued like that. I was talking and he was responding with as little effort as possible. The next day, however, he was waiting for me so we could talk. That continued for as long as track season continued. We talked about all sorts of stuff. We told each other about our families. We talked about hockey and soccer. I told him about this girl I had a crush on and he told me about his girlfriend he met at church. 
Every day we walked and talked until we got to Prospect Park, and then we'd go on our separate ways. He never wanted to come to my house to hang out after. He never invited me anywhere else. He didn't play video games or go to the movies. I figured maybe his family was on hard times. Maybe he was embarrassed about his house and he didn't have the money to do stuff I usually take for granted. As I thought about it, I realized he wore the same clothes all the time. A black hoodie, black jeans, and some torn up Converse. For our school, that was common because we wore uniforms, but there isn't a reason for a homeschool kid to do that. I started to feel bad for him. After track season was over, he'd still wait for me after school and we'd walk and talk. My friends asked about him, but he never hung out if I invited him to join the whole group. It was fine with me, I guess. My friends are kind of immature and shallow. Cypher was hyper-intelligent and seemed wise for our age. One day I was talking to him about my crush for the third day in a row when the conversation took an interesting turn. I was like pretty sure Liz wanted to go with me to prom, but then today Suzanne told me that Liz was going to say yes to Zach Klein. Then Suzanne told me Liz really liked Zach and she wouldn't want to go with anybody else. I can't stop thinking about it, man. I didn't even know if they knew each other. I probably won't go now. Aren't some of your friends going without dates in a big group? You should go with them. It isn't about having people to go with. It's about not going with Liz. More than that, having to see her with that fucking show, Zach Klein. I can't believe this shit. Cyrus stayed quiet for a while and then he stopped walking. I might be able to help you out. Don't say you're going to give me a makeover. Do you trust me? Uh, sure. We're pretty good friends now. So even if I told you something crazy, like you're going to laugh at first crazy, you'd at least consider it to help your problem? Whoa, boy. I'll consider anything almost at this point. Are we going to freak your Friday this bad boy? You're a looker for sure, but I'm not sure you're so much better looking than me that she'd immediately say yes. Kind of presumptuous on your part. Cyrus got frustrated. Forget it, man. Let's keep walking. Sorry, I'll stop. Tell me what you were going to say. I have a powder. Dude, I'm not slipping anything into anybody's drink. That's fucked up. Oh, God damn it! It's a powder you take. You just need a picture of Liz. You take the drug before Ben. You stare at her picture until you fall asleep. Then you'll have a dream about her. An amazing dream where she's in love with you and happy. Then when you wake up, it will all come true. Come on. I thought you actually had a plan. I'm serious. 100% serious. I could see in his eyes that he was serious about something, but people can be serious about making you look like an idiot. Dude, that's absolutely fucking nuts. You're gonna give some sleeping pill and then laugh at me tomorrow after school when I show up and Liz is still in love with super chode Zach Klein. Look, it's your loss. My dad, he's into some really out there shit. I know what it sounds like, but I've seen it work. Something about manifesting deep desires from your soul into the physical world. You wonder why I never invite you over? It's because every time my dad talks to my friends, they never come back. But I know he isn't just a bullshitter or a crazy person. The things he makes, they work. He would have to trust me. Jesus. Okay, um, I'll mix your magical mystery powder into my water, but if something happens to me, I'm going to haunt your ass from the beyond. I can assure you that will not be a problem. I'm going to go home and get it from my dad and I'll meet you right back here. I can just... No, just wait here, okay? My dad will be mad if he knows I gave it to a kid. Young love is a powerful thing, I guess. I'd done pop before with my friends and liked it, but this felt like really taking things to the next level. With that in mind, it also sounds way too ridiculous to be true, so I didn't really see the harm. Cyrus was my friend. 
Even if this was an elaborate prank, we'd still get some laughs out of it later. I waited at the park for about half an hour, and then he came back. He repeated the instructions and told me to talk to Liz tomorrow and see he wasn't lying. I smiled the whole time I took the bag. It looked like Nesquik, so I figured that's what it was. I walked home and went about my usual business until bedtime. I mixed up the powder into some water, pulled up a picture of me and Liz from her birthday dinner last month, and got to drinking. I did not drink Nesquik. The powder tasted like what I imagined the earth tastes like. There was some dirt in there for sure, but I tasted and smelled other stuff too. I would have stopped drinking, but I was already halfway through. Might as well just dive in there. When I was finished, I laughed. Cyrus, that old so-and-so, had just gotten me to drink a handful of some kind of soil by using my teenage desire against me. It was pretty funny. Tell it wasn't. It only took about a minute for the room to start to spin. I had no choice but to lay down. I dropped the cup onto the floor and just managed to grab the picture of Liz and I and look at it before I passed out. Then the dream started. Wonderful, vivid dreams. Liz and I kissing under waterfalls and sleeping under the stars. Dreams of admiring her banter at work parties and meeting my parents. Cuddled up together in front of a fire. It felt like I lived a lifetime with her. I was overwhelmed with bliss. I didn't want to wake up. I didn't want to leave her, but I did. My alarm went off to get up and ready for school, and I had tears in my eyes. I got ready as fast as humanly possible and practically ran to school. I sat by my locker. Liz's locker was in the same hall, and I waited with gargantuan anticipation. When she turned the corner, I nearly fainted. She walked right up to me and put her bag on the ground. We needed to talk. She said leaning closer. I, I don't know what I was thinking. I can't believe that I said I'd go with Zach to prom even after Suzanne told me you were going to ask me. God damn it, Suzanne. No, it's okay. I, it's not okay. I don't know what I would have done if you went with someone else and I had to see you there. I would have been stuck with that show while I could have been with you the whole time. John, I know you love me. I've known for a while and I love you too. Of course I do. I just never realized how much. Do you want to go to prom with me? Holy fuck, Cyrus did it. He gave me the greatest gift a friend could give and I had laughed at him when he told me. Liz just said she loved me. She asked me to go to prom. She called Zach Klein a chode, which he was, but still, it was nice to hear. The rest of the day was a blur. Every second we weren't in class, Liz and I were together. We held hands. We made help behind the fine arts building. We ate lunch without our friends. She was filling up all of my senses, but I couldn't wait to see Cyrus. I owed all of this to him. After Liz's parents had picked her up from school, I ran to the track to meet with him, but he wasn't there. I waited for about 30 minutes before I decided I needed to go home. I ran home. I blasted songs about brown-eyed girls and life, long love. I fell asleep after being on the phone with Liz for hours. I woke up in the morning fully clothed. I didn't remember falling asleep, but I also didn't remember putting on these particular clothes. I didn't usually wear black, but especially not all black. And I didn't even own a pair of Converse, but there were some on my feet. My room was different. None of my stuff was on the walls. It looked like a spare bedroom. I couldn't find my phone. I couldn't find my wallet or my keys. I started to get scared. I ran downstairs to ask my mom what happened, but she wasn't there. I searched frantically, but nobody was home. And when I started to notice some stuff, all of the pictures of me were gone. From the wall, from the fridge, 
from the mantle over the fireplace. I started looking closer and then I saw it. I wasn't in any of my family photos either. Just my parents and my two siblings. There they were on the trip we took to Puerto Penasco. There they were at the Grand Canyon and at my grandparents' house in Santa Fe. But I wasn't in any of the pictures where I should have been. And in my place was Cyrus. My heart was leaping from my chest. My stomach was in a knot. Sinking down inside of my body. Full bodied, swelling fear raced to every inch of my being and swept my senses. I threw up. I fainted. I woke up and panicked all over again. Then I started to run. I had to get to the park. I had to get to Cyrus. When I got to the park, Cyrus was there. This is the first time I had seen him outside of that hoodie. He was in a Iron Maiden t-shirt and blue jeans. He was wearing a pair of Vans and a backwards black snapback. He didn't look at me. What the fuck is going on, dude? I'm freaking out. My room is gone. I'm not in any pictures. I can't find my phone. You gotta help me. I'm going to try to help you, but you have to listen to me. Let's go, dude. I'm freaking out. First, I want to say that I'm really fucking sorry. Don't be. Just help me get my shit. You need to listen. You aren't listening. The best possible thing for you to do right now is accept that your old life is gone. It doesn't belong to you anymore. My legs felt like they were going to give out from under me. What are you? Listen. His voice was loud. It almost didn't sound human. I was once just like you. I loved someone who never loved me back. I was desperate and sad. Felt like my life wouldn't continue without her. Then one day after school, I met a kid named Rory. I was gasping for air. I tried to pull out of the hoodie, but it was stuck on my body somehow. I was pacing back and forth, trying not to vomit again. We became close friends, and after a couple of months, he offered me a solution to my problem. It sounded ridiculous, but I was desperate, and so I went along with what he asked. The next day was the best of my life. Don't fucking do this, Cyrus. I swear to fucking God, I'll kill you right where you stand. You won't. You can't. That's part of the rules I'm about to lay out for you. You can never have your old life back. Never. But you can have someone else's life. All you have to do is get them to drink the powder in your pocket. Fuck. Fuck you. You piece of shit. I trusted you. You can't force them to do it. And you can't threaten them into doing it. They have to do it by their own will. I lunged at him, but I went through him like I was made of vapor. You have to go to another time. Only then will you manifest again physically. Nobody can hear or see you here. If you ever come back, you'll disappear again. Why? Why did you do this to me? Why not somebody else? We're friends. We are friends. Which is why you trusted me. You'll have to befriend someone too. You'll have to feed off of their loneliness and desperation. You'll have to earn someone's trust and betray them like I've done. Until then, this is who, or what, you are. Those are your clothes. You don't have a home, nor are you allowed to have one. If you try to have one, you'll disappear. If it makes it any better, John, I'm so fucking sorry. I just couldn't be alone anymore. Good luck, and I'll never forget you, friend. Cyrus walked away while I was screaming. That was about an hour ago. Since then, I've started walking. I don't know where or why, but nobody on the street sees me or talks to me. I wanted to go see Liz, but I can't bear the thought of being erased from her mind. Hopefully, I'll find my way back to some kind of life. Wish me luck.
my grandfather always struck me as a peculiar man. I did love him, don't get me wrong, but it always seemed as if there was a side of him that I never got to see. He was always more firm and stuck in his ways. He would babysit me when my parents were out on date night, as well as the odd weekend I'd spent at his house. Instead of watching a movie together or going to get ice cream, we would prefer to tell stories. Not the known childhood stories such as Hansel and Gretel or Little Red Riding Hood. No, his stories were true. Although a lot of them seem far-fetched. And I never really believed them until I had an experience of my own. You see, my grandfather was a World War II veteran. And he was very opinionated on warfare in general. As well as the US military. He would tell me stories of monsters prowling the battlefield at night. The screams of those left for dead in no man's land. As they were left for dead. As a child, those stories would scare me. But I never really believed them to be true. Although my grandfather showed no signs of dementia. And never really did up until the day he died. I suppose I just didn't want to believe his stories. He told me of the Watchers, glowing eyes that would stare at them from afar during the night, creatures which only manifested where great amounts of bloodshed occurred. There would be two men posted each night to stare back. What would happen if there wasn't? We never knew, but one night, while my grandfather was on watch, he noticed the eyes suddenly disappear, and within minutes the screams from the German trenches filled the air. And then, eerie silence. The next day, the German troops had simply vanished. Their supplies and munitions remaining, as well as the odd patch of blood. But every single German soldier, gone. I guess that night, the two posted watchmen didn't keep their eyes trained on the watchers. And whatever grim fate they had suffered, well, that's best left unknown. Though my grandfather told me many grim and terrifying stories from his time in war, the story that always stuck with me began on our home soil right here in the USA. My grandfather was 14 when the war had started. He told me about seeing the news, the papers detailing what was happening overseas. He wondered why the United States hadn't gotten involved yet. He was fed all that wartime propaganda. He read that the Nazis were evil folk with distasteful ideas. And he hated them. And as any young American teen at that time, he itched to join the war. His grandiose ambitions giving him an ego. He would often boast about how many Nazis he was going to kill in front of his older brother. My grandfather would say that he's embarrassed. That he was a naive child who was fed all sorts of lies just as everybody else was. And he lapped them up. Once the U.S. had joined the war, my grandfather was eager to sign up. But being too young, he wasn't allowed to. However, his brother was 19, and so he went to war, writing letters to my grandfather detailing his experiences, speaking about missing home. After a few months, the letters had stopped. My grandfather, believing his brother to be dead, burned with hot rage towards the Germans and Japanese, wanting nothing more than to join his older brother and share the glory. A couple of his classmates had already signed up, lying about their age, and he planned on doing the same. That was until his brother came home. He had been shot in the leg while attempting to escape the massacre of his entire squad at the hand of the Nazis, and left to die in a ditch. He had only survived by using his belt as a tourniquet. He had been found half-dead by his comrades the next day, his leg having to be amputated to save his life. He was sent back home and straight away, he was noticeably different, as if he had left more than his leg behind in the war. His brother would scream and cry at night, and during the day he would just sit there on the couch, barely even looking in anybody's direction. Well, they had all been close before his brother had went off to fight, regularly playing together and talking nonsense. He couldn't even get a sentence out of his brother. The same rage he had upon believing his brother to be dead, now burned brighter than ever. He hated those who had broken his brother, feeling as though he was required to avenge them. 
He discussed signing up with his brother. Upon mentioning this, his brother simply stared at him with fear and anger. Are you fucking stupid? Do you not see what happened to me over there? It's fucking hell. There's nothing but death and misery. Don't sign up. Please don't fucking sign up. He said. My grandfather was quite taken aback. He had thought his brother would be proud of him. The courage leaving him just as quickly as it had developed. His brother persisted until he caved and promised not to sign up. Although he still hated the enemy, the fact had taken his brother from him. One night he woke up to a loud bang. Startling him, he left his room with his baseball bat in hand, wandering down the corridor and entering his brother's room. He saw a monster crawling across the floor, missing a leg and half of its face. Upon seeing this, he jumped back and screamed, his parents spreading out of their bedroom and to his side. His mother screamed when she saw him. My grandfather's brother had attempted to end his life with a shotgun. Only he hadn't completed the job, blowing half of his face off in his attempt. His brother bled out soon after that, and the coming days were filled with pain, confusion, and anger, burning hotter than ever. Being 17 now, my grandfather decided he would sign up and avenge his brother. Heading down to the recruitment office after leaving a note to his parents, he felt a hint of guilt, breaking that last promise he had made his brother. His brother, who never really came back from those war-torn fields in Europe, who had seen and experienced more than he could handle. Arriving in Europe soon after, he felt nothing. Upon seeing the wounded, the conditions they would be living in, he felt as if he was a dead man already. He'd go on to see the Watchers, his brothers in arms dying all around him. He said it could very well have been him. He finally understood what his brother had tried to warn him about, and he wished he had heeded those words. But the one experience that stuck out in all of this, the one thing that assisted my grandfather changing his mindset, is when he encountered a German soldier mid-battle, a boy around the same age as him. Fear in his eyes, dropping his weapon and raising his hands. My grandfather had shot him anyway. It was about revenge and glory, but the boy's face plagued his sleep. Every time he closed his eyes, he would see those tears in his eyes, the trembling of his hands as he raised them above his head, and then him dying on the floor. It could have been him. And the same situation had likely happened with many young men on both sides before. The Germans weren't this evil presence. They weren't monsters. They were men and boys who believed they were protecting their homeland just as they were. My grandfather came back from the war, but he always says that a part of him never did. A part of his heart and soul died screaming on the ground with that boy he had killed. The moral of this story isn't about the beasts that prowled those fields death at night, and it doesn't include any heroic actions. It's not some fantasy. It's real. These things happened. Boys died crying out for their mothers as they bled to death. Men kissed pictures of their loved ones for the last time. Men on both sides believing they were doing what was right. The men who had sent them to their terrible fate sitting at home comfortably sipping brandy while they crawled in the dirt and blood amongst the corpses of their own friends, their brothers. And what's worse is it didn't end with World War II. Men are still sent to their deaths, sent to crawl in filth, laying down their lives for rich men who wouldn't do the same for them, being fed lies like this is for the greater good or you are serving your country. Vietnam is a prime example. A war fought over rice invading a foreign land they had no business in, sending them to their deaths only to ultimately lose the war, killing children and women. And when those men came home, did they receive a hero's welcome? Did the wounded receive help for the trauma they had suffered? No. Why do you think so many of them are on the streets? Why do you think there are so many videos online of people talking Vietnam vets down from offing themselves? 
They were tossed aside, not as men who had bravely served their country, but as men who had failed. Failed to push capitalistic ideals onto a country that didn't want them. Failed to make the rich richer. After many years, my grandfather had realized this. Even though he had fought for his country, he was no longer under any guise that it was noble or courageous. He had told me to never sign up, never join the military and fight. Not unless our homes were under direct threat. Because what you believe you will be fighting for isn't the truth. My grandfather, a wise and pained man, a man I looked up to and enjoyed spending time with, died a few years after this. I wish I had listened to his words. I wish I had believed his stories, but I went to fight in the Afghanistan war, and I saw those eyes. Those same eyes my grandfather had described in his tales, and in that moment I knew. Everything he had told me was the absolute truth. I wish it had ended when I was shot and sent back home, but I left a piece of me behind. And something else followed me to claim what was left. I don't sleep at night anymore. Instead, keeping my eyes trained on the window, staring back at the creature lurking just outside. But even when met with such an evil, the evil of man far outweighs it. The men who send us to die in foreign lands for their own gain. Those are the true monsters. If you are a veteran and are having thoughts of suicide or other mental distress, please call the national hotline at 800-273-8255. Then press 1. A certified counselor will be available to speak with you. The letter came for me in the middle of the night. The thunk of the letterbox opening interrupted my insomniac pacing, echoing ominously through the empty hallways. I crept towards the door, knife in hand raised towards an unexpected intruder. The porch, however, was as empty as it always has been. All that remained of any foreign presence was a singular sheet of parchment lying face down on my carpet. The color of pale bone. I didn't even realize what it was until I picked it up, feeling the words etched into its surface drive the air from my lungs like a vicious punch to the gun. Dear Amir, you have been invited to find your soulmate. That's all it said. Ten simple words, yet each of them hammered an iron stake deep into the recesses of my heart. The letter slipped through the edges of my shaking fingers, gliding through the air back to its original position on the doormat. Its glossy edge shimmered in an otherworldly hue under the dim porch lamp, its hollow purple lettering staring back through me. Why had I received this? My mind raced with a thousand thoughts, none of them making the slightest sense. For the words on the letter were not foreign to me. I had heard about them, as all of us had. Even if I had never cast my eyes upon their physical form, engraved onto that fateful parchment, they were always spoken about in celebratory tones. Their arrival excitedly whispered over coffee by their giddy recipients, for it promised an end to their fruitless searches for happiness. It was the one thing that provided absolute certainty in this world, that required nothing more than a drop of blood to guarantee eternal martial bliss. The problem was, I was already married. You don't have to open it, you know. Nothing's forcing you to do it. My gaze was fixed on the floor. My mind lesions away. The words washed over me, barely registering in my mind. Genuinely, Amir, just think about the entire thing rationally for a moment. Leonard placed a hand on the small of my back, letting its gentle pressure ease me upwards. Obviously, most people rip open the letter as soon as it comes. Who wouldn't want to be with the one you're destined to love for eternity? All without the myriad pitfalls of pain and false hope that usually plague the journey there. It's the opium craved by those who are alone in this world. But you are not alone. And you don't need this letter to know the name of your soulmate because you are already with her. 
There's nothing stopping you from simply letting the letter expire. I can't. It came for a reason. The words were stuck to the roof of my mouth. It always does. It means that the universe has something important to tell you. That the one for you is still out there. Everyone knows that. No one knows anything. That's all just speculation and hearsay. We don't even know who sends these letters. For all we know, it's a purely random process that you are ascribing meaning to. Those who are single rip it up immediately, but those who are married simply throw it away. That's not true. Look at Bennett, Chantel, Cynthia. They were all engaged, married even, yet they still received the letter, and their relationships promptly crumbled within the day. Yeah, but all three of them were absolutely miserable, remember? Don't you recall those tense dinners with Bennett's fiance? Or how Cynthia's husband used to call her every 10 minutes when she was out with us? Their relationships were toxic sinkholes that they should have escaped a long time ago. All the letters did was give them the impetus to finally stand up for themselves for once in their lives. That could be me too. I mumbled. Oh, come on, Amir. Stop moping around. You and Rui are like salt and pepper. Have you seen your face when she enters the room? It lights up like the rising sun, and when you're around, she gets so giddy she can barely speak. You found what people spend their whole lives searching for, and you don't need some magical blood contract to tell you that. My head bobbed up and down like a fish hook. Rui's face, frightfully attractive, floated into my mind. Her eyes, so genuine and full of warmth, gazed into the depths of my soul. Her lips, the color of pink bubblegum, whispered the ten words we held locked in our hearts. I am yours, and you are mine, now and forever. Yet instead of echoing them proudly, I found the words drying up in my throat. Cowering in shame at my duplicity and her deep brown eyes fractured into deep disappointment. Leonard was right. I knew that. I couldn't betray the woman I love like this. My mind knew that. Yet why were my hands still reaching back into my pocket, unfolding the crumpled parchment back between my fingers? I clenched my fists, hating myself, but my irises continued boring a hole through the letter. Leonard watched me with a sigh. Fine, tell you what. Maybe we're looking at this the wrong way. Maybe you should just open it. He shrugged his shoulders. After all, what's the worst that could happen? If it turns out to be Rui, well then that's perfect. You know for certain that she's the one for you, forever and always. If it's somehow someone else, then your marriage was destined to fade away. All you would be doing is accelerating the inevitable process of its slow disintegration. Save both of you the long, drawn-out pain of trying to rescue the Titanic with a bucket. I remained silent for a long while. Finally, I spoke. I can't. You can't what? I can't lose her. Not again. Again? When have you broken up with her? I looked at him and he knew. Aw, oh, shit. Yeah. I nodded somberly, biting my lip. A river of pain was coming. I could feel it. I'm sorry. I shouldn't have brought it up. My forehead tightened as my heart squeezed inside my chest. Images lashed into my mind unbidden even as I tried to look away. Hollow blue marble stared back at me through lifeless sockets. A quivering knife buried itself far deep in blood-soaked flesh. An old familiar stench filled my nose. Those horrible fumes from the parts of a person's body that were never meant to be exposed to the world. The memories were drowning me. Too hard, too fast. What if I lose Rui as well? I struggled to keep control of my breath. How do I know that the universe hasn't destined her to be just another passing blip in my life? just as Aubrey was. Amir, I'm really sorry, but that was a freak tragedy. A once-in-a-lifetime incident of extraordinarily bad luck. Aubrey just happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. It's not going to happen again. 
his sentences tumbled out erratically, grasping for the right words to paper over the cracks of my heart. Don't let that taint your marriage. Before this ridiculous paper came, had the thought of losing Rui ever crossed your mind? No, I suppose not. But aren't we always blinded by love? Too absorbed in the shallow beauty right before us to recognize the alarms blaring inches away? I love Rui to the depths of my soul. I love her so much that my heart aches. But I felt this way about Aubrey too. Once upon a time. The air hung heavy between us. The pauses in our senses suffocating us in their weighty embrace. I can see now that she wasn't the one for me. That I had been overlooking signs that should have been obvious. But in the moment, when she was still breathing and warm in my arms, I could see nothing else. She was my world. My anchor. And only having her wrenched away from me showed me otherwise. Even now, her whispers haunt my nightmares. I can't let the same thing happen again. It would break me. Leonard's lips parted, attempting to form the sounds of a reply, but all they found was thin air and empty platitudes, and his lips sealed shut, joining my gaze riveted in the asphalt, letting the day pass us by. I stared numbly at the pale parchment, feeling its edges shift under my touch like sand blowing through the wind. The words were already growing faint, their dark pigments evaporating into the atmosphere. 24 hours. That was all I had to make a decision. Let that window lapse and I would never know what was written within. The wallpaper of my bedroom seemed to flicker under the dim light of the setting sun, my addled mind swirling its pattern into Rui's smile, the same one that had settled onto her face under the waterfall in Tuscany. Her features melted against the stream of water cascading down, her golden laughter sparkling against the gurgling flow. I took a deep breath and reached for the match by my side, feeling its flames lap against my thumb as I struck it. My arm forced itself towards the letter, but my hand refused to obey, letting the fire flicker uselessly centimeters away from the parchment. Finally, it died, snuffed out by a passing gust, and I threw the match on the floor in disgust reuniting it with an army of its cousins, strewn in an untidy mound by my shoe. I couldn't do it. Why couldn't I fucking do it? My entire arm shook uncontrollably, clenching and unclenching my fist as I rocked back and forth. The slamming of a distant door frame snapped me out of my reverie. Really, she was home. A smile hovered on the edges of my lips, but the drought of happiness I expected to come was swiftly extinguished by a cold shock of dread, its taste bitter on my tongue. Was this how I would feel for the rest of my life? Forever holding myself back, plagued by the thought that she might not be the one, could I ever lose myself in her arms again, my mind free from the lingering doubt of that blank? How was I supposed to live like this? No, I had to know. My hands snapped into action, suddenly given clearance to do what they had been aching to for so long. An old safety pin uncovered itself from beneath a pile of sewing equipment, finding itself between my fingers. Its pointed edge found resistance against the tip of my index finger digging in tediously until it finally broke through, releasing a lone droplet of crimson onto the middle of the parchment. It remained coagulated momentarily before bursting out into the surrounding space. Dendritic tendrils rapidly fanning out through the entire sheet. Footfalls thunderous against the carpeted stairs grew louder and louder as the liquid swallowed up the rest of the paper. The spidery words faded into the backdrop as the blood swirled, darkening in the middle to reveal bolded letters. Just as they were about to complete their arrangement, the door crashed open and my head snapped upward towards my wife. Honey, what are you? Her breath strangled itself in her throat, a choked gasp replacing the words that had been forming. 
I'm sorry. I blurted out with a sob. I just had to know. My eyes strayed from her face, drawn inexorably downwards and towards the letter clasped between the shuddering hands. Rui Min Cheng. My gaze remained locked on the paper, my mind a blank. It was her. It was her. My heart, heavy as a stone, suddenly felt light as a feather and I laughed. The shackle around my chest released its grip as I rolled back towards her, but the sight of those beautiful eyes stricken by a ghostly horror sent me crashing back down to earth. A knife thrust deep in the shackle's place, and I was overcome by the irresistible urge to sink endlessly into the ground. I, I can explain. I had to... needed to know. I don't know why, but I couldn't stop myself. Please, Rui. You have to understand. Her cheeks, once as rosy as two balls of sunshine, had been drained of all color. The assured gaze of a woman's confident in her husband's faithfulness had shattered, her pallid lips no longer responding to the signals of her face. I stepped towards her, but she took two steps back, grasping at the door frame with trembling fingers and a whimper. Are you... Are you okay? I frowned. This wasn't right. Wasn't she furious? Why wasn't she saying anything? Why wasn't she shouting at me? That's when I realized she wasn't angry. She was terrified. I gasped at her, struggling to figure out what was going on. I felt movement in my hands, and as I glanced downwards, I realized that the entire parchment had shrunk, folding upon itself until it was a fraction of its original size. Instead of delicate paper, it had hardened into a robust mineral, its cream and purple glimmer now accentuated and deepened with a distinctive oval shape I had seen every day for the last six years. It was the shape of the pendant around her neck. Time seemed to slow around me as my world reeled. I could see nothing else except the pendant hovering above the contours of her collarbone, matching the one in my hand perfectly. How had I not noticed that the colors were exactly the same? My hands reached towards her necklace and she recoiled backwards with a cry, dodging the direction of my thrust. Her face was streaked with tears, the corner of her eyes blood red. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. Her hand flailed limply in the air, seeking purchase and certainty that were no longer there. This wasn't supposed to happen. It couldn't have happened. You... You received the same letter. I did. It's how I found you. You weren't meant to find out. Not like this. The air between us hung taut, frigid as a block of ice. The lines of her face creased downwards, revealing an age to her that I had never noticed before. Her chest quivered desperately as she choked back sobs, her coffee-tinted eyes fixed upon me, urgent and pleading. I stared at her, open-mouthed, feeling the seconds tick by. Then a solitary breath escaped my lips. Another came more easily this time until it morphed into a strange sound that faintly resembled a giggle. Do you remember those old movie stunts by Charlie Chaplin? She stared back at me. You know, the ones where he would hang off the edge of a building for dear life for hours, but when he finally falls he lands flat on his feet and you realize that the precipice was all just an illusion. I... I don't know. Look, what I'm trying to say is, when you said that you had received a soulmate letter with my name on it, I was surprised, stunned even, but you know what? That's all I feel. I realize that I don't care. The air soared through my lungs, rich and alive, and my voice had taken on a pitch I never knew it could reach. 
What does it matter how you found me, when it doesn't change the fact that we are destined for each other, now and forever? I closed the distance between us and kissed her deeply, feeling the warm curves of her lips press against my mouth. Her eyes blinked with surprise, but in a second her tears evaporated, replaced by bubbling laughter, echoing through me like an aria as I held her close, her heartbeat merging with mine. We tumbled onto the couch like a pair of giddy lovers, our laughter joyous and full. Hours must have passed before we realized we hadn't moved. We lay on the couch tangled in each other's embrace. I stroked her jet black hair caressing the curls of her locks, as luscious as they had been on the night of our first date. Her face had regained its divine serenity, the porcelain glow of her features radiating through me. She snuggled up close, pulling a blanket over us. It seems crazy, doesn't it? There I was all of yesterday, losing my mind over whether to open the letter, when in fact you had already done so years ago. Rui caressed my cheek gently. You've always stressed yourself too much for your own good. That overactive imagination of yours is your worst enemy. Can you blame me? I thought I was going to lose you forever. She laughed. You silly boy. You'd have to try far harder than that to get rid of me. We lay there, letting the comforting silence wash over us, and I felt my entire body uncoil itself. I gazed upwards towards the ceiling, a soothing smile falling upon my face. For the first time in a long while, I breathed. There's still something I don't understand. I uncurled one of her locks lazily, letting it tangle around my finger. Hmm. She exhaled as she tilted her head slightly upward towards me. Why did I receive the letter if you already had it all those years ago? I've only ever heard of one person in a couple receiving it. Who knows? Additional confirmation, maybe. She buried her head against my chest, her eyes blinking close. Lots of people yearn for the letter, but so few actually get it. A bit of a waste, isn't it? For the letter to come for both of us? I never peg the universe as the frivolous sort. I suppose so. Her breathing had already settled into that familiar lull it took just as she was about to fall asleep. It's gentle rises and falls, inducing a yawn in me. I looked upwards towards the ceiling, feeling a deep sense of contentment settle over me. Maybe the universe was telling me something after all. It was telling me to cherish our love, reminding me that nothing can ever come close to matching it. Seems gratuitous if you ask me. She said with a drowsy laugh. We hardly needed any confirmation of that. We wouldn't be very good soulmates if we did. Besides, why wait seven years? I don't think anyone who commits to a relationship for that long needs some silly paper to tell them what they've made the right choice. I chuckled, but I found my laughter catching itself in my throat. A string pulled at me from the back of my mind, its thread tugging urgently at my consciousness, screaming at me to notice it. I played her words over in my head languidly, like a cat playing with a ball of yarn, when suddenly I froze. My head turned towards hers slowly, each muscle in my neck dragging the movement out as long as possible. What did you say? Hmm. What did you say just now? About that silly piece of paper? No, after that. About how long the letter took to arrive. My head was pounding, nearly drowning out her voice with the thumps racketing through my brain. Oh, yes, yeah, seven years is a long delay. But we only met six years ago. Her eyes fluttered open casually, but I felt her heart quicken against my chest. Oh, I suppose you're right. I got the years mixed up. We just celebrated our sixth anniversary a few weeks ago. You know that, I said slowly. Why would you say it's been seven years since you got the letter? It was just a mistake, she muttered softly. Really? My throat was constricting, each word a struggle. 
Familiar emotions, long buried but never forgotten, were knocking incessantly on my door. Look at me. Why did you say seven? When did you receive the letter? Her expression was blank, fixated on some faraway point in the room. A curious look, one I had never seen before, appeared to come over her face, replacing that doe-eyed expression I thought I knew so well. In the light, she looked like an entirely different person, and I tensed backwards, an eerie dread creeping up my spine. A shimmering glint within the, my pocket of my shirt caught my eye. As my trembling hands retrieved the hardened amulet, I realized that its purple swirls had reformed themselves into an inscription of today's date. Just under Rui's name, right under it, however, the strands of another were crystallizing, glinting far brighter than its counterpart. 23rd of January, 2015. The day before Aubrey was murdered. A cannonball blew through me, leaving a gaping hole where my heart had rested, and my entire body locked up, numb and paralyzed. All I could focus on was Rui's face, shadowed and unreadable, observing the floor wordlessly. Time seemed to have frozen around us, trapping the two of us in a portrait of screaming despair. Finally, she turned back towards me, the erstwhile stoicism in her features unfolding into a wolfish grin. She chuckled as she brushed her hair back over her ear, her eyes glinting with the manic light I had never seen before. Ah, oh, my sunshine. You know I've never been a patient one. Fate had already decided that we were meant to be together. Her face broke out into an iridescent smile, as bright as the one she had the first day I met her. I simply helped to hurry the process along. I'm from Connecticut. I was in a long distance relationship with a girl from Georgia and would often make road trips down to visit her. I don't really mind. I love road trips. I've driven across the United States and back all on my own. There's just something about traveling the highways of the US by yourself that's just so freeing. To save money, I would sleep in my car. It's not so bad, it's basically camping in a metal tent. Makes you feel like you're really rough in it. I just recline the seat back, keep the key in the ignition just in case, and doze off. No, I don't put anything up to block the windows for privacy. Maybe I should have. The trip down south is a comfortable two day drive. My stop would usually be somewhere along the Virginia to North Carolina border. So, for my previous trip, that's exactly where I stopped that night. Rest stops were often less trafficked and thus quieter than truck stops. Normally I would have stopped at a Love's, but I was so tired that I settled for the first rest stop I saw. It was oddly vacant that night, with only a couple lone cars sitting forlorn under the amber street lamps. Most likely travelers with the same idea as myself. I pulled into a parking spot away from the others, under the shadow of a tree and far from the street lamps. I figured I would have more privacy there as opposed to being bathed in light, so I did my usual thing. Locked my doors, opened the window just a hair for ventilation, kept my key in, reclined the seat, and went to sleep. I was never interrupted on any of these car camping nights, so I never suspected anything on this one. Then a sharp tap woke me up. At first I thought I had heard it in my dream. I opened my eyes, a bit confused. Since I was leaned back, I was facing the ceiling and couldn't see anything. I hear another tap, like a tiny object hitting a hard surface. It came in an irregular rhythm. Was it raining? Was water dripping onto my windshield? I'm under a tree. Maybe something fell from the branches. Maybe a squirrel or a bird was dropping something. What if a squirrel was climbing around my car? Or... What if it wasn't an animal? The 
thought occurred to me that it might very well be a person poking around outside. What did they want? Were the doors locked? Yes, of course. The keys were in the ignition. I can leave in an instant. Still, I lay there completely still, pretending to be asleep. Pretending I hadn't heard anything. Hoping whoever it was, they would leave me alone. It was better to not find out. I was too afraid to find out. It was better to stay here in blissful ignorance. Still, the tapping continued. I had to do something. There was no way I was just going to stay there. I had to look. My heart was pounding. In that moment, it was deafeningly loud. Whoever was out there could probably hear it. I decided I was going to look. I was going to raise my head up and see what was making the noise. So, that's what I did. What met my eyes sent a jolt through my entire body. Every muscle fiber locked up in pure shock at what I saw. The faint glow of the street lamps cast just enough light for me to make out what I was looking at. There in the windshield staring directly at me was a face. Someone I presumed to be a woman was lying on my hood. Her face pressed right up against my windshield. Her face was completely still, locked in a permanent grin. I froze in overwhelming terror. The eyes I stared into appeared to have rolled back, showing only the whites. The nose was turned up, pressed painfully into the glass. The lips stretched wide, revealing horrid, rotten teeth. Even in the darkness, I could tell her skin was sickly pale, contrasting her long, filthy black hair. Whoever this was, she was clearly not in her right mind. I don't know how long I sat there, too afraid to move. Finally, I got a grip on myself and shot my hand to the ignition. It turned over, making in that instant the most beautiful sound I ever heard. For a split second, I was afraid I might be caught in a horror movie scenario. The one where the car won't crank as the killer approaches. I reversed as fast as I could trying not to give this creeper time to try anything. In my panic, I remember activating the windshield wipers in a futile attempt to get her off. I thought, was I about to drive out of here with some wacko holding onto my hood? Thankfully, I didn't have to worry about that because as soon as I stopped, the woman leapt off, landing on all fours. Seeing my opportunity, I shifted into drive and gunned it. Right as I saw her approaching for the driver's side door with my foot on the gas, I sped out of the parking lot. Behind me, I heard her let out a piercing shriek like that of an animal. I looked in my rearview mirror, and for a split second, I thought I saw her chasing me, running on all fours, her black hair swinging wildly around her. I couldn't get a good look. As I rounded a curve in the road leading out of the rest stop and merged with the highway, there I picked up speed and drove through the night. I did not dare stop again until I saw the morning light. It's not the most uncommon thing to find yourself at the receiving end of a horror story in a public gathering. After all, everybody has their ghosts, don't they? And it's only natural for them to want to share what haunts them with anybody who might listen. Makes one feel like they're not alone in this. Everybody has a little experience they can't explain, or a faint memory that just doesn't make a lot of sense while still seeming very real. Most of the time, we brush it off as a hallucination. Maybe you just heard it wrong. Of course, a man in white clothing wasn't standing in the middle of the stairwell you just passed. And of course, they are just bad dreams. Nothing more. What else would they be? They certainly don't explain the marks all across your legs, but that's okay. You find a way to rationalize that as well. Every single time. At the end of the day, we all have stories of the unexplained, weird mishaps that just can't be understood, and we deem them just as that. Stories. But what if you find yourself living through one of those stories? You experience the horrors they promise firsthand. Dread slithers in your bones and fear takes over you. 
Yet you keep telling yourself this isn't real. None of this is. Yet, if it isn't real, then what possible explanation do you hold for the terror you're feeling? Oh, what's that you say? You haven't faced fear like that. Ever? Well, allow me to change that for you. Come, don't be shy. Take a walk with me. Let me paint you a picture. Try to live through it, okay? Let's start by imagining ourselves in a quiet Indian village. It's not the shabbiest establishment, not by a far shot, but it's not the most advanced living either. What little development this place sees is a mere echo of what it should have seen. Somewhere along the system, the money meant for your little village drained into the pockets of this figure of authority or that. But that doesn't concern you. You still like it here. You've grown used to this place over time. You want change, but change is scary, you recall. Do you want change? You think you do, but... What would you even change about this place? The buildings? The education provided? Maybe some health facilities even? Or would you change the traditions? The way locals have lived here for hundreds of years? Do you have what it takes to change that? And with it, everything that village stands for... You probably don't, but who knows? Maybe one day you might. This isn't important, though. The important thing is that you're living in this place for decades now. Yet this little slice of rural India keeps surprising you every once in a while. You keep every mapped inch of it. Heck, you even know the unmapped parts. The arcane bits, the parts that get lost in the dark. The ones that nobody dares put into words. Although, someone does it. It's human nature, after all. If there's a story, it needs to be recorded. It needs to be printed deep inside everyone's memory to make sure it lives on through the ravages of time. Your village has a few local legends that nobody likes to talk about. The legends of dark, hidden places. These are the unmapped parts of your village. Over the years, it feels almost like talking about them has become taboo. This doesn't stop the whispers from spreading. How could it? Whispers, much like water, flow through the smallest of cracks. And in the dark of the night, these whispers make their way to those who lend their ears to it. The adults talk among themselves, half believing these legends purely because they grew up listening to them every day. Later, they would tell these stories to their kids. Trying to keep their kids alive should any of these terrifying horrors be true. But on a deeper level, keeping the stories of the village alive for further generations to come as well. You are no different than them. You, like everybody else, have heard these stories and have subconsciously learned to coexist with them. You take every suggested precaution without even realizing. You keep living your life here. And it is all very normal. That is, if you ignore the whispers, the damning relentless whispers, they always find you. Maybe not immediately, but eventually, even if it takes a few years, they will come for you. Just like they come for everyone else. Finally, one night your worst fears come to life. You have had nightmares about this. You have been conditioned for this. And under the covers, your elders have rigorously taught you how to get out of this. If one unfortunate day, this actually happens. You know what to do here. At least, you believe you do. You weren't doing anything peculiar when it began. It was a fine winter evening. And you were on your bicycle coming home from work. Night had fallen early as it tended to do in these cold months. Work was slow and you were bored out of your wits, but you managed to survive another day there, and now you were free to go to the comforts of your house. It wasn't even that late, but the darkness had only strengthened the whispers, and the whispers had compelled even the sanest of the individuals to hide away in the safety of their homes, full of light, with their families that brought them joy. They preferred it this way and tried with every breath to be miles away from whatever they thought lurked in the dead of night. 
Nobody could confirm whether the stories were true or not, and nobody dared be the one to fact check it. You, sadly, didn't have the liberty of being locked inside your own place before sundown. So there you were, in the dark, putting up a brave face for whoever could see while hoping nobody did. You had been cycling for a while now, and fatigue was slowly taking over. You figured you could just get off the bike and push it home. It wasn't that far away now. So you start treading, humming a little to yourself, watching the path that lay ahead of you as the moonlight illuminated it. Making your way across town, you reach a massive old tree, and having already been on the road for the past hour, you decide it would be okay to sit down under it. With your back against the tree, you close your eyes, and suddenly you heard a slight rustle of the leaves above you. Your eyes shot open as the words of the villagers come swarming back to your ears. Don't sit under the trees at night. Spirits reside in their branches. They will take you away, never to be seen again, the voices say. You try to shake it off telling yourself it's nothing more than a superstition. Somehow, you find yourself standing up, taking your bicycle, and hightailing out of there towards home. You're trying not to think of their words, but they have obviously spooked you. You start muttering a prayer. It's said this prayer wards off the evil spirits, and you are a willing to take whatever aid you can get right now. A little while later, you come across an intersection, in the middle of it stands a woman. A white sari drapes her entire body, and a veil covers every bit of her being except for her mouth. The unforeseen appearance of this lady makes you jump, and you breathe in deeply to bring yourself back to your senses. You look up trying to comprehend what is standing in front of you, and then all of a sudden, in one bright moment of flashbulb memory, you recall what your elders taught you. They warned you about a woman in white standing in the middle of the road at a time of the one night when no soul with any sense would dare step out. She would seem harmless, and for the most part she is. She seems to be calling out to you, but you barely understand what she is saying. You were always instructed not to go out in the dark if you can help it. However, you were also taught not to run away should you meet this woman. Much like a lot of other things, running away is an invitation for her. You turn your back on her without greeting her, and she will take that as a signal to pursue you. That is, never supposed to end well. Instead, if you are down on your luck so bad that you find this old lady, you go up to her and listen to her. Don't talk. Never talk. Just listen to what she has to say. More often than not, she will ask you to drop her off somewhere, maybe at the bus stop or at the railway station, wherever she wants to go, except without a single word and don't say anything. Engaging in conversation is an invitation too. Just gesture at her to follow. If you're in a vehicle, she'll sit behind you. Otherwise, she'll just keep walking right by your side. Against your better judgment, you do as you have been taught. You walk to her, and listen as she begs you to take her to the old railway station. You know it's defunct now, and no one ever really visits there anymore, but you dare not point this out at that moment, so you just gesture at her, accepting her plea for help. Happily, she sits behind you, and you start walking when you remember one other detail. Fire. That was the key to surviving this encounter. You don't smoke, but the seeds of fear sown by the rural legends in your childhood grew as plants of paranoia in you. This meant no matter where you went, you took a pocket lighter with you. Little did you know, it would come in handy. You were slightly confused as to where all the fluid went because you don't smoke and you barely use the lighter. So what could have happened to it? It wasn't the time to debate about your imaginary usage of the lighter, so you shake your head and start moving. You tell yourself it is okay. 
You don't actually have to go to the old station. All you have to do is make it to your own home. Once you're there, you can just let the woman stay outside and she'll go away on her own. That's how it's always been. You just need to go home. Slowly pushing, you look at your source of light and realize that you should technically be safe. You hadn't broken any rules so far and you definitely had more than enough fuel in your lighter to get you home. From your estimates, the lighter should run for at least 20 more minutes and you were a bare 10 minute walk away from security and comfort. You start feeling good about your chances of survival. You've prepared for this after all. The woman sitting behind you keeps talking about one thing or the other. You try not to pay any attention to her words as you silently keep repeating the prayer of Lord Hanuman from earlier. Although something feels off, maybe it's the fact that you can feel her eyes on you from under the veil, or maybe it's the fact that despite hearing a constant lively chatter from behind you, it still very much seems as if her mouth isn't moving at all. You're scared. Confident, but scared. You want to turn around to see her once, just to make sure. You don't know what, what you would want to make sure, but you just do. Showing tremendous willpower, you manage not to turn around. You're not supposed to look at the old lady. Everyone is aware of that. You simply do not turn back. Turning back equals surrender. You don't want to surrender, so you keep going. After five or maybe six minutes, you reach another intersection. Your house is straight ahead, and the old railway station on your right. You keep going straight while the woman protests from behind you. She's still not hostile, and soon quiets down on her own, falling back to her old chittering about nothing in particular, and you keep moving on silently. It's been a long time since you left for home, and a mixture of panic and fear is being reflected in the beads of sweat that sit heavy on your neck, on the little droplets. You keep feeling the woman's breath from time to time. It's icy and sends slight shivers down your body, but you have no choice here, except putting on a brave face and continuing walking. After an elapsed period of time, you notice a change in the atmosphere still dark, and the air is still chilly, but everything seems denser now. The air feels heavier, colder. It has gotten harder to tread through it, almost as if you're facing a slight resistance. But that's not all. The darkness too differs now. For starters, the moonlight has disappeared. The moon is still there, clear as day, but it isn't illuminating your surroundings or your path anymore, as it has turned its back towards you, and the darkness is overpowering everything now. Whatever the case may be, you're unable to see anything around you, except for the tiny glow of your lighter. But this doesn't make sense. So you try to shake the feeling off, reminding yourself that your house isn't far away. The lighter is about to run out and you begin to feel like you are moving in a loop now. You, scarcely optimistic, pushing your bicycle by its handles. With a lighter in one hand and a strange woman in while sitting behind you in the carrier of your cycle. Talking incessantly and breathing down your neck, sending chills down your spine. All of this is happening inside a small safe bubble of orange illumination and you are aware that outside this bubble is nothing but darkness that has come to life. More time has passed and you're still not home, even though you should have been. It scares you more than you already were, but you know not to lose your cool. Don't talk to her. Don't turn back. Don't stop praying. You keep reminding yourself, but that doesn't help subtle the increasingly stronger waves of panic. You glance at your lighter, only to see that it's out of fuel. What's keeping the fire burning, then? You ask yourself, knowing you have no possible explanation for it. Perhaps just a pebble of luck thrown in an ocean of a misfortune that you are drowning in. Nonetheless, you're not complaining. In this hour, you'll take whatever aid you can get, no questions asked. 
Whatever is keeping you alive as you move towards your house with it appears to be a lady who isn't acting hostile yet, is bound to run out, and as soon as that happens, you'll learn if she is actually hostile or not. You murmur and pray that you don't have to learn this tonight. The fire is the only thing keeping you alive. There is no definite proof the thing behind you isn't hostile, but then again, there's no proof that it is. You know you don't want to risk it, so you keep going, and finally the darkness lifts and the moonlight returns, giving you a sight of where you are. As you look around, you see an old metal banner with something written on it. It's almost illegible, having been beaten down to its current crumbling condition by years of wear and tear with no maintenance. At last, you're able to read the words with some effort, and reading them sends you in a shock. It's the old railway station. You can't figure out how you got here. The only place you shouldn't have gotten to. It makes no sense, but then again, nothing has been making sense ever since you got this lovely passenger on your back. Trembling slightly, you keep going, intending to stop only at the gate of the station now. A light breeze starts up and you don't even feel it. The tingling fear in your bones numbing everything else. You eventually take note of it, only to see the lighter's flame is getting restless. Dread starts setting in your very soul as you start to realize your luck has run out. And just then, the lighter goes off. You stop moving immediately. Click. Nothing happens. You try again, more desperate. Click, click. Still nothing. The lighter remains on lit. You look around in a panic, unsure what to do. Click, click. A few sparks. Not enough for a fire, but they do give you some hope. Click, click, click. More sparks. More hope. Yet the hope is as long lived as the sparks. It appears and it flickers away. Not enough. Deep in your bones, you know that nothing is going to help you now. You grow increasingly desperate. Your lighter clicks become more and more frantic. And then you hear it. A low growl coming from right behind you, accompanied by labored breathing. There's something about this growl you just heard. You know this growl isn't solitary. There is a toothy grin that you can feel without even turning back. Yet you are sure the old lady is baring her teeth. And every strand of your existence screams at you to just run away from there. But your body is frozen in place. You know this is the end of the line for you. In your last moments, you make a decision. If you die right here, right now, you want to see what kills you. You want to be able to look your death in the eyes before succumbing to it. You start to turn around to face whatever sits on your carrier as the voices of everyone you have ever met in your village come to you. All of them are saying the same thing. Every single one of them tells you not to do it. Turning around goes against everything you've been taught. Years and years of teaching has imprinted on your brain the fact that no matter what, you are not supposed to turn around. However, you realize this is the end. And at this point, turning around or not is the only thing left under your control. In a split second, you make the call and turn around, lighter in your hand, only to see the same innocent-looking old woman in a white serene, with a veil covering her entire body but her mouth. The next moment, you hear a slash as if a blade tearing through something. You look down to find a deep cut running through your body. The next moment you hear the sound of a bicycle falling. Following that is the fainter sound of your precious lighter crashing on the dirt. Finally, you hear the heavy thud of an adult body hitting the ground. You look at the body laying at your feet and it's you. But you are still standing still, unable to understand what's happening. Looking up, you see the woman fading. Her mouth turned in a smile that's difficult for you to place. It isn't a happy smile. 
But it's also not a sad one. It's haunting. A smile. It's a smile that you know will keep coming back in your dreams. Maybe today. Maybe tomorrow. But she will smile at you again and you know it. Your body is crumpled up on the ground. It's probably living the last dream of its existence. Then, as if nothing happened, your body rises up. The wound on its chest healed. Even the clothes are spotless. It picks up the bicycle and then the lighter. It looks at you and it smiles. It's the same smile as that of the woman. With that, the body is gone. It walks away with the bicycle and you're left there. Not feeling much of anything anymore. No pain, no fear, just an emptiness. You stand there for an endless amount of time waiting for something to happen. You keep waiting, but when nothing happens, you resolve to go away from this place. You walk up to the tree where you first sat down on this unfortunate night, and you sit there once again. As the sun rises, you start to fade. And as soon as the light of the sun leaves, there you are again in the darkness. However, soon something happens, and it's not something you could have guessed in any possible manner. The legends of your village changed. The old lady from the intersection has faded from everybody's memory. Everybody but yours. You remember her bright as the day. You remember her taking your body and leaving you alone on the abandoned railway station on a cold raven black night. The tales of the old lady are now replaced by those of a lone man. Nobody tells you about it. Nobody knows you are dead. How could they? Your body is still out there while you're here. Spending countless days and nights hoping someone is unlucky enough to have no choice but to stumble out at night. You don't want to hurt them. Not at all. You're gentle. You just want the directions to the old railway station. My little sister had gotten a giant teddy bear for Christmas, but she didn't want it, so I thought I might as well add it to the numerous pillows that lined my bed. I'm a very creative person, so I named the bear Teddy. It was massive, about half of my height, and it had light gray fur that was softer than alpaca wool. It was a few weeks ago when I first noticed something strange with the stuffed bear. My imagination would often run wild, so I assumed that nothing was amiss. Despite that, I couldn't help but notice how Teddy would always seem to be looking at me, watching my every move. Whenever I worked on my desk, I would periodically glance at my bed to see his black beady eyes staring into the deepest depths of my soul. Sometimes I would even stare back. Teddy's irises were deeper than a bottomless pit. It seemed like I could get lost by simply looking at them. Whenever something like this happened... I would turn the bear 180 degrees so that its back would face me. Then, I would glance backwards again. Eventually, while I wasn't looking, Teddy would turn around completely, sending chills down my spine. It couldn't have been gravity, nor could it have been the wind. Nobody else was in my room, either. My first thought was that Teddy was alive, but that was absurd. This isn't Toy Story. Besides, Teddy was harmless. It was a little creepy that he was always looking at me, but he never made any hostile moves. Even if he did, he was literally a teddy bear. What's he gonna do? Strangle me with his fluffiness? I could probably dropkick him to the moon. As long as he didn't body anyone, there wasn't any point in doing anything. One night, I woke up to find that a few of my pillows had fallen off my bed. I reclaimed them, but Teddy was missing. Ah, screw it, I thought. It was too much effort to turn on the lights so I could just find him in the morning. It wasn't uncommon for my pillows to fall, and he probably just ended up somewhere I couldn't reach. And so, I drifted back into my peaceful slumber. Sure enough, Teddy was lying on the floor when I woke up in the morning. I let out a small giggle. There you are. 
and so the day passed by as usual. When I went to bed that night, I woke up at around 1am again. None of my pillows had fallen except for Teddy. This time I flicked my light switch and scanned my entire room, but he was nowhere to be found. What the heck? Where'd you go? I asked those two questions as if expecting a response from an inanimate object. With a sigh, I scratched my head and left my room to get a glass of water. My throat was drier than Teth Valley. Before I could take a step into the kitchen, a muffled noise stopped me in my tracks. I sucked in a sharp breath that could have sliced my lungs if I weren't careful. After a few moments, the noise echoed again. It wasn't my overactive imagination. Naturally, I made the single most horrible decision that someone could make in a horror movie. I tiptoed toward the sound. Could you blame me? I was curious. Besides, chances were pretty low that a murderous monster was hiding in my house. I, for one, have never heard anybody encountering such a demon. Though now that I think about it, it might just be a survivorship bias. A dead person wouldn't be able to tell the tale of a murderous monster who broke into their house. It didn't take me long to discover what made the noise earlier. It was my little sister. Her carry-on red hair and green eyes were unmistakable, even in the darkness. She should have been asleep, but she was playing with Teddy in the living room. I must not have heard her thievish intrusion. Upon spotting me, my sister clutched Teddy in her stubby little arms and fled to her room. Go back to sleep. Jeez, if you wanted Teddy so bad, you could have just asked. With a jaw-breaking yawn, I returned to my bed and got the rest of my shut-eye for the night. When my alarm woke me up, I felt as if gravity had tripled in the time I had been unconscious. Getting out of bed was usually the most difficult part of the day. I eventually dragged myself to the bathroom where I emptied my bladder and splashed some water on my face. As much as I hated the frigid faucet, it did a good job of waking my mind. Hey, have you seen your sister? It came from my mom who was standing outside my bathroom door. No, I replied. She was playing with Teddy in the middle of the night, but she ran back to her room when I saw her. What time was this? Maybe around 1 a.m.? Why was she awake? I don't know. I just know that she stole Teddy and played with him for some reason. Weird. She's probably playing hide and seek or something. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. At that, my mom went back to searching. It's true that my sister had played these sorts of games before, but she was notorious for her terrible hiding places. She once tried to mimic a standing lamp by putting the shade over her head. The only good hiding spot she ever found was behind the curtains. Maybe she happened to have found somewhere impossible to uncover. Bernadetta, where are you? Bernadetta! My parents spent the entire morning trying to find my sister, but they came up empty-handed. It was the same thing with me. I couldn't find her anymore. It was almost as if she had vanished from thin air. When I checked my sister's room, I found Teddy staring at me once again. That cocky little bastard was mocking me, I swear. Understandably, my parents panicked. They didn't waste any time filling a missing person report. After all this effort spent searching, I was sure that my sister would reveal herself eventually, but that wasn't the case. She was gone. Because of the whole ordeal, I was late for school that day. No worries, though. I hadn't been tardy enough to warrant any consequences. When I drove back home, my sister was still gone. My parents hadn't heard any news, either. Out of instinct, I grabbed a kitchen knife and stomped into my sister's room. Sure enough, Teddy was still there. I stabbed the cursed pile of Fluffy 60 times and chopped off his head creating a mound of stuffing all over the bed. Then I took every last piece and shoved them into the trash bin outside. Tomorrow was trash pickup day, so the garbage truck would soon collect Teddy and incinerate him. Could you call my act of murder insane? Maybe. Who goes around stabbing teddy bears? Well, 
me, apparently. It was a stupid idea in hindsight, but I was thinking at the time, no matter what anybody tells me, I'm sure that bear had something to do with it. He did something to my sister. I know it. There was no way I was keeping that thing inside my house. By the time I went to bed, a persistent nagging had kept me from falling asleep. Even if I slipped into unconsciousness, I would be plagued by nothing but nightmares. Maybe insomnia was a blessing in disguise. Suddenly, someone knocked on my door. Who is it? I asked. No answer. Mom? Dad? They usually got home pretty late, so they were probably checking on me. Another knock. What do you guys want? Silence. Then a third knock. Sheesh. I muttered, taking off my covers. Then, I froze. What if it wasn't my parents? But then, who could it be? They should be the only other people in the house. Unless, no, it couldn't have been Teddy. I chopped him into pieces. The garbage truck drivers were supposed to take him away the next morning. I retreated under my covers and waited. Damn my hyperactive imagination. This might just be a dream for all I know. I recalled some tricks to find out if you were dreaming or not. Number one, count your fingers. I still had five. Number two, inflect pain onto yourself. I pinched my cheek and instantly felt the sting. I wasn't dreaming. This was reality. By now, the knocks had stopped. I peeked my head out from my blanket and monitored the door. The knob turned and my heart skipped a beat. The hinges wailed as the door swung open, revealing a diminutive figure. It lumbered into my room without a sound. Cowering under my sheets would do no good to protect myself. My best option was to fight, but still I couldn't move. Sheer terror had trapped me like a coffin. After a few moments, the figure hopped onto my bed. It was close enough that I could finally discern what it was. A stuffed bear. It was about a third of Teddy's size, and it had red fur that matched the shade of a bloodied corpse. Worst of all, it had strikingly familiar emerald eyes. That was when I noticed another shadow next to me. There he was, sitting as still as a cadaver. Teddy... He met my gaze and said, Won't you play with us? I remember when the letter came into the mail letting me know I was hired. It had managed to pull me out of a depressive episode, one of many, and gave me hope that maybe I wouldn't be a waste of space for the rest of my unnecessarily exasperating life. I had been so used to my same routine of waking up, school, work, study, sleep, that I eventually looked for a new job in another state for an impulsive change of scenery. I guess I was looking for a new life in general, though. I was about to go from a fast food workplace to a security guard in a town I had never heard of. The job was strange, to say the least. Everything down to the application process was a bit retro, I suppose is the right word. I had to mail in my application letter, that of which I had to print out, and was shocked to see that even though I had written my phone number in the letter, they had sent through mail my job acceptance. Before I knew it, I was making the drive from Loud, New York, to a quiet town in Maine. Maine is... different. The town I live in is peaceful at night and still during the day. Each counterpart matches perfectly together. It's a more modern town with themes of well-preserved history. The people are nice and wave on walks as you drive by. My neighbors were welcoming when I moved in. It makes me wonder how the building where I work at is the way it is. The building on the outside underestimates what's inside of it. It's dull and old looking with about two floors. The walls seem as though it has been so much as rained on since the 80s, I swear. 
Old dirt coats it, and leaves and sticks cover the top of it. It's not overwhelmingly big until you walk in. The first time I stepped foot into it, I thought I had been teleported. It was way bigger inside than it seemed on the outside. It was a roller skating rink and a large one at that. The only thing that was right about it was its correlation on the outside. Long story short, the place looked completely abandoned, which is honestly the only thing that made sense about it. At first, I called my boss asking if I was in the right place. I went straight to voicemail. I had absolutely no signal. I didn't seem to get one until I drove down the dirt path and on the road. I parked and called again. The conversation went along the lines of, Hi there, I think I'm at the wrong place. What do you mean? Well, I'm at an old skating ring. That's it. What? The skating rink. That's the place. The instructions are on the security's office desk. He just hung up. I was going to call him back, but the entire situation was so confusing, and my new developed interests with the place took over. I turned my car around and drove back. In hindsight, it was stupid. I've never even met the guy who was supposed to pay me. The building proportions were not right in any fucking universe, and for all I knew, I was walking into a very dangerous situation, considering I had no understanding of any of what this place holds inside of it. When I went back in, I was hesitant but powered through as I searched for the office. The office is normal unlike the rest of the place. Small and normal for what you would expect in a building, which is terrifying for a place like this. This was the only room to have a signal. I found the instructions and taped to them was a $50 bill. The note stated that I would get $50 each night and an extra $100 on the seventh night for each week I stay. I was to work from sundown to sunrise and to only check around the building each five hours I was there. The next part was the weirdest part. This is what it says word for word. Upon seeing a human in the building, even if it is yourself, lock the door. Call me. Turn off the cameras and do not leave the room until sunrise, no matter what you hear from outside. Even if it is yourself. To this day, that still gives me nightmares. Everything about this job was just nightmare fuel. I wasn't sure what I had really just gotten myself into, and as weird as it sounds, I wanted to just work one shift to get a better understanding of it all. Maybe I was blinded by the fact I had turned my entire life upside down for this job because I was naive and depressed, or maybe, in some sick, messed up way, I knew this was going to ruin my life and I wanted to see if it was capable of coming into fruition. I'm aware of how much of an idiot I sound, as well as how much of one I am. One shift, and then I would decide what to do next, exactly. I locked the door, pocket the $50, and sat down, powering up the cameras. I could see every room in the building. There's ten rooms in total, not including the bathrooms, in which it makes 14, but a total of 15 cameras, with three showing the large skating rink. The upstairs is an arcade, as well as an eating area. However, that's a separate room itself. There is a motion sensor on each camera, which will flash a red motion detected on the monitor in the room it's in. The first time I did the 5-hour checkup on the building, it was 11.45pm. It took a total of 15 minutes to even bring myself to get out of the chair to leave the room. I was practically on the verge of pissing myself. Each room was completely silent. Only half of them even have lights. I was completely convinced that at any point someone was going to murder me, and no one would ever find me because this place is in the middle of nowhere. I did make it through, though. Unmurdered at that. Weirdly enough, the night was normal. Of course, besides the building itself existing and the notes seeming premonition and so against better judgment, I went back for my next shift, and the one after that, 
in each one I've had in the last five and a half months. Of course, though, I wouldn't be writing this if it was all normal because, to no one's surprise, it has not been. After around the third week, I was doing better than I had in a very long time. I had a good routine. Go to work from sunset to sunrise. Go to bed, wake up, grab breakfast, and do a bit of schoolwork. I'd even begun to make friends around here. One morning, I had woken up early to get food at a new place in town. It was a cute little coffee house and was a good change from the cheap coffee I had at home. One of the big changes in my life was I was a bit more social, and I started chatting with the waiter. We were around the same age, so we talked about school and other boring shit. The topic of my job came up. I don't remember what exactly I said about what I did, but it was something like, I work security at some creepy abandoned skate rink. The guy asked where in town when I told him the street. He just looked really confused. He told me that not only did he live one road down, but that that place wasn't there. I knew that it was impossible because I had literally gone there for the past three weeks of my life. I asked him where he thought it was then, and he said, Man, I've lived here my entire life, and there has never been a skate rink here. I drive that road to get here, and it's all just trees on it. It was around two weeks after that when I began to notice that there were things in the building that wouldn't show up on the cameras. For example, there are a few skates that have been left on the rink. Five in total. However, only four would show up on the cameras. Another thing is the upstairs eating area. There are six trash bins in total. Each one is in the shot of the cameras. Only two are seen in the footage. When you work at a place like this, you can't ask questions. You know you'll never get answers. In total, I have only ever seen two people here up until now. I hate saying it as if it's normal, but I don't have a choice. Like I said, I really will never understand any of this. The first time it happened, it was around 4 a.m. I had checked all the cameras minutes prior and was just scrolling through my phone. I had grown accustomed to just leaving the door unlocked because I had no real reason to lock it. When I saw the red flashing from the corner of my eye, I have never been more terrified in my life. The first night seems like a piece of cake at that point because I had not seen it flash that nauseating red motion detected. The camera it opened up to was number two, the lobby. I had looked at what the monitor was showing me. I had no clue what I was about to see and I truly think that was scarier than not being able to see anything at all. It took me about 45 seconds before I saw it. In one of the corners behind a chair was a little kid. I couldn't see its face. I don't know how old it was supposed to be, or their race, or if it was even a boy or a girl. All I knew was, if I didn't listen to what I was instructed to do in the letter, I was going to die. Trying not to shit myself, I locked the door quickly but quietly. When I called the boss, his reaction was not one I thought it was going to be. Instead of panic or dismay, he sighed and repeated the instructions to me. Except, instead of telling me to turn off the cameras, he asked me to describe it. I can't even get my words out. I was livid at the fact that he wanted me to describe I was livid at the fact that he wanted me to describe the thing instead of helping me. I can barely pick out one thought in my brain. But when he repeated his instructions a second time, I just sat down and told him what it looked like. I was suddenly exhausted. Too exhausted to argue, or yell, or to try to make a run for it. I guess fear does that to you. Custom to his character, he hung up on me right after I finished telling him what it looked like. And he left me with a simple, Okay kid, you can turn off the cameras. I spent the rest of the night shaking in fear, too scared to do so much as blink knowing it would take my eyes off the door. After that, once the sun rose, I sprinted out of there like my life depended on it. I didn't sleep for the rest of the day. 
I had so much to think about. On one hand, nothing bad really happened and the pay was above average to say the least. I had a good life because of that job. But on the other, I knew what I saw wasn't human. I was very aware I needed to leave. It was dangerous and far above anything I wanted to deal with. But I have a running theme of being completely ignorant. So, when I went back the next night, and it was completely normal. The more friends I've made here, the more I've learned not to talk about my job. Anytime I do, they swear they've never seen it or heard about the place. So it's just best they think I work in some office building a town over. At this point, anyone I associated with has no idea about the security job. I plan to keep it that way. The second time I saw something was about four months in. I was in finals week, so I was enthralled in some textbook on American history when I noticed the motion detected alert. My heart did the whole skipping a beat then racing at the speed of light thing like it did last time. This time, it pulled up camera number eight. This was one of the arcade cameras. It was going to be a whole lot harder to look for a person in the arcade considering there's so much going on in the room. However, before I looked, I jumped up and locked the door and began to type in my boss's number. The phone rang as I searched, and as he picked up right as I saw what I was looking for. This time, it was a man. Instead of seeing its entire body though, he seemed to be peering over one of the arcade machines. In person, the machines are around six and a half feet tall. And here stood some wide-eyed creature looking over it, directly into the camera. It was the same routine as before. My boss tells me the instructions in the letter, except he tells me to describe it and hangs up on me, leaving me terrified. I once again sat in the corner of the room just watching the door and made a quick escape in the morning. On my drive home that morning, I crafted a plan. I would go back to work tonight and take a picture of every room in the building. I would take a picture of the path that led to the building. I would take a picture of every single wall that made that goddamn place stand. But most importantly, I would have evidence that it's real and that I'm not losing my mind. I got there a little bit early that night. I took a photo of everything on the outside and when I stepped inside I took about 200 photos of the entire place. Finally I had some proof that I don't run around the woods at night, which for a while I was kind of convinced I was. That night was uneventful. I was just excited to go home and upload all of them to my computer to print it. I wanted to finally be able to tell someone the truth. I enjoy my life now, truly, but I feel like I'm living half a lie. When I got home in the morning, though, every single photo was in complete darkness. There's absolutely nothing in any of the photos. That was impossible, though. All of these photos I took during the day in the bright sun. I did everything from enhancing them, putting filters on them, and eventually I had to accept defeat. I was lost. I was tired of this. I'm sure you're wondering why I haven't quit yet. I honestly don't know. There's absolutely no reason for me to stay here, but I just can't bring myself to do it. Of course, I can get other jobs. I'm aware of that. Money isn't even an issue anymore. I just... I don't know. Can't. But I guess that brings me to now. Five and a half months later. I'm currently sitting in the security office typing this on my computer. The shift started the way it always has. I made my first amount of rounds and it was... Well... Uneventful. Eventually, I came in here to finish an essay, and when I finished, I did my regular checkup of going through each camera. When I finished, I played some games on my phone. Around 35 minutes ago, the red motion detected alert went off. Camera number 5 points almost directly at my office door. 
I didn't have to search for any kind of person this time. I mean, it's right there. I haven't called my boss yet, and I'm not sure what I'm going to do. I'm too scared to talk. I know it'll hear me. I know I should call him, but I'm scared that when it does hear me, it's going to kill me. Hell, I'm not sure what I'm even going to tell him when he asks me to describe it. My boss doesn't know what I look like. So it's not like I can just tell him it's me. I'm writing this using voice to text while I drive myself back to my house. I'm sorry if this sounds rambling or like it doesn't make sense, but I don't know what else to do. I don't know if anyone will ever read this, but I just felt like I had to do it. Maybe for me. Maybe for someone else out there. Maybe for no one. I don't know. I woke up this morning from one of those weird half and half dreams where everything seems almost exactly like real life, except that it feels just a little bit, I guess, off. I think everyone has had those and understands what I mean. I know I've had them a lot and it's always a little disorienting to wake up from one. Only this time I woke up fully alert and ready for the day. True, I knew I had to go to work, but after the weekend I just had, I was more than ready to put my focus on emails and unruly customers. It hadn't been horrible, just tense and uncomfortable. With my wife and I finding seemingly every way to get on each other's nerves we possibly could. The night before had ended with me putting our five-year-old daughter Christine to bed like normal and then going to bed early myself, mainly to avoid any more bickering. So, needless to say, I wasn't exactly sorry to be getting ready to head off to work. I hoped some time apart focusing on other things would help us both calm down and we could talk. Other than my dream and my greater than usual morning energy, it was a normal start to the day. Grab clothes and toss them in the dryer so they're warm and soft. Hop into the shower for a few minutes, shave, dry, and style my hair. Which honestly doesn't take that long, though given the complaints I get about it sometimes you'd think I was in there for hours. Get dressed, check my phone, etc. Normal stuff. Even if I had to hunt for my shampoo and then my razor since they weren't in my usual spots. There was an all-staff email from my boss Brian that he sent late Friday evening, and I groaned reading it because it was about an all-staff meeting that he wanted to have to go over a few things, which never amounts to anything good or productive. I must have gotten caught up in my thoughts longer than I realized because the next thing I knew, it was a few minutes past time for me to be walking out the door. I jumped up and grabbed my keys and wallet and headed towards the door. When I walked past Christine's room, I noticed that her door was shut. It was odd because normally at that time of the morning she'd be playing with her toys or helping. My wife cook in the kitchen. I knocked on the door so we could have our usual goodbye kisses and squeezes and tickles, but all that happened was her yelling, go away, leave me alone, at me through the door. I tried to open the door, but it was locked, which she knew was against the rules. We had told her numerous times to not lock the door because we couldn't get in there if she needed us. I yelled for her to come unlock it, but she didn't respond anymore, though I could hear her moving around and crying. I checked my phone and saw I was really late, so I called to my wife in the kitchen. Honey, Christine's locked herself in the room. Can you go find out what's wrong? I'm late leaving today. I'll call later. Love you. She didn't say anything, just turned and stared at me with a blank look on her face. I chalked it up to her not being over our last fight from the night before. Started by me evidently loading the dishwasher incorrectly, and so she was giving me the silent treatment. Honestly, I didn't have time to think about it, but I felt sure there would be a talk later. I saw her turn towards Christine's room as I turned to shut the door behind me, so I figured she had at least heard me and would make sure our daughter was okay. I hopped in the car, started it up, and pulled out of the drive. We live out in the country and I still had at least a 45 minute drive ahead of me to traffic if it wasn't too bad. So, 
I figured I would have plenty of time to mentally adjust to work mode. The route takes me by one of my wife's relative's houses, an older aunt who still works out in her yard almost every morning. On a day when I leave in enough time, I can stop and talk for a minute and check in, but when I'm late, I'll slow down and blow the horn and wave. I saw her out front as usual, so I did, even rolling down the window to yell good morning as I rolled past. She stood up and turned to look at me. She didn't wave back or say anything. Her face, it was expressionless. She just stared at me as I drove past, not reacting, not blinking, just staring. I couldn't figure out any reason she wouldn't have returned my greeting, unless maybe she had been outside for too long and was feeling a little sun-dazed. But soon enough, I was past her and had my eyes back on the road. It wasn't until I was down the road a little, right before a curve that I happened to glance in my rearview mirror and noticed that she was standing in the middle of the road. It was such a shock, so unexpected a thing to see, that I slammed on my brakes bringing the car to a sudden stop. My first thought was that something was wrong that she needed help or was trying to get my attention for some reason. But the longer I sat there thinking about it, the more I felt sure that she was doing what she had been doing before, staring at me with that same blank look, that same expressionless face as she had when I drove by. I tried to tell myself I was being silly, that I needed to go back and check on her, when I noticed that she had started to move. Not back towards her house, but down the road, towards me. I still can't explain the thrill of fear that shot down my spine, but the next thing I remember was flying down the road away from her, going much, much faster than I should have been on those winding country roads. I knew I should slow down, but the thought of her getting closer to me, maybe even catching up to me, had my foot all the way down on the accelerator. I didn't see anyone else outside, which wasn't unusual, until I got to the end of the road where it turns into the bigger road into town. An old man lives there, and he sometimes will be outside with a whole pack of dogs, letting them play out in his yard. He's always friendly, and will wave or at least nod at people driving by. He was outside this time, sitting on a stump, but no dogs. Not even one. The hairs on the back of my neck stood up when I got there, and I dreaded to see if he reacted the same way my wife's aunt did. At first, he didn't seem to notice me, but then I guess the change in sound as I slowed down alerted him to my presence because he stood, turned to me, and stared with the same look I had seen on two other faces already this morning. I fought not to react, to act like nothing was wrong, to tell myself that I was just imagining things, that everything was normal. I stopped long enough to make sure there was no traffic coming and pulled onto the bigger road, glancing behind me as I did. I almost wrecked the car when I saw him walk out into the road and start to slowly make his way towards me. That same look on his face. I punched the accelerator again and took off, not able to pretend that I was okay anymore. I drove a little down the road, my head whipping back and forth watching for anybody who might be out in their yard or walking along the side of the road, but I didn't see anyone. Not far from the turn into the road is a little gas station that has really good breakfast, as well as gas, and though I was late and didn't need gas or plan on eating, I slowed and pulled in. I had to. I had to know. There weren't many people there, just a few good old boys who stopped nearly every morning for coffee and a biscuit, plus a couple of people to run the store. But at the sound of my car pulling in, every face turned as one to look right at me. Every face was that same blank, vacant stare. The one sitting slowly stood, and my pulse started racing as I flicked my eyes from face to face searching for anything other than that blankness. When the first one started towards me as I hit the gas again and fishtailed out into the road, my eyes locked on the rearview mirror, 
watching as they all slowly walked out into the road and moved after me. Farther off in the distance, I could just see the old man from the corner still making his way towards me. And my imagination supplied a mental image of my wife's aunt doing the same thing somewhere even farther back. By this point, my attention was half on the road in front of me and half behind me, watching the people from the gas station get further away. It was right about then that I encountered the first vehicle on the road since I had left the house. A regular truck, nothing fancy, nothing out of the ordinary. But as I passed by it, I ducked down, hoping to avoid being seen. Out of the corner of my eye, I thought I saw the driver's head turn towards me. And a moment later, I checked my mirror and saw the truck backing up off the road, turning around and coming towards me. I admit at that point I panicked for a minute and almost lost control of the car as the speedometer shot over 90, but when I glanced back the truck was still behind me. I slowed to avoid an accident and it kept on following me closely. I could see the driver in the rear view and I shivered at the by now familiar blank stare on his face. I decided there wasn't anything to do except continue on toward town hoping that maybe whatever was going on was isolated to the countryside and I could find some help and some answers. As I got closer to town, there was more and more traffic turning onto the road or coming the other way. And every time, every single time, they passed by me, stopped, turned, and got into the line behind me. I don't know how many cars and trucks and SUVs and motorcycles ended up behind me, but they stretched out as far back as I could see. I was barely watching the road now, my nerves jumpy, eyes scanning the roadside and behind me, fighting to keep myself together. I'm not entirely sure I succeeded. When I got into town, I saw more people, gas stations, fast food places, Standing outside their homes, every single damn one of them turned and watched me as I drove past. Slower now, cautious, trying to avoid hitting anyone or anything. They couldn't follow me into the road because of all the vehicles, so they started down the side of the road slowly. Slower than the cars and trucks, but always, always coming for me. No change of expression, no reaction to anything else going on. Hell, not even any noise, just those blank, empty faces watching me, following me, hunting me. As I drove further and further in, closer to my work, I began to realize something. I hadn't seen anyone else who was like me, who seemed normal. Everyone I had encountered, every single one of them had been like the ones behind me were part of the ones behind me. There wasn't going to be anyone at work who could help me. I thought about going to the police station, but knew instinctively that would be useless. It would just be that blank-faced, expressionless people following me. Not any help. There was nobody else but me. Nobody. And I remembered. I remembered my daughter. I remembered Christine yelling at me to go away, to leave her alone. She was the only one I had talked to, the only one who responded to me. I thought about how perceptive she is, how sensitive to change she is, and how even slight differences in behavior would upset her. She must have known, she must have sensed somehow. Then I thought about my wife. I thought about the blank look on her face when she had turned to me. Christine must have seen her mother before I got up, must have known, and then I thought about my comment to my wife about Christine being in her room, how my wife's head had turned that way as I was leaving, almost as if she had remembered there was someone else still in the house. I'm on my way back home. I've been driving as fast as I can, picking my way around the people or whatever they are still walking down the road towards me. I turned around in a parking lot and watched as every single vehicle followed me turn too. 
I was able to get ahead of them for a while because of how long it took, but now they're back on my tail. I've encountered some of the very first ones I saw this morning. I passed my wife's aunt a ways back there and tried not to look. Tried not to see her turn and follow me like all the rest. I have to get home. I have to get home, get Christine, and get us both somewhere safe. If anywhere is anymore, I'm about to pull into the driveway. I won't have much time. I'll park on the street so they hopefully can't block me in. I can see Christine's shadow at the window, but I can't see her face. I don't know what I'll do about my wife or any of the things following me. I don't know what I'll do if Christine looks at me with a blank, vacant stare like her mother. I just have to hope. I have to pray. I'm sending this out to all the contacts in my phone just in case. I'll post it online once I'm safe and back in my car with my daughter. Wish me luck. I'll message again soon. I hope. My sister is three years younger than me, so ever since we were small, I've always looked out for her and tried to protect her. When we were young, I would always take charge and lead the way. That changed when we got older, though. When she turned seven, she started getting more sure of herself. Started taking charge, too. Ten-year-old me wasn't happy. We started fighting around that age. Not actual fist fights, but... A lot of intense arguments over Lego pieces, whether to play hide and seek or catch, you know, serious issues. Her name is Sarah, by the way. She's 25 now, and she's a lawyer at a big shot law firm in Seattle. She's always been the smart one. I'm telling you about her because that's who I was thinking about when that day started. It started off a bit like any other day, actually. Normal life can be pretty boring sometimes. My alarm started ringing and I hastily and confidently hit snooze, but I couldn't go back to sleep. I remember the dream I'd just woken up from. Playing with Hot Wheels on a newly built track on Christmas. It was a specific Christmas when I was 12. I had just built the track and started to drop the cars down at pretending I was the driver. I asked my sister if she wanted to play too. She eagerly accepted. But after a couple of minutes of racing, she said we could change the game and instead pretend like we were police cars in a high-speed pursuit. I immediately accepted. I started to think about how I had lost that take-charge attitude from when I was a little kid. Hell, today, I don't even say anything to people when they cut me in line at the supermarket. I wondered about my sister's role in that change in my personality. If me agreeing to play another game so automatically that day was the start of my insecurities and shyness, my passive response to everything, I always got introspective and start overanalyzing things in the mornings before I get up, but I'm usually over it by the time I get out of bed. And I did. Put on some clothes and that's when I noticed a man on the, the square with glass on the wall. That lets you see. I also forgot words in the morning. Anyway, the man was walking alone. He wore blue jeans and a salmon-colored t-shirt with a large drawing of an avocado on it. I had the feeling I knew him. Maybe not know him, but I thought I had seen him before. I looked down for some shoes, and when I looked back up, the man was no longer there. I wondered about this man and about the subtle fear I felt when I saw him. I knew him. Maybe not. I finished getting ready. I was going to meet my sister for lunch. I got to the restaurant a little early. It was getting colder, I thought. My brown jacket wiggled with the subtle wind that passed by me, taking whatever shape the wind commanded. I thought about my passiveness again, how I was much like the jacket, flowing wherever others pushed me. I always overanalyze things when I'm waiting for someone, but I usually get over it pretty quickly. My sister's car pulled over. She got out and paid the meter. 
and then strolled towards me happily. I greeted her with a hug and a kiss on the cheek. Sarah said we should go inside. It was getting cold, after all. I nodded and started to move towards the door. That's when I glanced over my left shoulder. I don't know why I did, but I felt the urge to. I saw him again. The same man I saw in the morning. He was closer this time, on the other side of the street, walking alone like before. I felt like I knew him, but maybe not. As my eyes wandered somewhere else, he vanished. Just like earlier, I saw him only for a moment. There was something about him. He looked normal. Nothing special, but there was this aura around him. I couldn't quite figure out the reason for it, for this sense of fear he instilled in me. He looked hateful and calm at the same time. Angry, but composed. I tried to overanalyze things, I know that. We got to our table and started reading the menu immediately. I was hungry. Sarah did the same. We talked about what we were going to eat. I was on the fence. On one hand, the porterhouse looked good. Dry aged, 20 ounces. Good size for the price, but my sister noticed they had a tasting menu. She noted that we would get to try more things if we ordered it. She was right, and so that's what we ordered. I noticed the man again, this time through the window next to the entrance. He had crossed the street. He was looking angrier, more hateful than before. I knew him. I was starting to realize that. Well, maybe not. He looked sure of himself unlike me. I never looked sure of myself at all. Always let someone else take the lead. Content to watch life as secondary character. Not even that, actually. If I'm being honest, I'm more like an NPC. My interactions with others were few and devoided of meaning. Except with my sister. She is my younger sister after all, and I always try to protect her. The man was gone again, just like before I saw him, only for a moment. His intentions remained a mystery to me, but I could feel his hatred simmering, slowly and gradually increasing. He wasn't there anymore, but I still felt his somber presence. Who was he? My sister's words brought me back to reality. My thoughts stopped wandering. Sarah wanted to talk to me about something she told me before. We need to decide what to do about Dad's company. She son. My father had passed away a few months earlier and he left us each a 50% stake in his business. We were to either run it together or sell it and split the money. It wasn't a big company. Hell, not even a medium-sized one. Just a small decorating firm with a handful of employees and a couple regular clients. Not the most profitable business, but still more interesting than anything I was doing with my life. I think we should sell it. He owned the building, and there's a warehouse full of supplies and equipment. We can make a decent amount each if we find the right buyer. Sarah argued. I didn't agree. I thought we should run it together. That's what Dad would have wanted. My sister didn't budge, though. She said things at work were crazy at the moment. She was working a very important case and had her hands full and then explained to me that I wouldn't be able to run the business without her help, so we probably should just sell it and be done with it. My first instinct was to agree. After all, that's who I was. I was passive. I let the wind guide me. Never moved on my own will. Never disagreed with anyone. Never argued or complained. That's when I saw him again. He was sitting a few tables away from us inside the restaurant. The closest he'd been to me all day. I knew him. I felt it. But again, maybe not. His presence was heavier than before. The hatred spilled out from his familiar body. His aura of fear growing on me. That's when I decided to be proactive for once and told my sister what I wanted to do with our dad's business. This led to an argument. 
Nothing serious, but still enough for the man to notice it from his table. He was closer now. I noticed as I listened to my sister's well-founded arguments for as to why we should sell. Sarah was a lawyer, so I couldn't really do much to counter her well-prepared logical thesis. My passiveness was gaining ground again, as usual, and I started to realize she may be right. She'd always been the smart one. The man was no longer there, just like before. A few moments, and he vanished. Did he pay? I thought. Did he eat anything? Who is he? I knew him. I was sure of it. Maybe not. We had come to a conclusion, my sister and I. We were going to sell the business. It made sense. I knew it, but maybe it didn't. I asked her why she said I wouldn't be able to run the firm alone. I wanted to know what she meant by that. She let out a sigh and told me I was a bit of a pushover. I didn't stand up for myself. Always flowed with the wind, never stopping to think about where I wanted to go. She was right, but it hurt nonetheless. I started thinking about the man again. He had been following me, messing with me, and I did nothing. I was a pushover. I was just a spectator of my own life. I knew it. We started to argue. I was hurt by what she said and resorted to making her feel bad by pointing out that dad would have wanted us to run the company together. That she was tarnishing his memory. Sarah was visibly hurt by that statement and said she needed some air. She got up and headed towards the door. I knew it wasn't true. I knew I was overanalyzing things again, but for some reason I couldn't stop myself from saying it anyway. I decided I should go talk to Sarah. She was my younger sister, after all. I stood up and started walking to the door. I saw him again. He was back and a lot closer this time, seated only one table from ours. He looked enraged, but did nothing to note to make sure he was so. But I knew he was. I could feel his hatred boiling over. I knew him. Maybe not. I slid the door open and turned the corner to the alley next to the restaurant. I assumed my sister would be there. I should talk to her. And that's when I saw him again. How did he go from the restaurant to the alley without crossing me? How did he do it so fast? Those were all great questions. I was so focused on him that I didn't notice my sister squirming at his feet. Her eyes were bloodied and swole. The once straight and tiny nose was now a puddle of shattered bone, blood, and gravel from the ground where she laid. He wasn't done yet, though. The man grabbed her by the hair and lifted her face until she was staring right at his belt. His knee then made a sudden movement and collided with her mess of a nose. Blood spewed out and she cried aloud. His right hand wrapped around her throat confidently with more confidence than I ever had, and he started punching. Again and again, she cried for help, but I couldn't move. Please, she wailed at me. You see, I was like the jacket. I flowed with the wind. I went where it pushed me, and never resisted or complained. He kept punching her, his knuckles now bloodied and tired. Made him charge the approach. He picked her up and threw her against the floor. Now it was easier. He started to kick her ribs. Not the hen. That would do it too fast. He broke a few of them. And the shattered fragments of the bones that once protected her lungs now penetrated deep into them. Ripping the pleura easily. And letting the blood in to drown her from the inside. She didn't scream anymore. My sister could only produce a gargling, gasping sound. The blood filled her throat from the lungs below and gushed from the shattered nose above. He began to stomp on her throat, breaking the cartilage of the trachea. The squirming had stopped by then. 
the gasping sounds as well. She had suffocated in her own blood. As I looked at the deformed, bloodied body of my sister, I had kind of an out-of-body experience. I couldn't move and so I just stood there, looking at myself and thinking about what I'd just seen, who that man was and why he did this thing to Sarah, and thinking about our argument. This is where my focus landed. I started to realize that my sister only left because of the fight, how having that silly argument caused all this. That man would never have been able to be with her alone if it wasn't for that. A strong gasp of wind made me regain control. I didn't quite know how much time had passed and the man was no longer there, much like the rest of the day. I only saw him for a small amount of time. The wind was getting stronger. I realized I had forgotten my jacket inside, so I was only wearing a t-shirt. A salmon-colored t-shirt. With a large drawing of an avocado on it. My dad is obsessed with Google devices, and I mean obsessed. I grew up in a fairly small house. Sure, it was three bedrooms and two bathrooms, but it was small enough that if you were talking to someone upstairs, you could usually hear them from downstairs. Unfortunately, the Google devices are no exception to this rule. There are so many Google devices in our home. If you say, hey Google, to the hub in the kitchen, the one in the living room will still pick it up. Before you know it, you're talking to two Googles simultaneously. And although it was funny for the first few times, it became quite annoying very quickly. My dad is so obsessed with the Google Home setup that he has wired Google to control our living room lights. And the lock on our door is also automated by a smartphone app. I have since moved away from my childhood home, so of course I don't have this app installed on my own phone. Now, every time I go home, I need to be accompanied by someone with the app to let me into the house, or else I'm forced to resort to knocking on the door to alert someone to let me in. However, I love my dad, and we've all accepted these minor annoyances as one of his quirks. I thought this quirky love of technology was harmless. Until now. I don't visit home often enough to download the app onto my phone, so I have no way of entering the house without the app. This week when I returned for a visit, I had resigned myself to the tedious business of waiting for someone else to open the door for me every time I needed to enter our house. Matters were made even worse when my dad had his phone stolen earlier in the week, and my mom was the only one left with the app installed on her phone, effectively making her the gatekeeper to our house. Of course, my dad assured us that he had deactivated the app on his phone remotely when it had gone missing. Now I wish I hadn't taken his words for granted. It happened late in the night. I was sprawled in my bed, scrolling mindlessly and sleeping on my phone, when I heard something quite odd at around one in the morning. Clunk, clunk, clunk. It seemed to be coming from downstairs. Initially, I thought of my old dog, Pepper. Great, I thought drowsily. She must be getting into the garbage again. It was only after the clunking noise commenced a second time that I fully woke up from my sleep-fogged brain and remembered that our dog had passed away about a year ago. I had been conditioned as a child to expect that every noise originating from downstairs in the middle of the night had come from our dog, but now that was impossible. Clunk, clunk, clunk. The noises were uniform in both length and volume, methodical, rigid and unyielding. I strained against the silence for another minute, listening for the sound in the darkness of my room. I stared apprehensively into the inky blackness, my phone screen now blank and silent. Clunk, clunk, clunk. By now my heart was beating a little faster. I tried to rationalize the noise, running through options like, it must be the pipes, and raccoons fight outside our house all the time. 
But if I was being honest with myself, none of my rationalizations could truly explain the persistence of the noise. Clunk, clunk, clunk. There was a strange rhythm. An undeniable purpose that resonated from the relentless sound. There was no denying it any longer. This was coming from our side door. Someone, or something, was playing with the locking device. When I came to this realization, my breath caught in my throat, and my heart stuttered like a butterfly suddenly caught in a gust of cold wind. Someone was trying to get into our house. Someone who kept trying but couldn't understand that what they were doing wasn't working. That thought was somehow even more frightening than the alternative. This person was attempting the same thing over and over and expecting a different result. No sane or rational human would reach that conclusion after trying to get in so many times. And not only was this person attempting to break into our house at 1 in the morning, they weren't going to give up anytime soon. And again, clunk, clunk, clunk. By now I knew that I had to take some sort of action. I am embarrassed to say that I did not feel comfortable leaving my room, so I resorted to using the technology I had on hand. My phone. Shakily, in my panic I dialed my dad's number and waited for him to pick up. I took shallow breaths as I waited for the call to go through. When the phone started ringing from my end, I expected to hear it buzzing or ringing in my parents' room just down the hall. I had a brief and bizarre moment of amusement when I thought about the benefits of a smaller house with thin walls and how this might come in handy for once. However, when I heard the phone finally ringing, my blood ran cold. I had completely forgotten my dad's phone had been stolen. The phone was ringing from outside the house, directly on the other side of the side door. There was a pause and then the ringing stopped abruptly. I held my breath as I listened intently, my hands shaking as I held my own silent phone. Minutes seemed to pass. Clunk. Clunk. Click. Mike and I got engaged last year, chose a date, and proceeded to plan the wedding. Within a few weeks, we had booked the venue and other major vendors and started making payments. Everything was going smoothly until a couple of months before the wedding when Mike and I started sending out the invitations. This is where things began to get strange because my maid of honor, Tammy, who was also my roommate, suddenly wanted me to change my wedding date and her story kept changing. First, she told me her brother was getting married on the same weekend as my wedding, but I checked her brother's social media and he definitely was not. And then she said she needed more time to plan me the bachelorette and bridal shower I deserved. I told her I didn't want any of that, nor did I expect it. All she had to do as far as the wedding was concerned was show up. Stand next to me while I said my vows, and eat some really delicious barbecue and fried oysters. Mike and I had been saving for this wedding for years, since before we were even officially engaged. Both of us took on overtime and weekend delivery gigs on top of our regular full-time jobs. I wasn't about to tell all that hard work and thousands of dollars go down the drain because of a whim. Finally, I told Tammy over text that while I would love for her to come, I can't afford to lose the money Mike and I had already put down in payments. I assured her there would be no bad feelings from my end if she chose her brother's wedding over mine. Plus, some of our out-of-town guests had already booked flights, so yet another reason I couldn't postpone. Tammy left me on red, and I didn't hear from her by text or phone, somewhat to my relief. I had plenty of other things on my plate without trying to figure her out. Mike and I were worried about a mole in his neck because his family has a history of skin cancer, and so we were trying to get him scheduled for a skin biopsy. Also, the more I thought about it, the more I wondered if my friendship with Tammy had outrun its course. While I was still paying rent and utilities on the house we shared, 
I had basically been living at Mike's apartment for the last few months. Mike and I were going to move to a bigger apartment after the wedding. And I decided to hold off on changing my address with the post office until then. So I still went to the house once a week to pick up my mail. And whenever I dropped by, Tammy either was hungover from the night before, or played video games in her underwear. The kitchen and bathroom were biohazard horror stories of mildew, rotten food, and what appeared to be vomit. I was alarmed at first, but then realized it had always been this way. It hadn't been obvious when we saw each other every day, but a few months of separation made it glaringly clear that I had changed. The fact was Tammy and I had grown apart. In any case, our lease on the house would be terminated in two months. A big property development company had bought up the whole street and was going to demolish the neighborhood to put up fancy condos. The landlords had all got big six or seven digit payouts, and the renters had all to be out in two months. There were a few attempts to organize a protest among the neighbors, but as far as I knew, that went nowhere. Tammy's plan was to move in with her mom, though she was delaying the move to the last possible moment because they didn't get along. Between my job and tying up last minute details with the wedding, a month went by before I had time to drop by the house to pick up my mail. I texted Tammy beforehand to let her know so she won't be passed out with the deadbolt on. She had done this before. I fully expected her to ignore me, but to my surprise, she texted back immediately that she'll be home and that she had something important she wanted to talk to me about. It sounded ominous, but upon second thought, I figured she probably wanted me to help her get her own place. Tammy dreaded moving back with her mom, or she changed her mind about coming to my wedding, which I wasn't certain to take for granted that she was going to skip. What did happen, though, was something of my wildest dreams. Or, as it turned out, my worst nightmare. Promise you won't get mad at me. It was the first thing she said to me when I walked in the door. She handed me my mail, nothing but some bills and ads. I'm going to send you something, she said, fiddling with her phone. Okay, I thought. What now? I checked my messages and saw that she had sent me a video. It was a video of her and Mike having sex. It was a one-time thing, she said. I was stoned and he kept bothering me. I should have known better. I tried and tried to get you to postpone the wedding and this was why. I didn't know what to tell you so I waited and waited. I'm sorry. I'm so, so sorry. She kept apologizing, but I wasn't listening at all. The only thing that mattered was Mike had cheated on me. He had lied to me the entire time. I didn't go back to his apartment that night. The next day, I texted everyone that the wedding was off. Mike called, texted, and emailed, but I would not talk to him. There was nothing he could say that would make any difference. Every day I went to work and came back to the house. Tammy comforted me with pizza, beer, and cigarettes. We played video games all night long just like we used to do before I met Mike. I had forgotten what it was like to go to bed at 4am and wake up with a hangover and be late for work. But this was how I used to live and Mike had changed all that. He was what other people called a good influence on me. He showed me I could have fun without getting drunk. From him, I learned to love nature instead of being afraid of it. The first time I saw the sunrise in the woods was also the first time I didn't think about having a cigarette. He opened my eyes to the beauty of the world. Well, our relationship was based on a lie. I was back to being a degenerate now, was I? And Tammy was a bad influence on me. Was she? Well, so be it then. Alcohol and junk food numbed my pain. The phone beeped constantly with Mike's messages, which I deleted without reading, and then he started hanging out in front of the house. I would stand at the window with a beer and watch him sitting in the car. He looked sad and yet somehow determined. 
Tammy called the police and filed a restraining order against him, which I signed without reading. She told me Mike was stalking the house, and I believed her. There were strange noises in the night. My nerves were shot. I woke up one night thinking I heard someone come into the room. I screamed and screamed, hoping I was loud enough for the people next door to hear. But it turned out to just be Tammy, who had come in to look for a shirt she thought she had left there. In all that time, Tammy took care of me as if I were sick, which I suppose I was. She made the meals, or rather, she brought home the pizza. Went through the mail, paid the bills. I couldn't be bothered with the ordinary and necessary functions of life. I barely made it into work every morning and the only reason I didn't get fired was because my boss was a genuinely kind person. I'd invited her to the wedding and she knew something really bad must have happened when I cancelled on such short notice. The day of the wedding, or rather, the day that should have been my wedding day came and went. I asked for the week off from work and my boss gave it to me without question. I was obviously falling apart. On the last day of my week off, I woke up in the house alone. For almost the first time since I had come back, Tammy wasn't there. She texted me that she had to go to her mom's, and that she wouldn't be home that night. So I was alone, and not drinking as much as I usually did when Tammy was around, but also eating a lot more. As I lay there feeling gross and sorry for myself after gorging on cold, greasy pizza, samosas, and egg rolls, I decided to rewatch the video of Mike having sex with Tammy. Odd as this may seem, I had never watched the video in its entirety. That first and only time I had seen it, I had watched no more than a few seconds. It hadn't hurt too much, but for some reason, I wanted it to hurt as much as possible now. I had reached the acceptance part of the grieving process and was ready to twist the knife a bit. I watched the video over and over again, and each time I noticed some little detail I had missed before. Something bothered me, but I couldn't put a finger on what it was. Later that night, I realized something that made my blood run cold. Tammy said she asked me to change the wedding date because... Mike had cheated on me with her, but in the video, there was a bandage on the back of Mike's neck. It was from the skin biopsy he had done for the mole, which to both our relief turned out to be benign. But the biopsy was done after Tammy had started hassling me about changing the wedding date. In light of this inconsistency, other things now stood out to me, like how out of it Mike looked. He seemed almost somnambulant, whereas Tammy didn't look at all stone like she claimed. Something wrong? Tammy said. She was standing in front of me with her hands behind her back. I hadn't heard her come in at all. Wasn't she supposed to be at her mother's? As if she had read my mind, she said. People are so easy to fool, you know. They can be so stupid. The smirk slid off her face and her expression became stone cold. She took her hands out from behind her and showed me a gun. She lifted the gun and pointed it at me, pulled the trigger. It was as if a train had slammed into me. I fell on the floor, and as I lay there waiting to die, I saw Mike come in the room. I saw her turn to him, and before I blacked out, I saw him take her into his arms. When I woke up, I was in the hospital. The bullet didn't kill me, but let's just say I wasn't going to run any marathons anytime soon. Or even walk one. Did you ever make a will? The detective asked me. I stared at him. The thing was, I had made a will, and I had completely forgotten about it until now. This was years ago in the early... Heady days of Tammy moving in with me. We were both drunk one night, and to tell the truth, I may have been slightly in love with her. It was a schoolgirl crush that burned itself out fast enough, and later on, I would joke about it. But at the time, I was infatuated, and it had seemed like the funniest thing in the world to make a will that left to Tammy all my earthly possessions. Which was, at the time, 
twenty dollars or something. I did it online using some website. I wasn't even sure if it was legal and binding. Yes, I said. So? Who did you name as primary beneficiary? Tammy, I said. So, he said, Tammy would inherit all you had in the case that you died. I rolled my eyes. Come on, you really think she tried to kill me because of that stupid will? Do I look rich to you? It was a rhetorical question, but now it was the detective's turn to look amused. Or as amused as he could under the circumstances. Depends on what you consider rich. If she wanted to kill me for money, my son, she would have done it before I blew it all on my wedding. The detective gave me a strange look. Have you looked at your bank statements lately? No. I sighed. And if I may be honest, detective, there isn't much to look at. He gave me a piece of paper, a printout of what appeared to be my bank statement. Sir? I said, trying not to laugh. There's some kind of mistake. To be precise, there was $30,000 more in the account than there should have been. The detective shrugged. It's yours. We printed it out yesterday. Does the name group ring a bell? I shook my head. Nope. It's a property development company, he said. They thought the house you were living in on streets and others like it. Oh. As it turned out, the protest the neighborhood residents tried to organize against the property developers was not completely useless. To avoid a media stink, the developers agreed to a payout for the long-term renters and rent out a letter notifying the residents to that effect. I didn't know about any of that because I was living at Mike's place during those few months. Tammy got my letter because all my mail still went to the house. She filled out the documents to get the payment by faking my signature. Tammy's plan was to kill me after the payout had been made to my bank account, and then claim the money for herself using the will I had made that left everything to her. When she found out the payment would be made after my wedding, she panicked because my will leaving everything for her would have been automatically voided once I got married. This was why she tried so hard to get me to change the date. When that didn't work, she had the idea of recording herself and Mike having sex to get me to cancel the wedding. Which is exactly what happened. About that video, Mike assured me it was a one-time thing. He took full responsibility for what happened. While I appreciated his honesty, I still wasn't sure how I felt about it. Mike said he understood and wouldn't pressure me one way or another. I couldn't help wondering if he had cheated on me with other women besides Tammy. I wanted to forgive him, but I didn't know if I could ever trust him again. The uncertainty and suspicion that would hang over our relationship would poison everything we did. Was it fair to put him through that? Or would it be better for both of us if he got a fresh start with somebody else? Anyway, on the day Tammy decided to kill me, she texted Mike from my phone and pretended to be me asking him to come over. Her plan, the detective surmised, was to make it look like a murder-suicide. When Mike came in, she shot him but the bullet was deflected by his phone. Mike got her in a bear hug, took the gun away from her and tied her up. And then he called the ambulance for me and saved my life. I married my best friend in an intimate and lovely ceremony in the hospital room. Only our parents could attend because of the restrictions on the number of visitors. The nurses volunteered as my bridesmaids, my mother was my maid of honor, and Mike's dad was his best man. Mike's uncle, a pastor, was our officiant. There was nothing I could do about a dress as I was still bedridden, and frankly I didn't care about all that anymore. On the day of, the head nurse for the wing brought the most beautiful flower arrangements as her wedding gift to me. Her mother was a florist. It wasn't the wedding I had envisioned when Mike went down on one knee and proposed to me. It was so much better. 
It was truly the wedding of my dreams. Right now, I don't even know if this is the best course of action, but I feel that it's important to document what exactly has been happening at my house these past two weeks. I'm quite honestly terrified. However, I don't think I can go to the police or my friends with this information. My mom and I live in a simple two-story house. Just the two of us. We always get along great and spend a decent amount of time together. But ever since I got back from my friend's party, she hasn't been the same. I got home pretty late, maybe 2 or 3 a.m. I pulled my car into the driveway and entered the house as quietly as possible so as to not disturb my mom while she was sleeping. I quietly snuck through the darkness of my house to the kitchen to get some water and snacks to take up to my room. When I entered the kitchen, I turned on the light and, to my surprise, my mother was already standing in the kitchen. She's looking out of the window over the sink into the dark expanse of our backyard. Startled as hell, I asked her. Mom, why are you standing in the dark in the middle of the kitchen? And what are you looking at? It's a bit creepy. I tried to make some humor out of the situation, expecting another humorous remark to be made back at me, but she didn't respond. From where I was standing, I was unable to see her face as she was looking out of the window. It was hard to get a read of the situation and what exactly was going through her mind, so I speak up again and change the subject. Well, the party was chill. I left kinda early since all the people I actually cared about left. I said as I grabbed what I needed from the fridge. Still a bit curious and worried about her, I asked. Hey, are you okay? She responds to me without taking her eyes off the yard. Yes, okay. But the way she said it felt off. She said it in what seemed like an excited, cheery voice. Like she was accepting an invitation or proposal from someone that really excited her. It felt completely inappropriate for the mood and setting we were in. It's hard to explain well. From all of the horror movies I've seen, I knew that approaching her was not really something I should do. And honestly, at the time, her answer was good enough for me. I took my snacks and went up to my room immediately to sleep leaving the lights in the kitchen on for her to finish, whatever she was doing. The next morning I woke up to the smell of breakfast. This was normal as she usually cooks breakfast for me on weekends since she's in no rush to get to work. I come downstairs and greet her with a good morning as I pour myself some juice from the fridge and take a seat. She responds with a good morning sweetie. She seemed completely back to normal. I was relieved. I didn't know what happened last night. I didn't know if she was being emotional or if I was overanalyzing it. But I was ready to move past it. She turns around from the stove with an omelette and some potatoes and begins to plate my food. She asked me how the party was and if I slept well. I was going to mention that I already told her last night, but decided to just leave it. It was good. I left kind of early since all the people I actually cared about left. I replied with the same explanation as yesterday. I see. Well, I'm glad you didn't stay the whole night because then you wouldn't have made it for breakfast today. It seemed like she didn't notice that I gave her the same answer as the previous night. After a bit more chatter, we sit down together and begin to start eating breakfast. As I cut into my omelette and raised the fork to my mouth for the first bite, I noticed something strange about the piece I had cut. I looked closer and noticed something shiny with the slightly runny insides of the omelette. I took it out with my hand to see that it was a small sewing needle. Small enough to where it would be almost completely undetectable until it was too late. My heart started to beat fast as I asked her, Mom, what is this? I hold the needle up and show her what I found in my food. This? This was inside my food. After seeing it, her face looked concerned. She immediately apologized and stressed to me over and over again about how she had no idea how it got inside of my omelette. I'm so sorry. You know I would never knowingly do something to hurt you. She says to me as she gives me a hug. 
Don't eat that anymore. I'll make you a whole new one. By that time, I had lost my appetite, but she was able to convince me that it truly was an accident. I honestly started to feel a little bad for her, even humoring the idea that she did it on purpose. It was just such a strange occurrence that I had to wonder if there was any malicious intent behind it. The rest of our day continued normally. We laughed a lot, watched some of our favorite movies, gossiped, and then ended our long day with our usual good night. I went to bed that night at around 10.30 p.m. I was a little kid and I was deathly afraid of the dark. So my mom bought two night lights and put one in my room and one in the hallway. Well, I don't use one in my bedroom anymore. We for some reason have always continued to leave one in the hallway. I guess we were just used to it being there and never had a reason to not have it there. Later on in the night, I woke up thirsty and drank from the glass of water on my dresser next to my bed. In the process of doing so, I noticed something odd. Under my door, I could see the familiar glow of the nightlight. However, the glow was being partially covered by a shadow. I could tell that someone was standing right outside of my door. This was unnerving enough to make me do absolutely nothing but stare for one to two minutes. The shadow never shifted. Not even slightly. After some time, I called out towards the door. Mom? Without hearing any response, I see the shadow begin to move slowly and quietly back towards the direction of my mother's room. The next morning, I came downstairs to breakfast again, slightly tired. After the shadow incident, I was unable to sleep well for the rest of the night. I couldn't shake the feeling that I was constantly being watched. Immediately, I asked about it. Mom, were you outside of my room last night? At like 3 a.m.? Ignoring my question, she says to me, Remember when you were younger and you would let me brush out the curls in your hair? We should try that again. Come on. She beckons me towards the kitchen sink that was already slightly filled with water. I notice some conditioner and a brush on the counter as well. At this point, I was reluctant. After weighing the evidence of what has happened to me since the night of the party, I think anyone would be reluctant, but somewhere in me, it felt ridiculous to imagine that my mom was suddenly an enemy. I figured that I was overreacting and decided to let her take care of my hair. I sat down, leaned back, and put my head over the sink, looking up at her and the ceiling as she began to condition and detangle all of the knots I had in my curly hair. I had forgotten how good it felt to have my hair maintained by someone. After about 25 minutes of conditioning and talking about random stuff to pass the time, she tells me it's time to finish up. I felt my hair and was surprised with how smooth and hydrated it felt. She began to rinse my hair with the spray nozzle of the sink. After rinsing most of it, she tells me to stand up and put my head face first into the sink so that she can finish the last bit of rinsing on the back of my head. We continued our conversation as she rinsed my hair, but while I was in the middle of talking, I felt a sudden, hard grip dig deep into my hair. Suddenly my head is thrusted into the water that filled the sink. I immediately began to panic. I was being drowned. You would be surprised how absolutely weak you feel in a situation like this. Your mind is in a state of panic while someone has their entire weight over you, holding you down by the back of your head. My arms alternated between flailing around and trying to push myself up using the edges of the kitchen counter. After what felt like ages, the grip released, and I instantly raised my head out from the water, coughing and trying to catch my breath. I turned around viciously and stared at my mother. What the fuck are you doing? I yell, trying to regain my balance. She begins to laugh and point at me with one hand while the other slaps her knee over and over. I got you. You should have seen your face. I stared in disbelief. My unhappy reaction was obvious enough for her to stop laughing and look at me with a concerned look. Oh, sweetie, don't be such a bad sport. It was just a joke. She walked towards me with a hugging motion. 
I maneuvered myself away from her, backing up cautiously with the same cautious look on my face. I was scared of her. That was not my mother's kind of humor. My mom would never take a joke so far. Not far enough to risk hurting me. This was the point I knew that something was wrong with her. That was the point where I wasn't even sure if that was my mom anymore. From that point on, I was distant. I would only talk to her when necessary. I started skipping breakfast and dinner while staying in my room more. The nights where she would stand outside of my door continued. It happened every night at around the same time. Every night, the shadow under my door would disappear after some time. I was on edge a lot more. I started leaving the house more often and staying at friends' houses when I could, as long as it meant that I could stop spending so much time in the same house as her. She stopped going to work. Instead, I would always see her out in the backyard during the day doing random things like digging holes, stabbing the grass with a trowel, or standing on the grass talking to herself though I was never able to hear what she was saying. But what happened to me last night was something I'll never forget. Before going to sleep, I remember praying that I would be able to sleep through the night peacefully without waking up, as seeing her shadow from underneath the door always makes me deeply uncomfortable and scared. To my misfortune, when my eyes opened up to the darkness of my room, I realized that I had woken up in the middle of the night again. I slowly bring my eyes to the bottom of my door and see that she is there again, standing on the other side of my door silently. I lay my head back down and try extremely hard to sleep, but given the conditions, there was no chance that I was even close to sleeping again. But this time, I heard a knock on my door. One, two, three. Three soft, spaced out knocks. After that, it was dead silence. I laid there deeply terrified. Why was she knocking this time? Why now, after all this time? My mind was racing. Then a realization entered my mind that frightened me to the point where I was barely able to move. My door doesn't have a lock. Since I was a kid, it never had a lock. The only barrier left that prevented access to me didn't even have a lock. I heard the knocks again. One, two, three. I immediately hid my head under my covers, returning to the child instincts that kept me safe from the monsters all those years ago. However, this time, I knew this wouldn't keep me safe. I heard the door slowly creak open. My eyes closed tightly shut as I hid under my blankets. I listened for footsteps entering my room, preparing myself for the worst. But there were no footsteps. Did she give up? Did she open the door and just leave? Is she still standing there now? All of these thoughts crossed my mind. Not knowing the answer was only scaring me even more. I laid under my blankets and listened. I listened for what felt like five minutes. The silence was immense. I had no idea what was happening or what my fate was. I continued to listen. Silence. Then I heard a flurry of pitter-patter. It was going inhumanly fast and I could hear the sound of contact being made with the floor. And then the walls and then the ceiling. It was all around my room. My heart sank. My eyes were closed so tightly shut that it physically hurt. Is she on all fours? Is she just running that fast on her feet? How is she going around my room like that? Is this where I die? These were the last thoughts I had before I lost consciousness. I don't know if it was induced by a panic attack or stress or what, but I do know that I'm mostly glad that it took me out at that moment. I woke up the next morning to everything in my room being knocked over and in disarray. It was nowhere in sight. Did it leave? Is it in the house still? I still do not know. 
After finally getting the courage to leave my bed, I was able to get a chair and prop it up against my door as I typed this. I don't know who I should talk to or where I should go, but I do know that I will not be staying another night here. I haven't heard any noise from within my house since waking up. I'm posting this here because I have a feeling that this is the only place where people will believe what is happening to me. I'm going to take the chair off of the door and make a run for it. I still haven't heard anything outside of the door, so the coast seems clear. I will make it out of here, and I will never come back. Now, I am not sure about you, but I am someone who needs to do stuff in the middle of the night. When I was younger, I was knitting or doing the dishes, and when I was even younger, it was reading or drawing. When I got my first car, it became driving. It was not a continuous thing. I didn't drive every night. I would do it for a number of weeks, stop for a little bit to do something else, and then pick it up again. I'm not sure why I did this, just happened for some reason. It was around the month of March when it did. I had just lost my father and was depressed and bored out of my mind due to the fact that I had not seen a lot of my friends in a while. My wife was out of town for business and I was home all alone. I didn't have work in the morning but I had gone to sleep very early, so when I was awakened from the empty void of sleep. I wasn't entirely displeased. I turned the light on. The house was quiet, the only sound being the ticking of the clock in the other room and my now awakened cat purring. The TV was on, the volume very low but showing an episode of Gilmore Girls. There were countless things to do. I eyed my copy of Children of Dune and thought about picking it up. But my eyes were far too heavy for me to consume a page of literature. I was thirsty, I noticed. My throat was aching for a drink. Not one of water, though. The sweet liquid I desired was a Coke. I didn't have any in this house, and for some reason, I wanted one desperately. This was a thirst that could not wait until sunrise. This needed to happen now. I got out of bed and walked out of my house. I got into my car and drove out of the driveway. The gas station I wanted to visit was one that wasn't excessively far away. It was only two miles or so and it did not take me long to get to it. In the inside was a multitude of aisles. There lay my desired drink. I decided to get a tank of gas along with my drink and soon found myself exposed in the open night, waiting for my tank to be refilled. It was then that I noticed the sounds of feet scuffling against stone. Across the street was a woman, nude and dancing. In any other circumstance, this would be a welcome sight. But the way she moved was as if her arms and legs were broken, and each step broke them more. She bent and bowed at odd angles, would jerk her arms and legs side to side, and then would shake her head inhumanly fast. She would occasionally get closer to me and then back further away. My tank finished filling and I put the nozzle away and got into the car and started in. Then there was the sound of loud footsteps coming quickly. I saw the woman suddenly turn her head toward me. And then she... She bent backwards with her face towards me running towards my window. Just before she got close, I slammed my feet on the gas and drove away. I ran rather than walked to my door, and as I put the key into the door, I swear something was watching me. I went back into my room and closed my door. I somehow fell asleep with the lights back on, and when I next woke, I swore that what had happened was a dream. I stayed in bed, gazing up at the ceiling for a bit, laughing for a moment about my foolishness. I must have never awoken the first time, and it had all just been a dream. For a moment, my fears were gone, and I was able to breathe a bit easier. I stretched and my arm touched something cold on my desk. 
It was a soda can. I then realized what had woken me up. The sound of something hitting the window a few feet from my bed. Unable to move, I stared at the window, feeling something wrong. I got up, painfully aware of the loudness of my footsteps. I opened one of the window blinds, and on the other side, it was her. The woman I saw across from the gas station. Her face was against the window, skin as pale as the white moon. Her features were smudged against the glass. Her eyes were wide. Like a spider, she rolled up from the window and disappeared from sight. When I was young, dolls used to petrify me to such an extent that I couldn't even do simple things like go to the bathroom if one were near me. But it wasn't just because I didn't like the way they looked. No, it was because they would come alive whenever I was alone with them. I remember when it first happened. My mother had received this pair of dolls from one of her work friends. Two Indian dolls. One was slightly bigger than the other and I hated them the moment I laid eyes on them. My mother bought this small rocking chair that the bigger one could sit in, and the smaller one was able to sit on the other's lap. How I loathe those dolls. Anyway, cut forward a couple days and my mom was gone at work while I stayed home to watch the house. We had two dogs, but for whatever reason, they didn't seem to realize nor care about what was happening. I was sitting in the living room watching TV when I thought I saw the bigger of the two dolls move. They were sitting on the mantel in front of the wood stove, and my adolescent eyes caught the slight movement of its plastic head. I was, of course, terrified, but also curious as to if my phobia was just causing me to see things that weren't really happening. I stared into the doll's glossy eyes and watched without blinking for any other signs of movement, but there were none. That is, until I was about to look away. As my eyes drifted back towards the TV, I could have sworn I saw the doll's eyes blink. What need would dolls have for blinking fake eyes? What would have been a thought of mine now, but then, as a kin, it never really crossed my mind. Nevertheless, my heart skipped a beat as my gaze returned to the bigger of the two dolls. It didn't move again that day, and by the time night fell, I had almost completely forgotten about it. That night, I slept peacefully, completely without incident, but the next day was something else entirely. Once again, my mother was gone at work, and I was in the basement on the computer. The computer desk sat against the wall that placed you facing the opposite direction of the stairs. I often played games for hours at that desk while I awaited my mother's return, but that day, something nightmarish occurred. While I was sitting at the desk, I heard a strange clicking sound. I thought it may have been one of the dogs upstairs. Their nails often made a clicking noise against the wood flooring of the kitchen when they walked to their water bowls, so I ignored it. Besides, the house was older, and there were plenty of indescribable sounds that happened daily. Then, I heard the brushing of an object against the carpet of the basement, I swiftly spun around in the computer chair, hoping to see that my mother had snuck down the stairs. Instead, I caught a glimpse of a tiny moccasin disappearing behind the pool table. At first, my mind didn't, or rather, couldn't register what I had seen. Maybe I didn't see anything at all. For whatever reason, I decided for the latter and turned back around in my chair, simply ignoring the oddity I had just experienced. I was a kid after all, and that kind of imaginative stuff came and went like the wind. I went back to playing my game, not a care in the world. I had probably seen the cat or something. He wasn't the sociable type, but sometimes he would come out and watch me do stuff when I was at the computer. Good old Smokey. Anyway, I played on without worry. Soon I realized I had completely failed to check the time. It was getting quite late, and my mother still wasn't home. 
Where is she? I wondered, but then I heard it again. That strange clicking noise like someone tapping against glass, only this time, it was right next to my ear. When I turned to look, there, sat on an amplifier for a guitar, was the bigger doll. It wasn't looking at me, not at first anyway. It was staring at my computer screen. Its eyes were unnaturally realistic, almost like they were human eyes. I froze in place with my eyes fixated on the patterns of its cloth dress. It was just sitting there. No movement, but I was too afraid to do anything about it, at least until its head turned in my direction. Those bloodshot eyes were piercingly horrific. I admit I yelled, maybe even screamed. I can't remember. I only remember jolting out of the chair and sprinting for the staircase, nearly tripping over a cat toy in the process. And when I attempted to climb the stairs, it was like when you have a dream where you move like you're stuck in mud. I fell to my hands and knees and dragged myself up them, one step at a time. I felt as though I was being pulled the opposite way, being paralyzed by the mere presence of this sinister doll. I looked down the stairs and it wasn't there. Maybe I had imagined the whole thing, but then a shadow appeared. The small but looming shadow slowly approaching the base of the stairs and suddenly the doll's small head, fitted with jet black hair, appeared around the corner inching ever closer to the first step. I thought I was done for. I couldn't move fast enough and this menacing little thing was crawling quicker than I thought possible. It got closer and closer to my feet. Then it said something. A doll's stomach is bigger than you think. Its voice was like one of those pull string doll voices and I nearly passed out from the shock. I couldn't get away. What are you doing? Came a familiar voice. The voice of my mother. She was standing at the top of the stairs and when I looked back in the direction of the doll, it was laying at the bottom of the stairs. My mother was as concerned as any parent would be, but she seemed more interested into why the doll was downstairs and not on the mantel. I told her what had happened, but she obviously didn't believe me. And it got to the point where I wasn't sure if I believed it either. But then, more things started to happen. The next occurrence. I was in the shower. I heard the door open with a hair-raising creak, and unfortunately the curtain wasn't one that allowed you even a modicum of visibility to the other side. I stood still and listened, but no further noise invaded my privacy. I thought, maybe the dog is just curious. Although, I could have sworn I closed the door all the way. Regardless, I started to wash the soap out of my eyes, and after I had finished, I looked down near the faucet to be met with a sight that almost caused me to slip and fall. Peering in at me, from the corner of the shower curtain was the little doll. It giggled like a child and scurried away like a rat. I didn't hear the door close, but I remained in the shower holding both ends of the curtain tight until my mother got home. Luckily, she had only gone to the store, so I wasn't in there long. I was becoming increasingly worried. I even started having nightmares. Horribly twisted visions of dolls in every room of the house chasing me to no end. Things only got worse from there. I was laying in bed one night, unable to sleep. Every sound startled me, sometimes even my own breathing. I resorted to pinning my face against the wall and using a small hole for fresh air. That's how scared I was. I finally managed to get tired enough to fall asleep, reaching the point of total exhaustion that forced my eyes to close whether I wanted them to or not. When I relinquished my faculties over to slumber, I rolled over onto my back, but my bare skin felt not the comfort of my mattress because the sensation under me was hard like plastic. I didn't even get a chance to react before something bit into my shoulder with immense force, and I cried out in pain. Only then did I hear the malevolent sound of giggling coming from my bed, and when I jumped up and turned the light on, there it was. 
The little doll flapped against my mattress. I shouted for my mother, and when she flew into my room with a righteous fury for having been woken up, the doll was as dormant as ever. Stop playing these games, she shouted at me, and when I showed her the bite mark, she claimed that I had just scratched myself too hard in my sleep. I didn't know what else to do. Even when I would go to my father's, his styrofoam heads would roll into my room at night and nip at my ankles like hungry piranhas. But he never believed me. Bug bites, he'd say, and it was always my word against his. I told everyone I knew about what was happening to me, but not one person took me serious. Whenever I was in a room with a doll, I could feel its intensely negative energy, oppressing my every emotion. Its eyes would watch me as I walked, but no one else seemed to notice. It got to the point where I had enough. One night, I grabbed the two dolls in my mother's house and threw them outside into the ill moonlight. After which I grabbed a shovel and buried them deep underground. For kids' standards. The whole time they were laughing and saying, We love the taste of your blood. And, don't worry, we'll make sure you're never alone again. I wasn't worried about being alone. I just didn't want to be plagued by these diabolical entities any longer. My mother questioned me the next day, wondering why I had dirt under my fingernails and if it had anything to do with those dolls. But I said the dogs must have done it. Sorry, pups. By the will of something equally as foreign to me as this phenomena with the dolls, my mother believed me and that was that. Three days came and went, and I was starting to feel like I was free of this horrendous anomaly. That is, until the fourth night. I was laying in bed, much like the time before when I heard a curious, but infernally familiar sound of clicking or tapping against glass. I didn't have to think for long to me to know it was coming from my bedroom window. I stood up carefully and slowly and creeped my way over to that potential frame into hell. I lightly and cautiously gripped the edge of the curtain and pulled it away just enough to see out of the window. But it wasn't a matter of me looking out of the window. It was a matter of the demonic, bigger doll staring back at me with the froth pouring out of its all too realistic mouth. I reeled away from the window and gasped. My breathing became rapid and short and my nerves turned to ice. The tapping continued. I even heard the giggling that I assumed was coming from the smaller doll from somewhere outside. They must have unearthed themselves, although taking a while to do so. Obviously, I was horrified. I wasn't even able to cry out in terror. I was like an image frozen in time. A still frame depicting a boy within mere inches from the grasp of his lifelong fear. To make matters worse, the doll at the window began whispering with a guttural, almost gravelly voice. We just want another taste. I didn't know what to do or say, so I instead, I left my cowardice consume me, and I bundled up in my blankets. In the corner of my bed, I didn't sleep much that night, and my mother could tell because she asked me about it the next morning. What's wrong? She asked sweetly, but with a hint of scrutiny. I had a nightmare, Mama. I remember saying, although it could have been different, the dolls again? She inquired in the mere words, sent a shockwave down my spine. Yes, Mom. I had a dream that they were at my window trying to get in. Honey, that's an awful dream, but you must know dolls aren't real. Well, living ones aren't. You have nothing to be afraid of. Her smile at the end was reassuring. If only she knew that the dolls were staring right at me during the entire conversation from the kitchen window behind her. Eventually, I had to start a routine of making sure all doors were locked every time I was alone or if anyone wasn't in a room with me. It went on like that for quite some time, and for the most part, nothing disturbing happened.
apart from them being at my window every single night. But not all things always go as planned. I began to wonder as to why these two particular dolls had it out for me. The styrofoam heads at my father's house didn't seem to follow me further than the front door, but these two... They were different, and unfortunately for me, they were smart. One fateful and regrettable night, I had been falling asleep in the car coming back from visiting my aunt's house. I awoke in my bed later on, and it wasn't because of tapping on the glass. It was because of the slight pressure I was feeling on my chest. I opened my eyes, only a crack, and saw both dolls sitting on my body as my mother would have placed them in the rocking chair on the mantel. Their eyes were glowing like a hellish wildfire, or even of that of a demon. I tried my absolute best not to alter my breathing or to make any kind of change that would notify them of my being awake, and I swallowed a massive lump in my throat. To this day... I cannot forget the words uttered by the bigger of the two dolls that night. We know you're awake. Followed by more childish giggling by the smaller doll. I still didn't move. I knew I was sweating and visibly so, but I just couldn't will myself to get up. However, my mother, bless her heart, saved me. Without warning, she burst into my room and turned the light on. The two dolls went limp on my chest like some twisted version of Toy Story, and my mother, of course, immediately noticed them. I thought you said the dogs did something with these, she asked with a strangely aggressive curiosity. Mom, these dolls are trying to hurt me. They scare me. Please take them away. I vividly remember my plea to her. I came in here because I heard giggling. She exclaimed as she peered around the room. It was the doll, Mama. The smaller one. She looked at me and to this day, I believe she must have seen the absolute fear in my eyes because she quickly snatched them up and took them away. Nothing more happened that night. The next day I asked her what she did with them and she said, I took them to the landfill this morning, sweetheart. They had always creeped me out since they were given to me, so it was easy to get rid of them. Oh, okay was all I remember saying. And from that point on, there was never another incident. Yes, dolls still came alive, but they were never as malicious as those two were. It's been years and years since then. I've mostly been able to avoid coming into contact with anything inanimate or doll-like, and I've even found some of the ones weren't hostile to me. I asked my mother why she didn't get rid of them sooner. After the bite incident and she's son. My friend, the woman who gave them to me, passed away shortly after and I didn't want to just toss her gift out. However, I always hated their eyes. They seemed... too real. I agreed with her and went about my day after that. Tonight, 18 years later, I still have the phobia of anything resembling a human in nature, but is inanimate i.e. dolls. I've been able to maintain a level of composure despite this fear and the strange thing that happens to any doll I'm alone in a room or otherwise with. But lately, as of the last few nights, I've been hearing tapping on the window of the bedroom in my home. I'm much too afraid to get up and look outside and a part of me wonders if it was a tiny moccasin I saw earlier out of the corner of my eye disappearing behind the couch instead of an odd shadow. I won't tell you anything more about my phobia, but I will say this. I just heard a voice coming from outside my window. It sounds like one of those old, pull-string toy voices. It said, We could never forget the way your blood tasted. Dallas sat on a wooden stool, nursing his three fingers of whiskey. The ice in the drink had long since melted away, leaving only a swirling golden mixture. He gripped the glass, hoping some of the leftover moisture would soothe the cracks in his dry hands. 
the whiskey in was just for show. He didn't drink on the job. The bar was low lit with amber lights that reflected the dark wood paneling. Colorful bottles of spirits filled the shelves. Old country music emanated from the 1950s style radio at the end of the bar. The holes in the radio's fabric and scratches on its dial would make you believe that it had been involved in some of the fights it had watched over the years. Regardless, it still sung its old school country tunes. This place had the same routine that all the other underground holes Dallas had been to. A dive bar smelling of dirt and cheap booze. The day shift workers would come in to shoot the shit until they had to go home to their wife or girlfriend, leaving only drifters and drunks to sit in miserable silence, or wanting to start a fight. Dallas was waiting for that last part, the part where he could light a cigarette in the corner and get out of his seat. Dallas looked down to his chest pocket to remind himself of the Marlboro Blues. Five cigarettes left. One was needed for leaving. That was a tip his grandfather had taught him. He could hear him in the back of his head now. You always have to leave in a cloud of smoke. They can't track you that way. It'll leave them gasping for air. That left four cigarettes to be enjoyed at his leisure. Dallas lit one up and the lighter's flame revealed his face. He wasn't handsome by Hollywood standards, but he had chiseled enough features. The bones in his cheeks were high and his jaw was defined by a two-day stubble. Dallas's milky blue eyes reflected the smoldering tip of the cigarette, and the smoke ran over his thin six-foot frame. His jeans had holes in the knees. Dallas's brown denim jacket was kept together by hasty sewing jobs and the yellow button-up shirt below was wrinkled. Two men at the far end of the bar started getting in each other's faces and raising their voices. Dallas noticed it and tilted his gaze over to them. A tall, skinny man and a short, muscular man. The tall man pushed the short man and he fell backwards, crashing into a few bar stools. Dallas placed a mental bet on the shorter man. Not because he was muscular, but because the short man was significantly shorter than average. Probably had to fight tall guys like this all his life. The tall man laughed as he pushed the short man back down before he could get back up. This was the kind of fight Dallas came to these bars to watch. Sure, he got sucked into a few occasionally, but that was the price of admission. The show of violence was better than any song a musician could sing. The short man finally scrambled to his feet and took up a basic boxing stance. The tall man mocked the short man, mimicking his seriousness of the fight. He slapped at the short man and made fun of the way the short man protected his hen. Dallas relished the thought of the tall man being drunk on his own ego. This was the easiest kind of guy to take down. Guys like the tall man had always won by overwhelming odds. Something in them gave them no thought of failure. No idea in their mind that death or serious harm was even a possibility. The tall man launched a fist into the short man's head and the short man tilted his head downward. The tall man's fist hit the top of the short man's head and recoiled back. The shot hurt the tall man's hand much more than the short man's neck. Regardless, the skin still split on the short man's head, and blood ran down his buzz cut. A group formed around the conflict and started shouting at the men to fight. The pain in the tall man's hand sobered him, and he stopped laughing. Dallas had seen this a thousand times before in a hundred other bars. Always winning by natural gifts alone, never gave people the experience needed to fight a stronger opponent. They never had to count the odds or outthink their opponents instead of overpowering them. It made them easy pickings for guys like Dallas, guys that had ways to bend the rules to their favor. The problem was that bending rules was difficult. It took time and familiarity. By the time you knew how to bend the rules, it might be too late. You'll be chasing your tail by then and having to figure out ways to cover your losses. The short man threw a jab at the tall man's stomach to no visible effect. The tall man launched his open-handed shove into the short man's face, breaking the shorter man's nose. 
The short man's head rocked back. The short man stepped back into the bar, rocking Dallas's drink. He pressed a thumb into his nose and blew out the clumped blood and snot onto the wooden floor. His scalp was leaking blood down his face, and the skin around the cut was pulled outwards now. The face of the short man was looser now, like he was older and with wrinkles suddenly. Wrinkles was the wrong word only a moment later as the structure of his face changed into a perverted masquerade of a man. His brow line was pushed downward into a hard V. The backs of his ears became pointed towards the ceiling. The vampire looked back to the tall man with protruding fangs in his mouth and blood-red eyes. The tall man stood with a confident smile. Dallas finished his first cigarette and moved on to the second. The man next to him started to cough. The vampire got close to the tall man and ducked a hook from the tall man. He stomped down on the tall man's foot. The tall man's foot let out a sickening crunch and he yelled out in pain. The tall man swung up with an uppercut that gnashed the vampire's teeth together and split his gums. The vampire stumbled back and spit out a loose tooth from his now bright red mouth. He licked the blood off his gums in a hungry fervor. The tall man knelt down for over his injured foot. He planted his hands into the ground hard enough to feel the vibration through Dallas's worn boots. The sounds of the tall man's bones breaking and reforming time to the rhythm of the radio's song. His fingernails shot out across the floor as paws replaced his hands. The tall man's clothes tightened around the wolf taking his place, falling to shreds to reveal the growing mass of black fur and thick muscle underneath. The wolf's snout grew out of the tall man's face to reveal a row of bright white teeth dripping with saliva. The wolf let out a low growl and crouched low to the ground. Dallas blew out more smoke and was creating quite a cloud around himself now. He crushed his second cigarette and lit a third. The men around him had moved away. The bartender glared at him from across the room. He approached Dallas and motioned to Dallas's hand. Hey buddy, you need to put that out. The bartender's pointed ears and fangs were starting to show. The wolf lunged. The vampire reacted late and fell on his back with the wolf on top of him. Snapping jaws and teeth flashed in his face. Dallas continued to smoke like a train. Puff after puff. The men around him were wheezing and falling off their chairs. The other patrons around the bar were taking their attention away from the fights and turning it towards Dallas now. Pointed ears and black fur starting to appear among them. You hear me, asshole? The bartender sputtered between wheezing coughs as he backed away from Dallas. Put that shit out. Dallas blew more smoke into the crowd at the bar. They backed away, coughing and waving the smoke away. The duo fighting on the ground were both doubled over in coughing fits now. Can you believe people used to think garlic and silver would scare y'all? Dallas said, tossing his third cigarette and lighting his fourth. A vampire made a mad dash after Dallas and almost reached him when Dallas exhaled a cloud of fresh smoke in its face. The vampire collapsed to the ground instantly and began clawing at its chest, desperately trying to get burning air out of his lungs. Sanctified tobacco grown in the Pope's personal garden. I gotta say... This works almost as good as Granddaddy's crossbow, wouldn't y'all say? Dallas said with a smile as he exhaled more holy smoke. The bar's crowd made for the door. A few of them stumbled behind and fell down kicking and screaming. A few of them stopped moving entirely. Dallas looked around the now empty room before tucking his lit cigarette behind his ear. Its warmth and smell spreading across his face. He lifted himself over the bar in one motion. The bartender was looking at him from the ground, shaking and coughing, his blood-red eyes glaring in hatred at Dallas's standing figure. Dallas walked towards him and knelt down. He got close to the bartender and spoke in his usual soft South Texas drawl. 
I ran into a fella up in Tennessee that told me the big man himself is down here in Georgia. I don't know shit, the bartender said between breaths. The fella in Tennessee said that too. Dallas pulled a silver cross from around his chest. The bartender on the ground hissed and bore his fangs. How about now? Hickory stump. He's in Hickory stump. Dallas put the silver cross back under his shirt. He stood up and grabbed a top shelf spirit before meeting the bar at his hips. Body sized piles of ash now littered the floor in front of him. He pulled a road map out of his coat pocket with hasty notes and drawings scrawled on it. Dallas studied it, trying to find Hickory Stump. He grunted and patted his chest pocket, pulling out a pair of reading glasses. Hey, is Hickory Stump in Irwin or Turner County? The bartender wheezing slowed in response. I guess it doesn't really matter, huh? Dallas muttering to himself, not taking his eyes off the map. The bartender sat up, his coughing becoming less. You think actual Hickory grows in Hickory Stump? Seems like a weird name for a town. Dallas put the map back in his pocket, then rooted through the cash register, stuffing his pockets with loose bills and a mixture of change. He looked up to the gleaming bottles and pulled a bottle of tequila off the top shelf. The bartender leaned against the wooden counter of the bar, his voice returning from his formerly scorched throat. You're so fucked. What are you gonna do, boy? Smoke him out? Dallas put his reading glasses away and ran his hand through his salt and pepper hair, reaching for the dying bud of cigarette, tucked behind his ear. No, but I'll figure out a way to bend the rules. The rage in the bartender's eyes turned to begging terror as Dallas put the cigarette in his mouth once again. All he could do is watch as the sanctified tobacco burned away in front of Dallas Van Helsing's Wide, toothy smile. I'm writing this as a last ditch attempt. And I'm a bit rushed for time, so I'm sorry if this is a bit jumbled as it's almost midnight. Right, I need to give you some context. I've lived in New Zealand all my life, never staying in one town or city very long. But one thing I always told myself was I would never return to my hometown of Lathven, a small town situated right under a well-renowned ski field. I'm getting off track. One thing I was always curious about was the disappearances. Every night at exactly midnight, a shriek, scream, I don't know how to explain it. Something between a dying cougar and a wolf's howl, regardless of what it sounds like, it really scared the shit out of me as a child, but eventually we got used to it. One thing I never got used to, however, was the fact that every night, a few minutes after the ominous howl, a shriek could be heard. A very, very human shriek, but never the same. Sometimes it sounded young, sometimes old, and a person fitting the shriek was always gone by the time dawn rose. I never truly questioned it though, thinking maybe it was some animal that sounded human and could mimic. That alone was scary enough for a five-year-old, but what truly made it sink in was what was happening was when I was in year six, fifth grade for you Americans. My best friend Tim disappeared after a very loud childlike scream had been heard the night before. You see, he lived next door to me. That's how we met after our fathers went to a barbecue and started talking. After that, we were inseparable. I think I finally realized that day that what my naive self had believed to be people moving away wasn't the case, and that my parents had told me that to calm my young mind, that dawning realization was the day I vowed I'd leave as soon as possible and never return. But first, I needed answers. Quickly I found that no one was going to be volunteering any information, and certainly not my parents. I never did find out much from my snooping, 
But I think at some point or another, I lost interest and just accepted it. I grieved my friend and moved on after that. But the dread within me never went away. It never settled no matter how many nights I was awoken by screams. I didn't wake every night. As sometimes the screams were further or closer away. I was 18 when it happened. I jolted awake and was instantly on my feet when I heard the terrible howl. It was right outside, likely in our backyard. Now was my chance. I dashed over to my window, adrenaline pumping, but when I got there, nothing. I went to lay back in bed, heart thumping still when I heard a creak. It was barely noticeable, but it was there. Normally, I'd assume it was normal house noises, as there was a slight breeze outside, but this was not a normal night. The howl, or whatever it was, had never sounded that close. I sat up, too scared to move. I felt like a five-year-old child once again, all the fear bubbling back up. What happened next is something I'll never forget. In moments, I was out of bed, grabbing my baseball bat and storming into the hallway. My ears rang from the loud, pain-add, fear-stricken cry I had heard come from my parents' room. I ran in to see my mother huddled in the corner, curled in a ball and shaking, tears dripping from her eyes, her hollow eyes. I don't know what she saw, but after that day, it was never the same. I went to the police the next day to file for a missing persons, but I knew nothing would come of it. My father, the one who taught me to shave, the one who brought me my first beer, and my first suit. He was now a memory. A painful memory that I'd be reminded of every time I saw his face on the community board. Big red words reading missing underneath. We all knew that he wouldn't be found though. The police didn't even look anymore, because they never found anything. The last time I saw my mother was two days after my father was taken. She was being put in the hospital for a psych evaluation at my request. I will admit that I don't know how it went, because that day I had packed my bags and I was gone. I do still feel bad to this day, but do I regret it? No. After I left town, I had nothing but bad luck. No one would hire me, and I ended up homeless for a while. Then we flicked to almost a month ago, when I broke my vow and came crawling straight back to this hell. Anyway, this is plenty of backstory. Now, you may be wondering, how do I know I am next? This thing is methodical, and it seems to be smart. It goes down street by street, house by house, but never in perfect order. Probably to still have the element of surprise, but it never does the same house more than once every few months. It's almost like it farms us, and despite the number of witnesses, we still know almost nothing about this hellhound. Most of the witnesses are so traumatized in the moment that they bite off their tongue, or at very least are so deeply disturbed they refuse to talk about the topic and will shut down at the very mention of it. One new thing to note in this town is a new church of sorts. I haven't been, but it is more popular than Christianity in this town. It is settled in an old Victorian-style chapel just a few streets down from my parents' house. They call themselves the Silent Ones. They seem to worship the evil that stalks this town, but to join you have to have had a family taken. The ones who see this thing are considered chosen and make up the majority of the priests, hence the name. I refuse to step foot in those doors. I've never been a religious person, and I sure as hell am not going to worship the creature that preys upon this cursed town. When I got back, I was told by an old family friend, one of the town's elders, that my mother had been taken by it a few months back. I couldn't even say I was surprised. It got everyone eventually, even the members of the silent ones it seemed. The only people it didn't seem to take were pregnant. Couldn't have itself kill the source of its future food, could it? 
I've been here for just over two weeks now. I am living in my old home, and even the slightest noise wakes me in a complete panic. The last few nights I haven't even slept. Running on monsters and coffee. Every night I hear it loom closer and closer. Slowly taking people from my street again. And I just know I'm next. And if not, it will happen. Every house has one taken once every rotation. I have a few things to help me for when that creature comes knocking. I brought myself a hunting rifle. It's only meant for rabbits, but it's something. At this rate, though, I may end up just using it on myself. I'm so scared, guys. I can't let it take me, too. Here's what I know about this creature. It is lean and... Oh, no. No, 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 no. Not tonight. Please. I just heard its banshee scream from outside my window. It seems I've run out of time. Someone please help me. I just know this gun is useless. I'm going to post this now. I can hear something creeping through the house just out of sight. I've got my gun loaded and now all I can do is pray. If I don't reply to this post by morning, no, I didn't go missing. You know the truth. Wish me luck. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Before you call me names and blame for not supporting other people's work, please hear me out. I'm not here to hear your blaming, I need your advice. Because what just happened is freaking weird, and I have a really bad feeling about this. So, yeah, I've installed a jailbreak system on my Nintendo Switch. Why? Well, I remember buying it when Zelda came out, and it was massive. I've spent hundreds of hours in that game, discovering every secret, getting every item, and Mario was pretty awesome too, and some others, I won't lie. But then the big guys got greedy and started to flood the market with half ass crap for the price that could really bite. I mean, come on, who buys a game for $60 just to discover it's trash and there's no way to refund it? I've had enough when they started to throw the exclusive titles on PC and made them even cheaper there. Honestly, when Octopath hit Steam, I said, no more and pack the thing back in the box. I even tried to sell it online, but nobody would pay a decent price, even with the extra games and accessories. Yes, I've lowered a price down to a point when it stopped having any sense, but even then, only some choosing beggars tried to scam my deal, asking to sell it for half of that. As a result, my console collected dust all this time, up to last week when I've thought to take it out and play some newer games I had no intention to pay for. I saw a couple of videos on YouTube and some threads here on Reddit, so what the heck? Why not? Actually, it's harder than it seems. There's at least a dozen of different firmwares and you can easily brick the device if you have no idea what you're doing. And I clearly had not. So after watching all those simple and elegant tutorials, I discovered that there's more to that. As I followed some steps on the procedure, there were differences here and there. So I reverted the whole thing before I killed my Switch with my own two hands. But then, as I've been browsing for fresher guides, or maybe better explanations from people who made it, I found the one that was actually pretty easy to install. All I had to do was A. Download software and launch. B. Connect my console to my PC. C. Hit install. Sit back and relax. It was posted on one of the enthusiasts forum by a guy holding a nickname of Phone Tom 33 I remember it just because it was a cheesy pun. Well, the whole process took me like 30 minutes to do and voila. It booted with a pretty cool black and blue theme with some cool looking phoenix like bird on a wallpaper with small 
0.2.1 version number at the corner. As a late realization came in, the thought that I've wiped all I had on the device. Games, saves, screenshots, and I had no idea if I could revert the thing, but to hell with it. Not that I would miss those crappy buys from eStore. That evening, I've downloaded and installed a couple of titles and gave it a try. It was a success, even though two or three didn't launch at all. I blamed bad ROMs, and a couple more glitched from time to time. Same reason, I guess. But the rest were smooth and silky. I had my fun. Next morning, I decided to do a couple of missions in Astral Chain before my work call started. So I grabbed the controller and turned the TV on. The message popped up saying that the firmware was updated to V.0.2.2. I froze for a minute thinking, as I didn't recall enabling Wi-Fi after the install, but probably I did. I couldn't remember. Quick check of the settings showed that I actually did. My network and password were there. Yeah, I guess that's what you get when you play video games instead of a good 8 hour sleep. But what really got my attention was the game that wasn't there before. At the end of the list, there was a new thumbnail showing a yellow dog with long ears that looked sort of like Beagle or whatever. Grimacing. And there was a colorful text at the bottom pronouncing the name of the game. Crapper Pupper. I believe Nintendo's Parental Advisory Committee, or whatever they are calling that unit, would have a heart attack if they would have seen it. Especially after what I saw when I launched it. It was an absolutely stupid scroll shooter where you control a flying yellow dog who, we assume, hold a name of a pupper, and flies with his ass forward. All you have to do is avoid obstacles and kill enemies such as bees, butterflies, and evil cats and vintage planes by shooting them from the... That's right, the crapper. Sending piles of shit flying through the screen. It was poorly made. Felt much like somebody's Unity project rather than a formal game. There were no studio logos or credits and I would totally ignore and forget about it if not one detail that seemed strange to me. Each time you'd lose life, the screen faded to black, showing just the number of lives left and a short message. Just like your general tips and tricks on loading screens. Except the messages made absolutely no sense. One of them read, Was it necessary? Another was, Don't you dare speak to her like that. And there were more like, 1124. Gorgeous Fatum. And just... Paul. But it was 9 already, meaning I had to be present on daily video meetings, so I put the thing aside. Later on, being curious, I've googled the name of the game, and believe me or not, nothing's there. Yeah, I know what homebrews are, so I didn't think of it as something strange or weird. Just a lame game from somebody whose humor I was not getting. I've deleted the thing and forgot about it up to the next day. Thursday morning came with another edition. Firmware version updated to 0.3.0. .0. This time with a change log. Bug fixes here. Additional themes there. And surprise surprise, another game. At that point I've decided that was like the something special developer tried to pull to make people talk about it. This time, there was a picture of a cartoon hamster. Or was it a weasel? It was hard to tell because of the comic style of the artist. And the title read, 101-W-E-I-T. With the later figured out to be 101 ways to end it all. As the title screen showed up. Oh man, if the first game was pretty strange. This was absolutely fucked up. It was like a party game, like Jack in a Box type of thing, or, I don't know, Mario Party? Didn't play much of those. Point is, you compete against your friends, passing the controllers and different approaches to end your life. Yes, you read it right. It was an end your life party game, no matter how stupid it sounds. The graphics were not really detailed, but it definitely seemed that the thing had a budged. 
And I was really impressed by what they, whoever those they could be, did to controls. They squeezed everything they could out of Joy-Cons. I don't want to go into much of a detail, but there were a couple of levels. Like the one where you had to jump in front of the train. Player is supposed to hold Joy-Cons in each hand and make a swing at a last possible moment when the train comes. The faster the swing, the harder the impact. The more points you get. Or there was that one where you had to hold one pressed to your forehead and the other one represented the gun. And you had to pull the trigger and make a motion with your head at the same time. I tend to think of myself as a cynical person. I like dark jokes and cyanide and happiness stuff and horror comedies, but seriously. This thing was pretty fucked up even to my taste. So I've deleted it too. And before you ask, yes, I googled it as well. Same result. So I decided to get back to that page where I got the firmware in the first place and check out what other people think about this extra edition. There were a couple of update messages from PhoneTom33 and a couple of comments with issues and praises, but nobody mentioned the homebrew games. Oh, okay. Then probably nobody really found them that amusing or simply deleted them without launching. Was my thought at that time. I've played some more normal ones that evening and made sure to delete the 101 WEIT. Friday crawled in. It was busy all day. I had to make calls, fill in stuff, and it doesn't really matter at this point. Later that evening, I cracked open a cold one and grabbed a controller. I bet you've guessed what was there. A new update, and a new game. This time the changelog mentioned only that the issues with Xenoblade Chronicles DLCs were fixed, and the game name was Banker Simulator. The thumbnail contained a title and a stylized photo of a hand of a person wearing a business suit, with a dollar sign cuff link on a shirt, holding a briefcase with dollar bills sticking out of it. Well, I thought. At least this time it looks normal. So I've decided to give it a try. I'm not a big fan of financial strategies or anything goes here simulators, but I was curious at the time. As the game started, I saw the thighs of a man dressed in gray business soon. He was sitting on a brown leather couch. It was a first person view as if he was looking down. A smooth jazz music played in the background. I jiggled the controller a couple of times, but nothing happened. That was just stupid. What was the point? Then a tooltip popped up. Please take Joy-Cons in each of your hands. Okay. I did, and then it got to me. I had to manipulate each hand individually, so I did. The left palm of the banker dude had a smoldering cigar and the right one, a glass of brown liquid. I assumed that meant to be whiskey or something. And all I could do in this game was either smoke the cigar or sip from the glass. I tried to make him stand up or reach to a pocket. Just do anything so that game could start or whatever. But it was just smoking and sipping. If I'd smoke the cig or drop it beyond my vision, as well as drinking up whiskey or pouring it to the floor, the legs of a waitress appeared at the edge of my vision, meaning I could see only her ankles and high heels, and the voice actress asked, More whiskey? Or another cigar? My character replied with, Hmm. And either item reappeared in one of the hands. That was so dumb. No more hints or instructions. At some point, I thought the whole thing glitched, so I've restarted it a couple of times with no result. I was pissed at the game for being moronic, at myself for not being able to understand how it works, at that guy who patched it into update. So at some point, I just overturned the glass onto my character and ditched the lit cigar just onto those fancy Prada pants or whatever they are wearing. The scream started as the cloth must have catched fire, and when the waitress legs again... More whiskey? The screen faded to black with screams continuing to sound from my TV upstairs. 
And some lines of white text began to print. It burns. It burns. It burns. You get the point. I'm not a drama queen, but something there got me. I deleted the game, made sure I blocked the internet connection and settings, and went online to drop a message to the developer. There were no PMs on that site, so I left a comment in the thread. Hey, phone Tom 33 Thanks for your work and such, but could you please stop adding those stupid games to each update patch? They are plain idiotic. Thanks. It took him 20 minutes to answer. What games? Can you believe it? What a moron. Trying to be mysterious and all. The one about the shitting dog and that take your own life thing and this piece of shit called Banker Simulator. Those games. Two minutes later, some random user replied, Dude, are you high or something? There are no games. And somebody named Irwin followed. Yeah, there is no spoon, Neo. Get some sleep, noob. Yeah, what a bunch of jerks. Making fun of a man just because he's a newbie in their playground. Fuck it. I'll delete the whole thing tomorrow. That was what I thought when I went to bed. Yet Saturday came and I grabbed the controller automatically. I was bored and I slept the whole incident over. And it was my mistake as it was just then when shit hit the fan. I booted the console and was just about to launch some dragon builders to sink some time, but I've noticed there was yet another game I have no memory of. Except this time there was no thumbnail. Just a blank white square with plain black text of a title on it. I checked the settings. Wi-Fi was, as I left it, off and gone. I thought that probably it downloaded in background as I was playing yesterday. Or, specifically speaking, partially downloaded as the thumbnail seemed broken. I decided to check out if it would launch and let that be a fat dot between me and my experience with these updates. The title read, Mighty Mark and the Quest for Bone Morrow. Who the fuck comes up with stuff like this? The loading screen consisted of a black background and the main character running at the bottom right corner of the screen. He was a cartoonish dude wearing a purple suit, sunglasses, and a viking helmet plus a baseball bat strapped to his back. Well, the game loaded and I must say at that time it didn't look so bad. It has a nice starting screen, simple yet stylish 2D graphics and cool music, except that title made no sense, kinda looked friendly without noticing it, and to my surprise, it was quite a fun game. It was an action platformer where you controlled Mark in his adventure over the Broken Kingdom. The levels were varied, there were a bunch of mini games, you could collect coins and buy upgrades looked fun. I've actually spent a couple of hours and made it to World 3. I even started to like the voiceovers. The guy who voiced Mark spat out jokes and puns, mocking the enemies. At some point, I felt a crave to grab some food from the fridge, but to my surprise, as I've hit start, nothing happened. Mark just shouted, no time to rest, and I was forced to end the level without pause. That was strange, but you know, Maybe that's the devs and their sense of immersion. After a quick bite, I've grabbed the controller again. I must have lost the track of time as I was deep in the gameplay. I haven't played such a good platformer in a long time, but as the clock was counting down to midnight, and I was in World 6, it was a good idea to call it a night. So I've pressed pause to return to the main menu. I mean... I wanted to press pause, but nothing happened. My thumb didn't move. It felt like I caught cramps in my right palm, so I've decided to put the controller aside and warm it up a bit. Nothing. I just couldn't take my hands off the controller. I panicked. What if I blocked some blood vessel or moved clumsy and now my hand is paralyzed and I need some medical attention? Yeah, not the brightest thought, but... You weren't there, and I'm not a doctor. So as I winded myself up, I just began to wiggle my body furiously from side to side, trying to get rid of the device in my hands. 
At some point I succeeded, and the thing slipped and fell onto the carpet beneath my feet. What happened next? I have no explanation for this. I've immediately felt all the blood of my body leaning towards my temples, banging with pressure into my ears. Instantly it became impossible to draw another breath, and I felt my lungs burning. Dark spots and red circles started to dance before my eyes, and I heard the voice. Mighty Mark started to chant in his badass manner, Pick me up, pick me up. I was dying on my couch, straight out of nowhere just like that. And yes, the thing I did was irrational. I folded in half and picked up the controller from the floor. The very same moment I heard my body letting the air back in, with the heart pounding like as if I was the speaker on a rave party, I stared at the screen, completely horrified. What the fuck just happened? Did I have a stroke? Next thing I heard was, Alright, let's do this, from the speakers. And the game continued. I don't know how it would end if not less than four minutes later the clock beeped midnight. The game auto-paused, but the character didn't. He stood there in his idle pose, leaning from left to right with the bat in his hand. And I heard as follows. Alright, Mighty Mark says night-night. Let's continue our adventure tomorrow and crush some skulls. See you, fella. And you'd better be there. And then the switch turned off. I have no fucking clue what I have just experienced back there. I was never a believer. I don't believe in God, superstition, ghosts, or any of those tales, but I have absolutely no rational explanation for what happened yesterday. Today is Sunday. I ignored the thing the whole day and decided to drop you guys a message, as I don't know what to do. Do you think it's bad, or am I just being a wuss? Hold on. As I'm writing this line, I see a reflection in my monitor of my TV behind. It went on by itself. I don't want to turn and check. My name is Kat, and I'm a collector. I collect mostly stories of people experiencing the unusual been a busy few years. The following was copied from a letter I received by post a couple months back. No return address, just my name scribbled messing on the front of a yellowed envelope. I've had to change a couple of names and scrub the name of the hospital, but here it is. There's kind of a lot to unpack here, so I should probably start at the beginning. I know I shouldn't share this with a perfect stranger, but it may become important in the future. So I'll tell you I'm a 16-year-old female. I don't have much life experience, which also means I haven't had all that many work opportunities. That being said, around two months ago, I got my first job. I've been working at a local hospital in my town. Specifically in... I mostly organize files and whatnot. Not overly exciting, maybe, but it pays. It's much better than jobs some of my friends have, anyway. My best friend has told me horror stories from her job in fast food. I work a night shift, 10 p.m. to 3 a.m., which can be a little rough. Luckily, it's summer and I don't need sleep for school right now. The thing is, there's some weird crap that happens after midnight around here. When I first started, some other night shifters warned me that there may be some strange things happening and just to ignore them if they do. I've actually experienced a few of these events, and they scared the absolute pants off me. The first ones I had was someone we affectionately call Chainsaw Guy. Calling him that makes him sound a little like the antagonist of a slasher film, but it's really more of a description. So the first time I encountered him was actually only my second day without supervision. I was putting some old files in order when I caught something passing by the door out of the corner of my eye. I turned my head to see if it was my night shift supervisor, but I didn't recognize the man I saw. 
I knew he couldn't be cleaning staff since he wasn't wearing the hideous uniform. I may have forgotten to mention this, but the building I work in is actually across the street from the actual hospital where the patients stay. This made it highly unlikely that he was a lost patient. I actually wanted to ignore him since it's not my job to deal with intruders, but I also didn't want to be blamed for the loss of destruction of hospital property. I went to the doorway and said, in as polite a tone I could muster at 1am on a Wednesday, Hey, you can't be here. He didn't even turn around. He only muttered, Jameson, Walter, 9, 18, 21, chainsaw accident. Then he repeated it. He just continued mumbling and I had to raise my voice to be heard. You need to leave. This area is employees only. His mantra halted suddenly as he came to a jerking stop in the middle of the hallway. He turned around to face me slowly and I realized with a start that his shirt was soaked in blood. Then I saw his face and forgot all about his shirt. His face, if it can even be described that way, was a mess of bloody flesh and muscle dangling grotesquely from his skull. With one eye missing from its socket, I stared in screamless shock for a couple of seconds before a shriek forced its way from my throat. He shook his mangled head in apparent pain and bolted into the next open door. When I recovered from the initial shock, I realized that he was terribly injured and needed immediate medical attention. So I braced myself and followed him into the room, but he was gone, vanished into thin air. No one ever came to even check on me. The next night, I asked my shift manager about it. Ah, yeah. He said taking a drag on his cigarette. Just ignore him. He was absolutely zero help, so I instead asked another woman on my shift. This used to be the ER. My coworker, who wished to remain anonymous, said quietly. Before they expanded, I was a receptionist at that time. One night, a man was carried in by a group of what I assume were his friends. Seemed to barely have a face left. He died in the hallway on the way to surgery, the very hall you work in. Did he say anything before he died? I asked, morbidly curious. Yeah. He kept repeating the same thing over and over. Eventually, we figured out that he was trying to tell us his name, birth date, and how he got so terribly injured. He was saying, Jameson Walter, 9-18-71 chainsaw accident I finished I've seen him a couple of times since then and ignored him like my supervisor told me to old Walter ignores me right back but he's not the one I worry about that's an entirely different story and honestly I'm not sure I'm ready to tell it now or ever please don't tell anyone I told you about this place my story doesn't seem like much, but I get the feeling I was supposed to keep my mouth shut. I'll be sending you another letter once I get up the nerve. There's more you should know. I'm a little more worried that I won't survive this job. The letter ends here. The last two paragraphs are much shakier than the rest, with weird smudges like the writer had been crying. I've waited since then for a second letter, but received nothing. I worry about the girl who wrote this letter. I think that soon I'll have to take a visit to that hospital. Too slow, I thought. That's what my parents used to call me all the time. Not meaning slow as in the literal terms of speed, but metaphorically. I guess that was quite true. It was as if fate played a cruel game with me. Being a short, featherweight guy in his 20 years of age, I was slow in everything I did except for running. It was my one redeeming quality that landed me a scholarship, because in terms of academic prowess, I sucked. College had been good so far, though. I lived in the campus rooms. 
I wasn't sharing a room with someone else, so it was good for me to live in the ground floor of the dorms. Five minutes away from college, but being slow in the head didn't help me sometimes. Especially for everyday activities. Cooking took me more than two hours for a simple lunch. It would take me a couple days to notice the spilled coffee on my shirt, usually noticing somewhere in public. I was so bored that I used half the space under my bed for boxes and other shit. Also, I was always either too lazy or too slow to realize when my apartment needed to be cleaned. I would realize when the floor needed cleaning from how sticky my feet felt on it. But as with everything else, because I was slow, I was also meticulous with cleaning. Maybe too meticulous. I used a specific brand of soap for the floor so that the shiny wood would feel smooth on my feet for at least a week. Especially the first two days after mopping. It was one of those lonely, rainy days that I was too tired. I entered my very cold house and locked the door behind me. I left my bag next to the door. I took off my shoes and carefully placed them behind the door. I turned on the heater because I always made sure to keep it turned off while I was in class. The house today was too cold though. Saving money as a college student is hard. Too slow. I opened my fridge and shook off my leg a bit. Damn rain. It got in my clothes after all. Too slow. I took a package of yogurt and a spoon. I ate a couple of spoons, then found my pajamas. I turned to my door and hung my jeans and my shirt. My bed was situated near my window with a chair which I used as a table of sorts to leave my phone and other essentials on it. I soon went and plopped on my bed, almost stumbling on one of the boxes that was halfway through off the space under my bed. Too slow. I turned to my left took my phone and checked my messages. With the exception of a call from my dad and Linda, my sister, nothing else. I called my dad, but my call was sent to voicemail. I took my blanket and half covered myself as the cold was a bit too much today. What the heck is wrong with the heater? Too slow. Yeah, dad, just saw the call. I was in anatomy class, sorry. Please let me know when Linda will come by to bring the chicken pie. Love ya. I moved my hand instinctively to my left to leave my phone on the chair. My phone almost dropped on the floor. Strange. I don't remember moving my chair before I left my house. Too slow. I moved the chair close to my bed. I left my phone there and turned on my tablet. Putting a sports show to watch. It was almost sunset outside. The sun's sweet orange light giving its place to a darker sky and through my moving curtains, it looked almost magical. Too slow. Wait a second. That's when a weird, unsettling feeling covered me. A deep concern. I just realized a variety of things. Things I had already noticed but the information never settled in my head. The curtains were moving. I glanced at the window. The handle was broken and it was just slightly open. Almost not visible. Then it was the wetness still on my foot. I glanced at the hung clothes on the end of my jeans. No wet stamps there. I was wearing rainproof boots. How can my socks get wet? Unless... I felt a cold terror settling on my chest as I glanced at the floor of the kitchen. There were at least four wet footsteps of shoes and some of them were leading towards me. But the chair, the things under my bed. With a drowning sense of fear and panic, I noticed that a box was half peeking off of under my bed, which meant someone moved in. Someone who, in order to hide under my bed, had to move also the chair. Someone that, I was now certain, that would or would not wait for my sister to arrive, to do God knows what to me and or her. Too slow, I thought, 
as the fear and panic paralyzed me to aware of a presence under my bed. However, I took my phone with a trembling hand as I moved the chair a bit forward. I glanced to the window. With a swift move, I pulled the curtain, took position, and jumped from my bed on the chair and then on the inner ledge of the window, pushing it open. I glanced momentarily back and that's when I saw a pair of hands that moved from under the bed to my direction. However, the chair was in the way. The hands, one of which was holding a serrated knife, belonged to what seemed to be a man around his 40s. Dirty, wet, and with an unshaved face and wild eyes. Who was almost up from under my bed, but... Too slow. I said, smiling defiantly to the now surprised and angry invader. I jumped out of my window and barefooted. I did the only thing I wasn't slow at. I ran. And I survived. I am so tired of insomnia. Every night it's the same thing. I lie awake, unable to just drift off to sleep in my bed. I know I'm not supposed to use my phone at all when I'm trying to sleep, but I usually have a creepypasta playing in the background. But every night, sleep always teases me for what feels like forever whenever I'm laying in bed. It starts to get annoying at around midnight. Typically, every night around then, I'll fall asleep edging on before it suddenly goes away. I don't know if that's normal, but it's like a slow burn building to instant awakeness. Not a word. Sue me. It's like when you fall asleep in a chair and zone out for a bit and feel that scary dropping sensation. Only it's not as scary as that. Nothing about it is even scary. Not even the creepypastas, to be honest. It's a bad habit I got into when I was a teenager and I can't break out of it for some reason as an adult. It usually called me listening to whatever was supposed to be scary. Maybe I just liked someone talking when I slept. I don't know. I've been obsessed with horror since I was a child, so there's not a lot of things just words can do to scare me, if that makes sense. I wasn't exactly shivering under my covers in fear with the latest. I work security at night in an abandoned factory. You won't believe the rules I have to follow. Story I was listening to. But it did really help me lull off better than white noise. It's really just words at the end of the day. Nothing is really going to hurt you. You're just letting your brain feel some weird chemical response to the story if the writer is any decent. Sometimes I'll get a little nervous and turn the flashlight on my phone and check my room real fast. Nothing is ever there. I was just being dumb. It's honestly pretty funny considering I'm a grown man. Like, what am I checking for? Boogeyman? That was the situation last night. I was doing my usual terrible routine of listening to creepypastas and I once again got a little nervous. I picked up my phone to start checking. My eyes adjusted to the bright and unnatural light of my screen while I scrolled down to select the flashlight. Once I clicked it on and saw the room empty, I felt some relief when I saw my empty room. Nothing was unusual so I turned on the light and turned my phone face down on my bed. My world was suddenly just darkness once again, and the narrator's voice was losing its meaning. I was in a point of consciousness where you're just about to lose it. The world was drifting away nice and slow, and all I had to do was relax. What if there's a maniac in your room with you right now? Shut up, brain. Please just, for tonight, just shut up. What if there's a maniac and they just have been here for a while? I hate you so much. It's not even possible, dummy. I would 100% notice if someone was here with me. Remember that thing you saw on YouTube about the guy who had a homeless woman in his house? Kind of. Remember she would wait until he was asleep and then eat some food and walk around his place? Yeah, but that's not even scary because I could easily fight a homeless woman off. I would only get a little startled. You're doing a bad job. I'm basically already asleep. But what about the stories we don't hear about? What about the guys who do it and get away with it? 
think about it. They could be right here. My dumb brain managed to make me nervous again, despite how dumb I knew I would feel. I tiredly reached for my phone again. You're getting harder to sneak up on. I heard a dry voice say from behind me. Is it possible you remember? No, can't be. The voice was supposed to be a woman's, I think, but it definitely was not human. It was dry with a reverb. Like she was multiple people with the same voice speaking at the same time. I felt whatever it was behind me, and I wanted to scream, but the world had begun melting away. None of it felt real at all. I couldn't move at all, but that wasn't my main fear. It was the intense need to sleep at that moment. I was fighting it with every ounce of my strength just to keep my eyelids open, but sleep was pulling me in. I'll need to figure out whatever this is. The thing spoke to itself as I was drifting off. Before you become a problem for the others. When I closed my eyes, I figured I would die right there. But I was greeted with another sunshine once I opened them again. I didn't feel different at all. I felt refreshed, actually, and I didn't even remember it all at first today. I went to work just like usual and did my regular things until I randomly remembered while I was eating dinner. I'm not anywhere close to my bed right now, and I doubt I will be anytime soon. In fact, every light is on in my apartment, and I am checking and rechecking locks. Although I fear this may not just be an intruder didn't even feel real when I think about it sometimes, but then I remember how helpless I felt, and I don't want to risk it. It's going to suck going to work when the sun comes up with no sleep, but I have no choice for now. If anyone has suggestions, I am more than open. If I take this to anyone, I'll get put in a nut house, and I don't know if I would like that. Man, I am so tired. There's nothing I would rather have than sleep right now. I need to find a way to feel safe while I grab some sleep. Hopefully I don't slip up until I figure something out. I don't think I want to know what it looks like. I just looked in the mirror and I look like shit. My hair is unkempt and my eyes are sunken with dark bags beneath. I feel waves of emotion crashing into me as my body screams to me for just one thing. Please, just get some sleep. That's all you need, is a good night's sleep. Last year, in around the middle of October, when the weather was turning from a slight chill to a crisp shiver, and the fiery oranges and yellows of the leaves were dulling and falling, a group of friends and I found something in the woods that shouldn't have been there. To give some context, a couple months ago I went to take pictures in the woods with my class. I was on a field trip with my photography class to take pictures in the local forest preserve. As long as we stayed in the group with a teacher, we had free reign of the woods to take pictures from various angles. Our teachers soon got sick of a bunch of high school freshmen climbing trees and scaring each other, so they turned the assignment into a group project. Each group had three kids, and as long as we all joined a Life 360 and kept our location on at all times, we were allowed to explore to our heart's content. I was paired with two of my friends, Jonathan and Kat. We had two or three hours to kill, so we stepped off the main path and began to explore. It was a foggy day, and our photography unit was for Halloween movie posters, so the misty, autumn aesthetic was a perfect setting. Forts made of branches by children and fallen trees with moss growing were popular amongst the students, so we wanted to find something unique. In hindsight, those teachers were incredibly stupid for sending 20 or so teenagers out into the woods by themselves. Someone was bound to injure themselves, and unfortunately, it was me. Kat, John, and I took pictures as we explored, and then found a staircase leading to nowhere in the middle of a clearing. The concrete stairs were absolutely pristine, like they were recently built, but that couldn't have been right. 
if they were part of a scrapped construction project, there should have been more to it, like a foundation or a platform or even a support beam. We thought nothing of it and saw the perfect opportunity to take some unique pictures and hope no one else would find the spot after we left. Once we found the spot, we started taking pictures. I heard John mumble to himself. It would be cool if someone sat at the top for a picture. Oh dude, that would be so cool. I responded. Who wants to climb up there? Cue cricket sound effects. Cat broke the silence. I don't know, they are kind of creepy, aren't they? How they're just here alone? Well, yeah, but it would be such a cool picture. Then how about you, John? I offered. What? No, 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 I can't do that. I'm much better off taking photos from the ground. Well, you were the one that had the idea. A short argument preceded a quick game of bubblegum bubblegum in a dish, and I was the only one left. I groaned a bit, but I started climbing up the stairs. It took longer than expected to walk up 10 feet of stairs. It felt like 15 minutes before I reached the top. And when I finally did and looked around me, it seemed like everything was drained of its life. The once perfect stairs had cracks running along the steps and corners crumbling. I cut my hand on the rusty metal railing and the tree line seemed to wither in front of me. Everything was silent. The accompanying sound of birds ceased, and I couldn't hear the frigid wind that started blowing around me. What was worse is that I couldn't see or hear my friends below me. Guys, where'd you go? My own echoes were my only answer. John, Cat, this isn't funny. I scanned the dead tree line only to find nothing but husks of once lively pines. I was starting to get creeped out. Suddenly, a tall, lanky, humanoid figure peeked from behind a tree. When I say tall, I mean like as tall as the towering tree it was hiding behind. Its cold, glowing eyes seemed to freeze me where I stood. It stretched its long legs towards the stairs and moseyed halfway to me before I broke out of my sudden panic. I bolted down the stairs, skipping three at a time. It felt like forever until I reached the bottom. As soon as I reached the dirt below me, it turned to grass. All the sounds of the forest rushed back to me, and everything sprung back to life. Emery? What the hell? Kay's voice rang out. John's joined her. We were calling your name. Where did you go? What do you mean? I couldn't hear. Come on, we have to go. We're 20 minutes late and my phone's blowing up. Cat grabbed my wrist and dragged me out. As soon as we were a few feet from the clearing, I stole a glance back to find nothing but densely packed trees. The staircase was gone, as well as the 30-foot radius it stood in. It was like the clearing and staircase had never existed in the first place. I felt a pain in my hand seize as the cut healed before my eyes. When we caught up to the rest of the class, we weren't the only ones who were late. Other groups burst from the trees with their cameras as soon as we returned. Since there were too many students that arrived late, we got off without a detention. But our projects would have five points taken off when we turn it in. On the bus, I sat with John and Kat and we overlooked our photos. All the pictures of the clearing with the staircase disappeared and were somehow deleted from the recently deleted folder. John and Kat ruled it up to a glitch, but I knew that it had to be more than that. I was still confused about the whole event, but I wanted to forget about the glowing eyes on the shadowy figure from the tree line. The eyes that pierced through my skin and sent ice into my soul. We used a picture from one of the previous photo shoots before the staircase. The project earned a B plus and we took it. Cat and John wanted to go find the stairs again a few weeks later, but I didn't go with for obvious reasons. They couldn't retrace their steps back to the clearing and soon forgot about the whole ordeal. But I can never forget those cold, petrifying eyes. Now, whenever I see a tree, I'm scared I'll see the tall, lanky figure staring back at me. 
I still don't know what exactly happened that day, but I've come to the conclusion that I'm never going back there. Even if the stairs disappeared when we left, I'm never stepping a foot into that forest again. Back in the early 2000s, I was a young, attractive college girl, and I worked at a tiny coffee shop across the street from the school I was attending. It was very small and never busy, so almost all of my shifts were solo. It was a drive through only store with an employee entrance and drive-up window at the front of the building. The bathroom was on the right side of the building and also had an exit door. It was located across campus from my apartment. I had walked to work as I often did because I was only about five minutes away and nice weather. I had been there for a while, bored as usual doing my homework, when a brown van pulled directly up to the window. This was odd because you're supposed to order at the speaker near the large menu display, like most drive through experiences. It was also odd because the van was so creepy. Like a literal rape van joke on wheels. It had blacked out windows in the back and had seen better days. Two men stared at me from the van. The driver was an elderly man with long white hair and cold blue eyes. The passenger was a scruffy middle-aged man in an old baseball hat. I opened the window and asked if I could help them. I could smell liquor radiating from the open window of the van. The driver called me Linda and said he was happy that I was coming with them on their trip. I immediately started to have bad vibes and told him he was mistaken. He kept insisting that I was Linda and coming with them on the trip. I had never seen these men before, and I suddenly realized just how alone I was. I told them I was able to assist them with a drink order, but that I'm not Linda and I'm not going anywhere. They finally left after a few minutes and never ordered anything. I took note of the license plate and was relieved to find that it was an easy one to remember. Judy's van. I locked both doors and the drive through window after they left. I was creeped out the rest of my shift, but didn't see the van again, so I figured it was just a strange encounter with two drunk men. Fast forward to closing time. It's dark out now, so I'm finishing up my nightly duties and gathering my things to leave. I'm still slightly creeped out from the weird men in the van, so I kept my keys in my hand after I locked the coffee shop's front door from the outside. As I turned to start walking in my apartment, that same brown van pulled quickly into the parking lot right next to me. I ran back to the front door of the coffee shop. The keys trembled in my hand. I unlocked the door scurried into the building and locked the door behind me. I ran to the bathroom and locked the door. The bathroom had an exit to the side of the building but no windows so I had no idea what was happening outside at this point or if the van was still out there. I called my roommate and told her what was happening. She said she and her boyfriend would come pick me up at the side exit. I waited in the bathroom listening through the door and heard footsteps outside. The door handle jiggled and I froze in fear but suddenly it stopped jiggling and I heard nothing further at the door. My phone rang and it was my roommate. She was waiting outside the side exit. She said the van peeled out of the parking lot as she pulled up. I hopped in the back seat and we set out to follow the van as I called the police to report these dudes. They were driving erratically and at one point it became unsafe to continue following them and we had to stop at a red light. The officer I spoke with said there was no record of registration for the license plate Judy's van. The officer said they would patrol the area but that was really it. I never heard anything else about it from the police and I never saw that brown van or those creepy men again but I do still wonder how they knew when I'd be leaving and how long they'd been watching me. And who was Linda? Who's Judy? And did they take a trip with these men but meet a different fate than I did?
sometimes nostalgia can be dangerous let me back up a bit when i was younger i used to live in a gold rush town it was founded in 1820 and it became extremely popular due to its abundant riches but that was all in the past when i was living there most people had left every last bit of gold was drained and the ones who remained still looked for it of course, being pretty far away from the cities, we had our share of tales. Ones of haunted mine shafts, abandoned houses with dead bodies, and much more. Even if you weren't that into scary stories, you definitely heard of the midnight train which went through the town on the rails that cut right through it. Legend says that at exactly 12.15am, a train would pass through looking for passengers. When I learnt of this, I told my parents. They laughed it off as just an urban legend, but in the night, I'd always see them hurriedly closing the blinds, afraid that something would be out there. A few years later, my friends and I decided to test this out for ourselves and wait for it. It felt like forever, and almost all of them chickened out. The ones left were me and this little boy named William. Finally, when it was time, a train cut right through the night and stopped right where we were. I stepped onto the train thinking this was a dream. The train sped up and went all around the town. I could see my house, my friend's house, and the mine shafts. When the train halted and I stepped out, I could see that this did not seem right. All the houses were abandoned, and the only people who were there were William and I. As the train started to move, I hung on to it and screamed to go home. The train seemed to move like lightning and before I knew it, I was back. It was now around 8 in the morning and I could see my friends going to school. As I caught up with them, they asked me what I had seen. I began to share my experiences, but once I got to the part about William, they all looked confused. What are you talking about? There's nobody named William in this town. I tried to tell them, but it didn't work. Then I remembered. When I had clung to the train, William stayed there. It seemed like he had just vanished and I was the only one who remembered. With such a creepy experience, you'd think I'd never go back and you'd be right. After that, I stayed away from urban legends in fear that they were real. But as the years passed and my grip on my memory began to fade, I decided to go back. It's been 50 years since this event and I knew that my hometown would much closely resemble the town I saw after I took the train. I drove for about 5 hours not knowing where I was going, just that I was going in the right direction when I stopped, I found it. It was exactly like the town in my vision except this time, I knew it was real. I looked around and stopped to take a few pictures. But as I was taking it, I was scared out of my mind by someone tapping my shoulder. I turned around, half expecting there to be a ghost, but it was just a little boy. I'm sorry for scaring you, but do you have any food with you? He asked. I have a granola bar with me, but where are your parents? I asked. I don't know, he said. He took the bar and ate it hungrily. For a second, his face became disfigured, and almost corpse-like, I rubbed my eyes, and whatever I saw had disappeared. Let me show you the others, he said. The boy led me to a house where there were ten children, all wearing outdated clothing which was torn and dirty. How long have you been living here? I asked. Just a few weeks, said the boy. What he said felt a bit off, like it wasn't true, but it had to be true, otherwise he would have been much, much more hungry. These children didn't look starving at all. How'd you get here? I asked. We got here on a train, said a little girl. Now I knew something wasn't right. No trains had run through this town for about 200 years now. Unless... Again, the faces of the children changed, looking lifeless, but as quick as the change came, it vanished. But then, I remembered. The boy that I spoke to first, he was William. 
who everyone had forgotten. The girl's name was Abigail, and she vanished one day, never to be seen again. Why had nobody remembered them, and why were they alive? The last time someone saw them was 50 years ago. It became clear to me at once I wasn't talking to live children. I was talking to their corpses. I ran out of the house into my car and drove away. I never looked back. My daughter's house was around a few hundred miles from here, and it would take me around six to eight hours to get there. I drove across the barren roads, and in a few hours, I began to see civilization again. After I found her house, I knocked on the door. She opened her door and looked surprised to see me. Mother, where have you been? She asked. I thought I told you where I was going. I was visiting my hometown. I said. I'd only been gone for a few days at most, so why was she so surprised? Yes, but you've been gone for so long. I sent a search party out for you. I began to lose hope after the first few months, she said. How many of us lazy 20-something-year-olds order delivery on a Friday night? I know I'm not the only one. Tonight's order is seriously making me rethink my choices, and I'm actually a little concerned for my safety. This is what happened. Skip the dishes is my vice. It's so convenient that I don't even really think about the expense. After a long day at work, I decided to order in for the night. Now, don't get me wrong. I have my own car, and I can just as easily drive around town to pick up what I want to save some extra cash, but... After an extremely stressful day, I poured a glass of red as soon as I walked through the door. I am responsible enough to know that I shouldn't drive. Hence, skip the dishes was my bright idea tonight. Since my boyfriend is working late, I texted him to see what he wanted me to order for us. His immediate response was, get some wine, I'll even pay. And this is where the trouble starts. I ordered some food from a restaurant and ordered two nice bottles of wine to go with it. The problem with ordering alcohol online is that you are expected to meet face-to-face -face with the delivery person in order to show ID. I've been so used to COVID protocol where I can sneakily pick up my order at a no-contact drop-off location that this made my hermit self a little uneasy. A requirement for showing ID is that the name on your order must also match the name on the ID that is shown in person. As a young, fragile female living in an apartment complex in a bad area, I always had a fake name on my orders for my own peace of mind. For this instance, I had to write my real name. This was strike number two on my uneasy radar. About half an hour goes by until I see that my order is matched up with a driver. The driver's name is Michael. As I texted my boyfriend an update, I told him, Michael is on the way here. Michael Myers. Of course, this Halloween-themed joke was just my way of expressing my nerves in a playful manner. By no means was I actually expecting a monster to show up at my door. I get the heads up, your courier is about to arrive text, so I dart to the window to see what the guy looks like before he makes his way up to my unit. Michael steps out of his vehicle, and I can see from the 8th floor that he drives an old, beat-up, silver Honda Accord. He's a white male, early 40s, with large rimmed glasses. I see him grab the bag from his passenger seat and walk toward the door, ready for me to buzz him in. This is fine. This guy seems normal. We'll have a quick exchange, and then I'll go safely back into my apartment for the night told myself. I threw on an oversized sweater and sweatpants so as to make myself look uninviting and unattractive. If you are female, then you understand. And I stepped outside my unit door, ready for my food with my ID in hand. 
The second I heard the elevator bell ring, I braced myself. He caught me off guard as he stepped down, walked toward me quickly and said, Hello, Sarah. As if he'd known me my whole life. Somehow, he even knew which direction to start walking when he arrived at my floor. Shyly, I responded, Hello, here's my ID. I presented him with my driver's license and snatched it quickly from my hand, but tried to play it off that he was just a nice guy joking around. Beautiful. Let me see the eyes. Ah, uh, yes. He went on examining my facial features alongside my license picture. Let me double check this. He says. He must have spent a solid minute scanning my license as if he was memorizing my information. Okay, you're all good. Here you go. He handed me my order. I thanked him and rushed inside, locking the door behind me. Oof. Thought I was safe. Aside from being a little weird and a little creepy, I thought nothing of it. I brought my order to the kitchen arranged myself a plate, and plopped myself back down on the couch in front of my Netflix show. I jokingly texted my boyfriend that I had escaped the wrath of Michael, and that this was some delicious grub waiting patiently at home for him. About 40 minutes go by in the episode I was watching ends. I got up to bring my dishes back to the kitchen when I heard the tiniest little shuffling sound outside my door thinking maybe I had an Amazon delivery dropped off, or maybe a neighbor was walking down the hallway, I decided to look outside my peephole. I let out an audible gasp and dropped my fork, the metal ringing against the floor. Michael didn't leave. In fact, my eye was met with his, peering back through the hole into my apartment. What the fuck? I exclaimed. I literally sat here this entire time thinking I was safe and sound, while behind me some guy had his face pressed up against my door. What do you want? I shout in. Becoming more angry than scared at this point, who does this creep think he is? No response. Please leave. I have my order and there's no reason for you to still be here. I will call the cops. I built up the courage to look back through the peephole. While shaking and trying to be quiet, I positioned my eye into the scope. He was still there, staring blankly at my door. What the hell is he doing? I thought. He took a step back, bent down, and then walked out of sight. I pulled out my phone to call my boyfriend and let him know what was going on. When I spotted a little piece of paper that was slid under my door. As I grabbed the paper, a chill ran down my spine. I'm coming back. It read. I heard my husband pull in at around 5 p.m., but it wasn't for another 10 minutes that I knew something was off. He had been sitting in his car that entire time without moving. We don't have the space for two cars in our driveway. So, whoever gets home last has to park out on the street. Usually he walks in immediately with some hot and exciting piece of gossip from the office. Today was not that day. As I walked out, I noticed the windshield was badly cracked. The visibility through the glass was so awful, I don't even know how he managed to drive home. It was quite an annoying sight given we'd just paid a fortune on the last service. He didn't even acknowledge me as I approached the car. His eyes were laser focused on the rear vision mirror. I tried to gauge what he was looking at and glanced up the neighborhood. There was nothing out of the ordinary. It was a quiet, one-way street. Cute weatherboard houses, freshly cut lawns, and a couple of shady gum trees that loomed over the neighborhood's cars. Exactly what we wanted. It seemed everyone else was inside in a bid to get out of the relentless heat wave. I opened up the passenger door and sat beside him. What happened to the windshield? He sat in silence, gaze locked onto the mirror. His mouth barely moved. Kangaroo. My stomach lurched. 
Hitting a kangaroo can be a death sentence for a driver. It wasn't uncommon to see them in our suburb as it fringes the rural bushland. But getting one on the road is still scary. I could make out the bloodied point of impact in the glass. He was lucky to be unarmed. Holy shit. Are you alright? I don't know. It was sweltering and he didn't have the air conditioner on. He leant over and shut my door. His eyes remained fixed on the mirror. I wanted to ask what was going on, but then I caught a glimpse. In the rear vision mirror, an obscured person stood at the top of the street. I couldn't make out their silhouette due to the shade from the gum trees, but it definitely looked human. It stood completely still. Its presence filled my body with unbridled dread. I turned my head to get a better view through the rear window. The figure vanished. It had gone in less than a second. I wish that was the last time I ever saw it. But as I glanced back into the mirror, the figure returned. I snapped my head back to the window. It disappeared. It seemed this mysterious person was only visible through the mirror's reflection. I'd never seen anything like this and thought the heat was making me hallucinate. David? Who... What is that? I noticed my husband's breath had become quite shaky. He was terrified. I... I don't know. He whispered. Normally, it would be comforting to know you weren't imagining such a thing. This confirmation was anything but. The figure began to step forward. Its movements were staggered as it dragged itself to the nearest car. It slowly reached out an arm and swung open the door. It seemed to be looking for something. Unsatisfied with its results, it slammed the door and hurried to the next car in line. I think we should head inside. My husband pushed down the car door locks and looked at me with a finger over his lip. I've never seen him so scared. Small beads of sweat were streaking down his face and dripping off his chin. He shook his head and indicated for us to remain. I wanted to suggest that we drive away, turn on the engine, and never look back at that thing. However, facing the street's dead end made this option impossible. We would have to turn the car around and head straight for the figure if we were to leave. An easy escape wasn't factored in when we were initially drawn to this quiet street. We slowly slid down our chairs and watched as the figure opened and closed the neighborhood's cars, making its way up the street. It would appear to anyone watching without a mirror that the doors were moving on their own volition. Their metallic clunking rang out in a disjointed rhythm. My husband was really struggling. It seemed the stress of this ever-growing threat had caused him to repeat the only two phrases he had just uttered. Kangaroo. I don't know. Kangaroo. I don't know. The figure was far too close when I realized most of our neighbors would also have had their cars locked. It clearly didn't stop the thing. We should have gone inside. The figure's footsteps approached, scuffling along the tarmac. We were next. My husband covered his mouth with a trembling hand. There was a complete silence as we held our breath. The locks popped up. The backseat door swung open, and we felt the weight of the figure enter. The vehicle wobbled, and the door closed. We were no longer alone. Something was breathing back there. It was a wheezy kind of breath followed by a slight gurgle, like a lung had been punctured. I had to look. I reached up to the rear vision mirror and angled it downwards. My husband stared at me with widened eyes, shocked at my curiosity. A part of me wished I hadn't done that. In the back seat was a bloodied man. He stared at me, eyes bulging in pain. He looked dead. I think he was dead. His entire face had been crushed and his body was horribly disfigured. 
He held up a severely broken arm and pointed it towards himself before him, turning it to the damaged windshield. I followed his finger to the bloodied point of impact on the glass. I froze. I didn't want it to be true. The bloodied man fixed his gaze onto my husband's seat. My mouth was dry of any moisture, but my question still managed to scratch itself out. David... What happened with the windshield? Kangaroo. I don't know. Kangaroo. I don't know. As I closed the door, I heard it lock behind me. Both my husband and the man were still inside. I don't know which one had put the locks back down, but I've decided it wasn't my fate to find out. I went back to the house and removed every single mirror we owned. I never saw either of them again. My boyfriend and I have been together for close to three years. We don't live together, but we spend as much time together as we can. To preface, I live in a major city, and he lives in a smaller town just adjacent to me. About 30 minutes one way. I take a secondary highway to get to his house as to avoid all the primary highway traffic, and I've never had an issue on it before except for a couple slow drivers. That is, until this past week. The drive there after work was just like it always had been. Just my car and I alone on the road. It is honestly such an unexceptional drive that I barely even remember making these drives anymore. Anyway... I arrived, we spent the evening together and had a great time, and then I began to gather my things to leave at around 11.30pm. He told me to text him when I got home at 1138 This is a drive I've done a million times before. Take a right out of his neighborhood, follow the streetlights until I hit a range road surrounded by trees after about a kilometer, then turn left onto the highway straight home. Easy enough like it always had been. I got to the last street light at 11.43, stopped to look both ways, then continued on to the range road. There's no street lights anymore, but the brights on my car have never let me down. I continued my drive as nonchalantly as one could, waiting to reach the tree line beside the road. It seemed like I should have hit the trees a long time ago, though. For a while, I didn't think anything was wrong. Maybe I was just tired and the surrounding trees were just further away than I remembered. I looked at my dash for the time. 11.43. But hadn't I been driving down the road for a couple minutes already? That didn't make sense. However, my car had been having issues with the time and temperature lately, so I tried to just brush it off. My eyes back on the road, I searched for the faint outline of the trees again. Nothing. Just my car and I alone on the road. I looked in my rear view mirror to see how far away from the street lights I'd gotten, but there was nothing behind me either. I was completely alone and isolated on this seemingly endless road. I was starting to get a little nervous at this point. Where were the trees? How late am I going to get home? Nervous, I kept driving for what felt like five minutes. I looked at the clock again. 11.43 What the hell was wrong with my dash? I reached for my phone to check the time there instead, but it said the same thing. What? This is when I started to panic. Time wasn't moving even though I was, and I was seemingly stuck on this pitch black road with no idea when I'd get off it. Then my headlights started to flicker. That has never happened to my car before. I stared out the windshield without blinking the whole time they flickered. What is going on with my vehicle? Why was this happening? What have I pissed off so much that I'm stuck in an endless loop? Is it even a loop? Then my car began to stop moving. I pressed my foot on the gas pedal as hard as I could, panicking and flooring it constantly. But no matter what I did, the car slowly came to a stop. My lights went out, my doors unlocked, and the car stopped fucking moving. 
I was stuck. It's pitch black. It's still 1143. I was crying at this point. What could I even do? I couldn't find my phone after I'd checked the time and tossed it behind me out of annoyance. All I could do was stare forward and pray that someone would come down the road and find me. The silence was deafening. I have never experienced something so loud that I needed to cover my ears to protect them from nothing. Breathing heavy with my hands on my head, I noticed something from outside my car. I couldn't see it at first, just hear it. It sounded like a tapping on one of the windows. I whipped my head around to try and figure out what it was, but my terrible vision plus the dark betrayed me. The tapping got louder and it seemed to be moving all around the car. First the back seat on the right, then the left, then the passenger seat, and then it stopped. I waited for whatever it was to tap the driver's side window, tears streaming down my face, breathing heavy, quick, and panicked. The next moment seemed to drag on for hours, the only sounds being my own harsh breathing. I glanced at my dash for the time without moving anything else. 11.43. Tap. Right beside my left ear. I didn't dare move a single fucking muscle. Tap. Tap. Don't fucking move. Tap. 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 Was it trying to get my attention? Tap. 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 The last one felt like I could have put a hole in my window. Still crying, I slowly... Painfully turned to look out the window, and then I froze. I don't know what I saw. My memory is trying so hard to block it out and forget it, but I can't let it. It was tall. So tall. Its legs were like twigs, or the trunks of new trees. Its arms and hands were like those of the other mother from Caroline. Long and slender and creepy as fuck. In its head, it looked like a mutated deer skull with no eyes, an uneven and crooked amount of teeth, and antlers that stuck out further than I could see. Its torso looked like tangle vines and roots from a tree, but the bark was dead, and it was staring at me still tapping on my window. We stared at each other, myself a sobbing mess, and it, expressionless and lifeless, other than the constant tapping. I don't know how long we sat like that. It could do anything it wanted with me. And no one would be the wiser. What could I even do? I couldn't force myself to move and there was nowhere to go. Other than further into the darkness. Then the tapping stopped. The creature let out a huff then began to walk away from my car. I watched it until it disappeared into the darkness, until I couldn't hear its feet make noise on the road anymore. I sat there for a while trying to gather myself and my thoughts, and then my car lights turned back on, and my engine roared back to life. I looked at my dash. 11.44. I put my foot on the gas pedal. Slowly, my car began to roll. I didn't dare take my eyes off the road dead ahead of me. No way was I going to let myself look anywhere but where I wanted to go. And then I saw the trees begin to appear. I'll never forget his face. I can see it now. Cloudy but focused-eyed, locked on me like I was the only thing in existence. We were on our honeymoon drive when it happened, gassing up at the only available stop before our three-hour home stretch. We were heading to a cabin far from home, a wedding present gifted from her family. I don't know if it was the lonely roads or the dark, endless tree line, but I was on edge. I had just started pumping when I noticed him, hovering next to a beat-up Ford pickup. It was an older one with the square headlights and boxy frame. He was minding his business initially, but once his eyes saw me, they never lifted. At first, I give a friendly nod, but when he did nothing but stare, 
I found the awkward crawl of discomfort settling in. He looked uncomfortable, confused. He reminded me of an extra in a horror film, the figure that was standing off to the side and out of focus. That's how he lingered, even after his nozzle clicked as it was topped off. I stared at the digits on my pump impatiently, keeping him in my peripheral vision as I watched the numbers climb. He was just standing there, staring. Once mine was done, I hung the nozzle up and got my receipt. I gave the old man a parting wave, and he gave me the slightest of nods. He almost looked offended, yanking the door and ducking in. I could even feel him watching after I got in the car. You see that? I asked my wife, who was sitting in the passenger seat. Her face was buried in her phone, scrolling through videos of people doing embarrassing dances. Hmm? She said tiredly, not quite looking away. Her eyes were haggard, the screen time keeping her awake until we were on the road again. That old man, he was staring at me, I said. Turning the key in the ignition, our little Honda started up and I buckled my seatbelt. What? Where? She asked, looking up away from her phone. She looked around until she saw him. He was still there, standing next to his truck. Creepy, she said, turning back around. Maybe he's looking at you. I joked, putting it in drive and pulling away. I watched in the mirror, the old man's head swiveling slowly as we left. It gave me the chills. What, my bony ass? She snorted and I grabbed her hand, interlocking our fingers. Maybe. You get the GPS back up? I asked, pulling back onto the roan. The long stretch of lines reflected off the headlights. Oh, right, sorry. She said bringing it up again. The bright GPS screen lit up the cab and when the blue line on the grid collected itself, the voice spoke over Bluetooth. In two miles, take a right. You almost there? She yawned, nestling back in her seat. Not really. I said, adjusting the rearview mirror. Off in the distance, a set of square headlights was turning out of the gas station. Can you wake me up when we're close? She asked, already falling asleep. I watched the headlights for a moment, heading in the same direction as us. I pressed the accelerator further. Sure thing, honey. Surely, it was just a coincidence. I kept my eyes forward, watching for deer in the passing trees. I messed with the radio, trying to find something to listen to. Behind me, the headlights were getting closer. I tuned the dial and found a station, only for it to be cut off by the automated voice. In 500 feet, take the next right. I slowed down, watching both the headlights and the upcoming turn. I thought of the old man's stare and how he stood perfectly still, never looking away. Just picturing it made me shudder. Turn right. I slowed and cut the wheel, turning onto another long back road, one that looked shadier than the last. My wife opened her eyes for a second before snuggling back against the door. In three miles, take a left. I kept driving, both hands on the wheel. I was tired as hell, every yawn watering my eyes and making me drowsier. I rubbed my face, massaging my cheeks to remove the stiffness. I watched the mirror subconsciously, waiting for the truck to fly past. I watched silently, seeing the glow come closer and closer. I watched them slow and pan over, the headlights bouncing on the old suspension. The truck was still following. Honey, honey, wake up. I nudged her, and she groaned. Hmm? What? She stretched. That old man, he's following us. I said, my hands gripping the wheel. What? She said, looking behind us. The truck was gaining, chugging behind us through the night. I tried to go faster, but it kept speeding up, the headlights getting closer and closer. Maybe it's just a coincidence. Maybe he lives around here. You didn't say something to him, did you? She asked. No, 
nothing. I tried to wave. That's about it. I said. Huh. Maybe he'll turn off. Ahead was a traffic light. A soothing green glow like a beacon. I sped up to try and catch it, but almost as if in spite, it started changing. Damn. I said, slowing down again. My eyes darted between the traffic light and the truck. It practically flew up on us, headlights blinding in the mirrors as we stopped for the red. The truck was loud, a big engine and old exhaust echoing right behind us. My wife looked behind us and shielded her eyes. I stared at the red light as if my will would make it change faster. He's getting out, my wife said, and my blood ran cold. What? I asked, checking the side mirror. Fuck, babe. He's got a knife. She squeezed my shoulder, looking frantic. In the mirror, I saw him close the truck door and started walking up to us. I saw the light hit the blade in his hand, and he started shuffling faster, his image growing as I watched. What the fuck? What the? I said, climbing up. Go, babe. Go, go, go. She yelled and I looked both ways. The light was still red. The old man was out my window. I stomped on the gas as the tire squealed, the car lurching as it caught traction. We blew the intersection and I watched the dark silhouette shuffle back to his truck and throw open the door. In the light of his cab, I could see him hitting his steering wheel. In one mile, take a left. We sped away, trying to put as much distance between us as possible. The truck was moving again, but my head start had bought us time. My wife turned in her seat, watching the truck struggle to keep up. Ahead, I saw the green rectangular sign for a back road. In 500 feet, take a left. Hang on. I shouted, slamming on the brakes. For what? She shouted, but grabbed the overhead handle anyway. Spinning the wheel quickly, I turned right instead and gunned it down an unfamiliar, unkempt stretch of her own. The pavement was poor and cracked, the lines barely legible in the center. I swerved to hit potholes and broken sticks. What are you doing? She shouted, holding on for dear life. We gotta lose him. I said, nervously watching the mirror. Make a U-turn. The road was dark and winding, taking us up hills and under old railway bridges. I squealed on every curve, our little car struggling to miss the many obstacles in the road. Garbage bags, old mattresses leaned against brush. The trees were dead, towering above us like withered giants in the dark. Make a U-turn. The road grew thinner and more desolate the shoulders turning into deep, treacherous ditches. I checked the mirror again, nothing but darkness. It was getting harder to see. I turned the brights on, and it only added to the discomfort, lighting up hundreds more wicked branches and scattered trash. What do we do? My wife asked. My mind raced. I didn't really know. I don't know. Call the police. I shouted and she unlocked her phone. The bright light hampered my view, the glare infecting every window. Ahead the road straightened out, getting even more narrow. The tires bounced as the pavement transitioned to gravel, the static of it droning and plinking against the wheel wells deafening us. Ahead a large orange sign reflected our light but the high beams were too bright to make out the old lettering. Babe? Make a U-turn. I squinted at it, having no choice but to slow down to the lack of road. I read the sign, big black capital letters echoing in my mind. Babe, I don't have enough signal. Ahead, the road was gone. The sparse gravel blending to dirt and grass then nothing dead end the ground ahead ceased to exist 
The sheer drop of a cliff waiting on the other side of the old sign behind us. The headlights were coming. I parked the car, witnessing the impending doom of the light catch up. Not enough room to turn around. Nowhere to go. Frantically, I searched the inside of the car, looking for some kind of weapon. Tossing aside old documents in the center console, I found a flashlight. The truck pulled behind us slowly, blocking us in. I tested the flashlight, and the batteries were dead. Still better than nothing. Stay in the car. I yelled and threw open the door. What do you want me to do? She cried, looking from me to the truck. Lock the doors. I gripped the flashlight in my hand, hoping the weight of it would give me courage. It didn't. The old man emerged from his truck, hinges creaking loudly as he pushed his door shut. The knife was in his hand like a spike protruding from his arm. He was breathing hard, his shoulders hunching as his chest heaved. What the hell do you want? I shouted. He took another step forward and stopped, his shadow in the headlights frozen. He craned his head for a moment and stepped back. He moved stiffly, his movements slow. Why are you following me? I shouted again, stepping forward with the flashlight. I could hear my wife sobbing in the car. I was tired of running. I raised the flashlight and marched toward him. He raised the knife, ready to stab. I gripped my teeth and reared back, ready to swing. I saw his face in the dark, his piercing eyes staring just as they had at the gas station. I brought the flashlight down, hoping to knock the weapon from his hand and stopped. The old man was crying. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. He said, his voice choking. I lowered the flashlight slowly and he lowered the knife. Why are you following us? I asked, lowering my voice. He looked so thin and frail, even in the dark. He put his arms down, both hands squeezed into fists. He looked like he wanted to walk away, his steps hesitant, shaking. I'm sorry. I thought you were my son. I was wrong. I'm sorry. He looked away, trying to shield his face. Wait, what? I asked. I looked to my car where my wife sat on edge, her mouth hanging open. When I saw you at the gas station, I thought you were my son. You, you looked just like him. But it couldn't be. My son passed away a long time ago now. In a car accident, but you looked just like him. I wanted to be sure. I had to be sure, but your voice, you're not him, you're not Peter. I'm sorry for scaring you. You must be terrified, the old man's son. But the knife, at the light you were coming at me with a knife, I said, it didn't make any sense. I know, I know, I didn't think that through. I let my emotions get the better of me. I'm just an old fool. I got this from my son all those years ago. I thought you were him. I thought maybe if I could get it to you, you could move on. And I could move on, but I made a mistake. I saw what I wanted to see. I'm sorry. He choked and started backing up. I looked to my wife who threw up her hands in confusion. I held up a finger and mouthed, Wait a minute. If you want to press charges, I understand. I'll wait here for the police. He turned and started walking back to his truck. I went after him. Wait, hang on a second. I called after him and he stopped. He was so much smaller and thinner up close. I guess at the gas station, I saw what I wanted to see too. I gave him a hug. He resisted at first, but when I didn't let go, he gave in and returned in. We stood there for a while. I let him cry for as long as he needed, standing in the square headlights in the middle of nowhere. No press charges. No stabbing or clubbing. 
I motioned for my wife to get out, and when she joined us, I explained what happened. My name is Tom. This is my wife, Gina. I'm sorry for almost hitting you, and I'm sorry about your son. I said. It's alright. My name is Wallace. I'm sorry I scared you good people tonight. But thank you for giving me your time. You didn't have to do that. I appreciate it. Before I go, I think I'd like you to have this. I can't hang on to it anymore. He held out his hand, the hunting knife in his palm, and scribed across the blade were the words, For my son. I took it and promised to take care of it. Under the stipulation that he take my number so we could talk again. He seemed to enjoy that and after a hug farewell and even a few laughs we parted ways. I watched him walk back to his truck. His head held higher than before. He opened the door and looked at me for a moment giving a final wave before ducking in. I found myself freezing briefly before nodding and waving back. Behind him, barely visible, was a man his hand resting lightly on Wallace's shoulder. He nodded to me with a smile, and after the old man climbed in and shut the door, he was gone. <laughs>